Tarzan the Terrible by Edgar Rice Burroughs Chapter One The Pithecanthropus Silent as the shadows through which he moved, the great beast slunk through the midnight jungle, his yellow-green eyes round and staring, his sinewy tail undulating behind him, his head lowered and flattened, and every muscle vibrant to the thrill of the hunt. The jungle moon dappled an occasional clearing which the great cat was always careful to avoid. Though he moved through thick verdure across a carpet of innumerable twigs, broken branches, and leaves, his passing gave forth no sound that might have been apprehended by dull human ears. Apparently less cautious was the hunted thing moving even as silently as the lion a hundred paces ahead of the tawny carnivore for instead of skirting the moon-splashed natural clearings it passed directly across them, and by the tortuous record of its spore it might indeed be guessed that it sought these avenues of least resistance, as well it might, since unlike its grim stalker it walked erect upon two feet. It walked upon two feet and was hairless except for a black thatch upon its head. Its arms were well-shaped and muscular, its hands powerful and slender with long tapering fingers and thumbs reaching almost to the first joint of the index fingers its legs too were shapely but its feet departed from the standards of all races of men except possibly a few of the lowest races in that the great toes protruded at right angles from the foot pausing momentarily in the full light of the gorgeous african moon the creature turned an attentive ear to the rear and then his head lifted his features might readily have been discerned in the moonlight they were strong clean-cut and regular features that would have attracted attention for their masculine beauty in any of the great capitals of the world but was this thing a man it would have been hard for a watcher in the trees to have decided as the lion's prey resumed its way across the silver tapestry that luna had laid upon the floor of the dismal jungle for from beneath the loin-cloth of black fur that girdled its thighs there depended a long hairless white tail in one hand the creature carried a stout club and suspended at its left side from a shoulder belt was a short sheathed knife while a cross belt supported a pouch at its right hip confining these straps to the body and also apparently supporting the loin-cloth was a broad girdle which glittered in the moonlight as though encrusted with virgin gold and was clasped in the centre of the belly with a huge buckle of ornate design that scintillated as with precious stones closer and closer crept numa the lion to his intended victim and that the latter was not entirely unaware of his danger was evidenced by the increasing frequency with which he turned his ear and his sharp black eyes in the direction of the cat upon his tail he did not greatly increase his speed a long swinging walk where the open paces permitted but he loosened the knife in its scabbard and at all times kept his club in readiness for instant action forging at last through a narrow strip of dense jungle vegetation the man-thing broke through into an almost treeless area of considerable extent for an instant he hesitated, glancing quickly behind him, and then up at the security of the branches of the great trees waving overhead. But some greater urge than fear or caution influenced his decision, apparently, for he moved off again across the little plain, leaving the safety of the trees behind him. At greater or less intervals leafy sanctuaries dotted the grassy expanse ahead of him, and the route he took leading from one to another indicated that he had not entirely cast discretion to the winds but after the second tree had been left behind the distance to the next was considerable and it was then that numa walked from the concealing cover of the jungle and seeing his quarry apparently helpless before him raised his tail stiffly erect and charged two months two long weary months filled with hunger with thirst with hardships with disappointment and greater than all with gnawing pain had passed since tarzan of the apes learned from the diary of the dead german captain that his wife still lived a brief investigation in which he was enthusiastically aided by the intelligence department of the british east african expedition revealed the fact that an attempt had been made to keep lady jane in hiding in the interior for reasons of which only the German high command might be cognizant. 
in charge of lieutenant obergatz and a detachment of native german troops she had been sent across the border into the congo free state starting out alone in search of her tarzan had succeeded in finding the village in which she had been incarcerated only to learn that she had escaped months before and that the german officer had disappeared at the same time from there on the stories of the chiefs and the warriors whom he quizzed were vague and often contradictory even the direction that the fugitives had taken tarzan could only guess at by piecing together bits of fragmentary evidence gleaned from various sources sinister conjectures were forced upon him by various observations which he made in the village one was incontrovertible proof that these people were man-eaters the other the presence in the village of various articles of native german uniforms and equipment at great risk and in the face of surly objection on the part of the chief the ape-man made a careful inspection of every hut in the village from which at least a little ray of hope resulted from the fact that he found no article that might have belonged to his wife leaving the village he had made his way toward the southwest crossing after the most appalling hardships a vast waterless steppe covered for the most part with dense thorn coming at last into a district that had probably never been previously entered by any white man and which was known only in the legends of the tribes whose country bordered it here were precipitous mountains well-watered plateaus wide plains and vast swampy morasses but neither the plains nor the plateaus nor the mountains were accessible to him until after weeks of arduous effort he succeeded in finding a spot where he might cross the morasses a hideous stretch infested by venomous snakes and other dangerous reptiles on several occasions he glimpsed at distances or by night what might have been titanic reptilian monsters but as there were hippopotami rhinoceri and elephants in great numbers in and about the marsh he was never positive that the forms he saw were not of these when at last he stood upon firm ground after crossing the morasses he realized why it was that for perhaps countless ages this territory had defied the courage and hardihood of the heroic races of the outer world that had after innumerable reverses and unbelievable suffering penetrated to practically every other region from pole to pole from the abundance and diversity of the game it might have appeared that every known species of bird and beast and reptile had sought here a refuge wherein they might take their last stand against the encroaching multitudes of men that had steadily spread themselves over the surface of the earth wresting the hunting grounds from the lower orders from the moment that the first ape shed his hair and ceased to walk upon his knuckles even the species with which tarzan was familiar showed here either the results of a divergent line of evolution or an unaltered form that had been transmitted without variation for countless ages two there were many hybrid strains not the least interesting of which to tarzan was a yellow and black striped lion smaller than the species with which tarzan was familiar but still a most formidable beast since it possessed in addition to sharp saber-like canines the disposition of a devil to tarzan it presented evidence that tigers had once roamed the jungles of africa possibly giant saber-tooths of another epoch and these apparently had crossed with lions with the resultant terrors that he occasionally encountered at the present day the true lions of this new old world differed but little from those with which he was familiar in size and conformation they were almost identical but instead of shedding the leopard spots of cubhood they retained them through life as definitely marked as those of the leopard two months of effort had revealed no slightest evidence that she he sought had entered this beautiful yet forbidding land his investigation however of the cannibal village and his questioning of other tribes in the neighborhood had convinced him that if lady jane still lived it must be in this direction that he seek her since by a process of elimination he had reduced the direction of her flight to only this possibility how she had crossed the morass he could not guess and yet something within seemed to urge upon him belief that she had crossed it and that if she still lived it was here that she must be sought but this unknown untraversed wild was of vast extent grim forbidding mountains blocked his way torrents tumbling from rocky fastnesses impeded his progress and at every turn he was forced to match wits and muscles with the great carnivora that he might procure sustenance 
time and again tarzan and numa stalked the same quarry and now one now the other bore off the prize seldom however did the ape-man go hungry for the country was rich in game animals and birds and fish in fruit and the countless other forms of vegetable life upon which the jungle-bred man may subsist tarzan often wondered why in so rich a country he found no evidences of man and had at last come to the conclusion that the parched thorn-covered steppe and the hideous morasses had formed a sufficient barrier to protect this country effectively from the inroads of mankind after days of searching he had succeeded finally in discovering a pass through the mountains and coming down upon the opposite side had found himself in a country practically identical with that which he had left the hunting was good and at a water-hole in the mouth of a canyon where it debouched upon a tree-covered plain bara the deer fell an easy victim to the ape-man's cunning it was just at dusk the voices of great four-footed hunters rose now and again from various directions and as the cannon afforded among its trees no comfortable retreat the ape-man shouldered the carcass of the deer and started downward on to the plain at its opposite side rose lofty trees a great forest which suggested to his practised eye a mighty jungle toward this the ape-man bent his step but when midway of the plain he discovered standing alone such a tree as best suited him for a night's abode swung lightly to its branches and presently a comfortable resting place here he ate the flesh of bara and when satisfied carried the balance of the carcass to the opposite side of the tree where he deposited it far above the ground in a secure place returning to his crotch he settled himself for sleep and in another moment the roars of the lions and the howlings of the lesser cats fell upon deaf ears the usual noises of the jungle composed rather than disturbed the ape-man but an unusual sound however imperceptible to the awakened ear of civilized man seldom failed to impinge upon the consciousness of tarzan however deep his slumber and so it was that when the moon was high a sudden rush of feet across the grassy carpet in the vicinity of his tree brought him to alert and ready activity tarzan does not awaken as you and i with the weight of slumber still upon his eyes and brain for did the creatures of the wild awaken thus their awakenings would be few as his eyes snapped open clear and bright so clear and bright upon the nerve centres of his brain were registered the various perceptions of all his senses almost beneath him racing toward the tree was what at first glance appeared to be an almost naked white man yet even at the first instant of discovery the long white tail projecting rearward did not escape the ape-man behind the fleeing figure escaping came numa the lion in full charge voiceless the prey voiceless the killer as two spirits in a dead world the two moved in silent swiftness toward the culminating tragedy of this grim race even as his eyes opened and took in the scene beneath him even in that brief instant of perception followed reason judgment and decision so rapidly one upon the heels of the other that almost simultaneously the ape-man was in mid-air for he had seen a white-skinned creature cast in a mould similar to his own pursued by tarzan's hereditary enemy so close was the lion to the fleeing man-thing that tarzan had no time carefully to choose the method of his attack as a diver leaps from the springboard head foremost into the waters beneath so tarzan of the apes dove straight for numa the lion naked in his right hand the blade of his father that so many times before had tasted the blood of lions a raking talon caught tarzan on the side inflicting a long deep wound and then the ape-man was on numa's back and the blade was sinking again and again into the savage side nor was the man-thing either longer fleeing or idle he too creature of the wild had sensed on the instant the truth of the miracle of his saving and turning in his tracks had leaped forward with raised bludgeon to tarzan's assistance and numa's undoing a single terrific blow upon the flattened skull of the beast laid him insensible and then as tarzan's knife found the wild heart a few convulsive shudders and a sudden relaxation marked the passing of the carnivore leaping to his feet the ape-man placed his foot upon the carcass of his kill and raising his voice to goro the moon voiced the savage victory cry that had so often awakened the echoes of his native jungle as the hideous scream burst from the ape-man's lips the man-thing stepped quickly back as in sudden awe 
but when tarzan returned his hunting knife to its sheath and turned toward him the other saw in the quiet dignity of his demeanor no cause for apprehension for a moment the two stood appraising each other and then the man-thing spoke tarzan realized that the creature before him was uttering articulate sounds which expressed in speech though in a language with which tarzan was unfamiliar the thoughts of a man possessing to a greater or less extent the same powers of reason that he possessed in other words that though the creature before him had the tail and thumbs and great toes of a monkey it was in all other respects quite evidently a man the blood which was now flowing down tarzan's side caught the creature's attention from the pocket pouch at his side he took a small bag and approaching tarzan indicated by signs that he wished the ape-man to lie down that he might treat the wound whereupon spreading the edges of the cut apart he sprinkled the raw flesh with powder from the little bag the pain of the wound was as nothing to the exquisite torture of the remedy but accustomed to physical suffering the ape-man withstood it stoically and in a few moments not only had the bleeding ceased but the pain as well in reply to the soft and far from unpleasant modulations of the other's voice tarzan spoke in various tribal dialects of the interior as well as in the language of the great apes but it was evident that the man understood none of these seeing that they could not make each other understood the pithecanthropus advanced towards tarzan and placing his left hand over his own heart laid the palm of his right hand over the heart of the ape-man to the latter the action appeared as a form of friendly greeting and being versed in the ways of uncivilized races he responded in kind as he realized it was doubtless intended that he should his action seemed to satisfy and please his new-found acquaintance who immediately fell to talking again and finally with his head tipped back sniffed the air in the direction of the tree above them and then suddenly pointing toward the carcass of bara the deer he touched his stomach in a sign language which even the densest might interpret with a wave of his hand tarzan invited his guest to partake of the remains of his savage repast and the other leaping nimbly as a little monkey to the lower branches of the tree made his way quickly to the flesh assisted always by his long strong sinuous tail the pithecanthropus ate in silence cutting small strips from the deer's loin with his keen knife from his crotch in the tree tarzan watched his companion noting the preponderance of human attributes which were doubtless accentuated by the paradoxical thumbs great toes and tail he wondered if this creature was representative of some strange race or if what seemed more likely but an atavism either supposition would have seemed preposterous enough did he not have before him the evidence of the creature's existence there he was however a tailed man with distinctly arboreal hands and feet his trappings gold encrusted and jewel studded could have been wrought only by skilled artisans but whether they were the work of this individual or of others like him or of an entirely different race tarzan could not of course determine his meal finished the guest wiped his fingers and lips with leaves broken from a nearby branch looked up at tarzan with a pleasant smile that revealed a row of strong white teeth the canines of which were no longer than tarzan's own spoke a few words which tarzan judged were a polite expression of thanks and then sought a comfortable place in the tree for the night the earth was shadowed in darkness which precedes the dawn when tarzan was awakened by a violent shaking of the tree in which he had found shelter as he opened his eyes he saw that his companion was also astir and glancing around quickly to apprehend the cause of the disturbance the ape-man was astounded at the sight which met his eyes the dim shadow of a colossal form reared close beside the tree and he saw that it was the scraping of the giant body against the branches that had awakened him that such a tremendous creature could have approached so closely without disturbing him filled tarzan with both wonderment and chagrin in the gloom the ape-man at first conceived the intruder to be an elephant yet if so one of greater proportions than any he had ever before seen but as the dim outlines became less indistinct he saw on a line with his eyes and twenty feet above the ground the dim silhouette of a grotesquely serrated back that gave the impression of a creature whose each and every spinal vertebrae grew a thick heavy horn only a portion of the back was visible to the ape-man the rest of the body being lost in the dense shadows beneath the tree from whence there now arose the sound of giant jaws powerfully crunching flesh and bones 
from the odors that rose to the ape-man's sensitive nostrils he presently realized that beneath him was some huge reptile feeding upon the carcass of the lion that had been slain there earlier in the night as tarzan's eyes straining with curiosity bored futilely into the dark shadows he felt a light touch upon his shoulder and turning saw that his companion was attempting to attract his attention the creature pressing a forefinger to his own lips to enjoin silence attempted by pulling on tarzan's arm to indicate that they should leave at once realizing that he was in a strange country evidently infested by creatures of titanic size with the habits and powers of which he was entirely unfamiliar the ape-man permitted himself to be drawn away with the utmost caution the pithecanthropus descended the tree upon the opposite side from the great nocturnal prowler and closely followed by tarzan moved silently away through the night across the plain the ape-man was rather loath thus to relinquish an opportunity to inspect a creature which he realized was probably entirely different from anything in his past experience yet he was wise enough to know when discretion was the better part of valor and now as in the past he yielded to that law which dominates the kindred of the wild preventing them from courting disaster uselessly whose lives are sufficiently filled with danger in their ordinary routine of feeding and mating as the rising sun dispelled the shadows of the night tarzan found himself again upon the verge of a great forest into which his guide plunged taking nimbly to the branches of the trees through which he made his way with the celerity of long habitude and hereditary instinct but though aided by a prehensile tail fingers and toes the man-thing moved through the forest with no greater ease or surety than did the giant ape-man it was during this journey that tarzan recalled the wound in his side inflicted upon him the previous night by the raking talons of numa the lion and examining it was surprised to discover that not only was it painless but along its edges were no indications of inflammation the results doubtless of the antiseptic powder this strange companion had sprinkled upon it they had proceeded for a mile or two when tarzan's companion came to earth upon a grassy slope beneath a great tree whose branches overhung a clear brook here they drank and tarzan discovered the water to be not only deliciously pure and fresh but of an icy temperature that indicated its rapid descent from the lofty mountains of its origin casting aside his loin-cloth and weapons tarzan entered the little pool beneath the tree and after a moment emerged greatly refreshed and filled with a keen desire for breakfast as he came out of the pool he noticed his companion examining him with a puzzled expression upon his face taking the ape-man by the shoulder he turned him around so that tarzan's back was toward him and then touching the end of tarzan's spine with his forefinger he curled his own tail up over his shoulder and wheeling the ape-man about again pointed first at tarzan and then at his own caudal appendage a look of puzzlement upon his face the while he jabbered excitedly in his strange tongue the ape-man realized that probably for the first time his companion had discovered that he was tailless by nature rather than by accident and so he called attention to his own great toes and thumbs to further impress upon the creature that they were of different species the fellow shook his head dubiously as though entirely unable to comprehend why tarzan should differ so from him but at last apparently giving the problem up with a shrug he laid aside his own harness skin and weapons and entered the pool his ablutions completed and his meagre apparel redonned he seated himself at the foot of the tree and motioning tarzan to a place beside him opened the pouch that hung at his right side taking from it strips of dried flesh and a couple of handfuls of thin-shelled nuts with which tarzan was unfamiliar seeing the other break them with his teeth and eat the kernel tarzan followed the example thus set him discovering the meat to be rich and well flavored the dried flesh also was far from unpalatable though it had evidently been jerked without salt a commodity which tarzan imagined might be rather difficult to obtain in this locality as they ate tarzan's companion pointed to the nuts the dried meat and various other nearby objects in each instance repeating what tarzan readily discovered must be the names of these things in the creature's native language the ape-man could but smile at this evident desire on the part of his new-found acquaintance to impart to him instructions that eventually might lead to an exchange of thoughts between them 
having already mastered several languages and a multitude of dialects the ape-man felt that he could readily assimilate another even though this appeared one entirely unrelated to any with which he was familiar so occupied were they with their breakfast and the lesson that neither was aware of the beady eyes glittering down upon them from above nor was tarzan cognizant of any impending danger until the instant that a huge hairy body leaped full upon his companion from the branches above them end of chapter one read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com chapter two to the death in the moment of discovery tarzan saw that the creature was almost a counterpart of his companion in size and conformation with the exception that his body was entirely clothed with a coat of shaggy black hair which almost concealed his features while his harness and weapons were similar to those of the creature he had attacked ere tarzan could prevent the creature had struck the ape-man's companion a blow upon the head with his knotted club that felled him unconscious to the earth but before he could inflict further injury upon his defenseless prey the ape-man had closed with him instantly tarzan realized that he was locked with a creature of almost superhuman strength the sinewy fingers of a powerful hand sought his throat while the other lifted the bludgeon above his head but if the strength of the hairy attacker was great great too was that of his smooth-skinned antagonist swinging a single terrific blow with clenched fist to the point of the other's chin tarzan momentarily staggered his assailant and then his own fingers closed upon the shaggy throat as with the other hand he seized the wrist of the arm that swung the club with equal celerity he shot his right leg behind the shaggy brute and throwing his weight forward hurled the thing over his hip heavily to the ground at the same time precipitating his own body upon the other's chest with the shock of the impact the club fell from the brute's hand and tarzan's hold was wrenched from its throat instantly the two were locked in a death-like embrace though the creature bit at tarzan the latter was quickly aware that this was not a particularly formidable method of offence or defence since its canines were scarcely more developed than his own the thing that he had principally to guard against was the sinuous tail which sought steadily to wrap itself about his throat and against which experience had afforded him no defence struggling and snarling the two rolled growling about the sward at the foot of the tree first one on top and then the other but each more occupied at present in defending his throat from the other's choking grasp than in aggressive offensive tactics but presently the ape-man saw his opportunity and as they rolled about he forced the creature closer and closer to the pool upon the banks of which the battle was progressing at last they lay upon the very verge of the water and now it remained for tarzan to precipitate them both beneath the surface but in such a way that he might remain on top at the same instant there came within range of tarzan's vision just behind the prostrate form of his companion the crouching devil-faced figure of the striped saber-tooth hybrid eyeing him with snarling malevolent face almost simultaneously tarzan's shaggy antagonist discovered the menacing figure of the great cat immediately he ceased his belligerent activities against tarzan and jabbering and chattering to the ape-man he tried to disengage himself from tarzan's hold but in such a way that indicated that as far as he was concerned the battle was over appreciating the danger to his unconscious companion and being anxious to protect him from the saber-tooth the ape-man released his hold upon his adversary and together the two rose to their feet drawing his knife tarzan moved slowly toward the body of his companion expecting that his recent antagonist would grasp the opportunity for escape to his surprise however the beast after regaining its club advanced at his side the great cat flattened upon its belly remained motionless except for twitching tail and snarling lips where it lay perhaps fifty feet beyond the body of the pithecanthropus as tarzan stepped over the body of the latter he saw the eyelids quiver and open and in his heart felt a strange sense of relief that the creature was not dead and a realization that without his suspecting it there had arisen within his savage bosom a bond of attachment for this strange new friend 
tarzan continued to approach the saber-tooth nor did the shaggy beast at his right lag behind closer and closer they came until at a distance of about twenty feet the hybrid charged its rush was directed toward the shaggy manlife ape who halted in his tracks with upraised bludgeon to meet the assault tarzan on the contrary leaped forward and with a celerity second not even to that of the swift moving cat he threw himself headlong upon him as might a rugby tackler on an american gridiron his right arm circled the beast's neck in front of the right shoulder his left behind the left foreleg and so great was the force of the impact that the two rolled over and over several times upon the ground the cat screaming and clawing to liberate itself that it might turn upon its attacker the man clinging desperately to his hold seemingly the attack was one of mad senseless ferocity unguided by either reason or skill nothing however could have been farther from the truth than such an assumption since every muscle in the ape-man's giant frame obeyed the dictates of the cunning mind that long experience had trained to meet every exigency of such an encounter the long powerful legs though seemingly inextricably entangled with the hind feet of the clawing cat ever as by a miracle escaped the raking talons and yet at just the proper instant in the midst of all the rolling and tossing they were where they should be to carry out the ape-man's plan of offence so that on the instant that the cat believed it had won the mastery of its antagonist it was jerked suddenly upward as the ape-man rose to his feet holding the striped back close against his body as he rose and forcing it backward until it could but claw the air helplessly instantly the shaggy black rushed in with drawn knife which it buried in the beast's heart for a few moments tarzan retained his hold but when the body had relaxed in final dissolution he pushed it from him and the two who had formerly been locked in mortal combat stood facing each other across the body of the common foe tarzan waited ready either for peace or war presently two shaggy black hands were raised the left was laid upon its own heart and the right extended until the palm touched tarzan's breast it was the same form of friendly salutation with which the pithecanthropus had sealed his alliance with the ape-man and tarzan glad of every ally he could win in this strange and savage world quickly accepted the proffered friendship at the conclusion of the brief ceremony tarzan glancing in the direction of the hairless pithecanthropus discovered that the latter had recovered consciousness and was sitting erect watching them intently he now rose slowly and at the same time the shaggy black turned in his direction and addressed him in what evidently was their common language the hairless one replied and the two approached each other slowly tarzan watched interestedly the outcome of their meeting they halted a few paces apart first one and then the other speaking rapidly but without apparent excitement each occasionally glancing or nodding towards tarzan indicating that he was to some extent the subject of their conversation presently they advanced again until they met whereupon was repeated the brief ceremony of alliance which had previously marked the cessation of hostilities between tarzan and the black they then advanced toward the ape-man addressing him earnestly as though endeavouring to convey to him some important information presently however they gave it up as an unprofitable job and resorting to sign language conveyed to tarzan that they were proceeding upon their way together and were urging him to accompany them as the direction they indicated was a route which tarzan had not previously traversed he was extremely willing to accede to their request as he had determined thoroughly to explore this unknown land before definitely abandoning search for lady jane therein for several days their way led through the foothills parallel to the lofty range towering above often were they menaced by the savage denizens of this remote fastness and occasionally tarzan glimpsed weird forms of gigantic proportions amidst the shadows of the nights on the third day they came upon a large natural cave in the face of a low cliff at the foot of which tumbled one of the numerous mountain brooks that watered the plain below and fed the morasses in the lowlands at the country's edge here the three took up their temporary abode where tarzan's instruction in the language of his companions progressed more rapidly than while on the march the cave gave evidence of having harbored other manlike forms in the past remnants of a crude rock fireplace remained and the walls and ceiling were blackened with the smoke of many fires 
scratched in the soot and sometimes deeply into the rock beneath were strange hieroglyphics and the outlines of beasts and birds and reptiles some of the latter of weird forms suggesting the extinct creatures of jurassic times some of the more recently made hieroglyphics tarzan's companions read with interest and commented upon and then with the points of their knives they too added to the possibly age-old record of the blackened walls tarzan's curiosity was aroused but the only explanation at which he could arrive was that he was looking upon possibly the world's most primitive hotel register at least it gave him a further insight into the development of the strange creatures with which fate had thrown him here were men with the tails of monkeys one of them as hair covered as any fur-bearing brute of the lower orders and yet it was evident that they possessed not only a spoken but a written language the former he was slowly mastering and at this new evidence of unlooked-for civilization in creatures possessing so many of the physical attributes of beasts tarzan's curiosity was still further piqued and his desire quickly to master their tongue strengthened with the result that he fell to with even greater assiduity to the task he had set himself already he knew the names of his companions and the common names of the fauna and flora with which they had most often come in contact Tadan, he of the hairless white skin having assumed the role of tutor prosecuted his task with a singleness of purpose that was reflected in his pupil's rapid mastery of Tadan's mother tongue omat the hairy black also seemed to feel that there rested upon his broad shoulders a portion of the burden of responsibility for tarzan's education with the result that either one or the other of them was almost constantly coaching the ape-man during his waking hours the result was only what might have been expected a rapid assimilation of the teachings to the end that before any of them realized it communication by word of mouth became an accomplished fact tarzan explained to his companions the purpose of his mission but neither could give him any slightest thread of hope to weave into the fabric of his longing never had there been in their country a woman such as he described nor any tailless man other than himself that they ever had seen i have been gone from alur while boo the moon has eaten seven times said ta den many things may happen in seven times twenty-eight days but i doubt that your woman could have entered our country across the terrible morasses which even you found an almost insurmountable obstacle and if she had could she have survived the perils that you already have encountered beside those of which you have yet to learn not even our own women venture into the savage lands beyond the cities allure light city city of light mused tarzan translating the word into his own tongue and where is allure he asked is it your city ta den and omats it is mine replied the hairless one but not omats the wazdan have no cities they live in the trees of the forests and the caves of the hills is it not so black men he concluded turning toward the hairy giant beside him yes replied omat we wazdan are free only the ho don imprison themselves in cities i would not be a white man tarzan smiled even here was the racial distinction between white man and black man hodon and wazdon not even the fact that they appeared to be equals in the matter of intelligence made any difference one was white and one was black and it was easy to see that the white considered himself superior to the other one could see it in his quiet smile where is allur tarzan asked again you are returning to it it is beyond the mountains replied ta den i do not return to it not yet not until kotan is no more kotan queried tarzan kotan is king explained the pithecanthropus he rules this land i was one of his warriors i lived in the palace of kotan and there i met oloa his daughter we loved like starlight and i but kotan would have none of me he sent me away to fight with the men of the village of dakat who had refused to pay his tribute to the king thinking that i would be killed for dakat is famous for his many fine warriors and i was not killed instead i returned victorious with the tribute and with dakat himself my prisoner but kotan was not pleased because he saw that oloa loved me even more than before her love being strengthened and fortified by pride in my achievement powerful is my father jadon the lion man chief of the largest village outside of alur 
him kotan hesitated to affront and so he could not but praise me for my success though he did it with half a smile but you do not understand it is what we call a smile that moves only the muscles of the face and affects not the light of the eyes it means hypocrisy and duplicity i must be praised and rewarded what better than that he reward me with the hand of oloa his daughter but no he saves oloa for bulat son of mosar the chief whose great-grandfather was king and who thinks that he should be king thus would kotan appease the wrath of mosar and win the friendship of those who think with mosar that mosar should be king but what reward shall repay the faithful taden greatly do we honor our priests within the temples even the chiefs and the king himself bow down to them no greater honor could kotan confer upon a subject who wished to be a priest but i do not so wish priests other than the high priest must become eunuchs for they may never marry it was oloa herself who brought word to me that her father had given the commands that would set in motion the machinery of the temple a messenger was on his way in search of me to summon me to kotan's presence to have refused the priesthood once it was offered me by the king would have been to have affronted the temple and the gods that would have meant death but if i did not appear before kotan i would not have to refuse anything oloa and i decided that i must not appear it was better to fly carrying in my bosom a shred of hope than to remain and with my priesthood abandon hope for ever beneath the shadows of the great trees that grow within the palace grounds i pressed her to me for perhaps the last time and then lest by ill fate i meet the messenger i scaled the great wall that guards the palace and passed through the darkened city my name and rank carried me beyond the city gate since then i have wandered far from the haunts of the hodon but strong within me is the urge to return if even but to look from without her walls upon the city that holds her most dear to me and again to visit the village of my birth to see again my father and my mother but the risk is too great asked tarzan it is great but not too great replied ta den i shall go and i shall go with you if i may said the ape-man for i must see this city of light this allure of yours and search there for my lost mate even though you believe that there is little chance that i find her and you omat do you come with us why not asked the hairy one the lairs of my tribe lie in the crags above allure and though esat our chief drove me out i should like to return again for there is a she there upon whom i should be glad to look once more and who would be glad to look upon me yes i will go with you esat feared that i might become chief and who knows but that esat was right but panat lee it is she i seek first even before a chieftainship we three then shall travel together said tarzan and fight together added ta den the three as one and as he spoke he drew his knife and held it above his head the three as one repeated om at drawing his weapon and duplicating ta den's act it is spoken the three as one cried tarzan of the apes to the death and his blade flashed in the sunlight let us go then said om at my knife is dry and cries aloud for the blood of esat the trail over which ta den and omat led and which scarcely could be dignified even by the name of trail was suited more to mountain sheep monkeys or birds than to man but the three that followed it were trained to ways which no ordinary man might essay now upon the lower slopes it led through the dense forests where the ground was so matted with fallen trees and over rioting vines and brush that the way held always to the swaying branches high above the tangle again it skirted yawning gorges whose slippery-faced rocks gave but momentary foothold even to the bare feet that lightly touched them as the three leaped chamois-like from one precarious foothold to the next dizzy and terrifying was the way that omat chose across the summit as he led them around the shoulder of a towering crag that rose a sheer two thousand feet of perpendicular rock above a tumbling river and when at last they stood upon comparatively level ground again omat turned and looked at them both intently and especially at tarzan of the apes it will both do he said you are fit companions for omat the wazdan what do you mean asked tarzan i brought you this way replied the black 
to learn if either lacked the courage to follow where Omat led. It is here that the young warriors of Esat come to prove their courage. And yet, though we are born and raised upon cliff sides, it is considered no disgrace to admit that Pastar Ul Ved, the father of the mountains, has defeated us. For of those who try it, only a few succeed. The bones of the others lie at the feet of Pastar Ul Ved. Taden laughed. I would not care to come this way often, he said. No, replied Omat but it has shortened our journey by at least a full day so much the sooner shall tarzan look upon the valley of jad ben otho come and he led the way upward along the shoulder of pastar ul ved until there lay spread below them a scene of mystery and of beauty a green valley girt by towering cliffs of marble whiteness a green valley dotted by deep blue lakes and crossed by the blue trail of a winding river in the center a city of the whiteness of the marble cliffs a city which even at so great a distance evidenced a strange yet artistic architecture outside the city there were visible about the valley isolated groups of buildings sometimes one again two and three and four in a cluster but always of the same glaring whiteness and always in some fantastic form about the valley the cliffs were occasionally cleft by deep gorges verdure filled giving the appearance of green rivers rioting downward toward a central sea of green jad pele ad jad ben otho murmured tarzan in the tongue of the pithecanthropi the valley of the great god it is beautiful here in alur lives kotan the king ruler over all pal yul -dan, said ta den and here in these gorges live the wazdan exclaimed omat who do not acknowledge that Kotan is the ruler over all the land of man. Ta Den smiled and shrugged. We will not quarrel, you and I, he said to Omat, over that which all the ages have not proved sufficient time in which to reconcile the Hodan and the Wazdan, but let me whisper to you a secret, Omat. The Hodan live together in greater or less peace under one ruler, so that when danger threatens them they face the enemy with many warriors, for every fighting hodan of pal yul -dan is there but you wazdan how is it with you you have a dozen kings who fight not only with the hodan but with one another when one of your tribes goes forth upon the fighting trail even against the hodan it must leave behind sufficient warriors to protect its women and its children from the neighbors upon either hand when we want eunuchs for the temples or servants for the fields or the homes we march forth in great numbers upon one of your villages you cannot even flee for upon either side of you are enemies and though you fight bravely we come back with those who will presently be eunuchs in the temples and servants in our fields and homes so long as the wazdan are thus foolish the hodan will dominate and their king will be king of paluldan perhaps you are right admitted omat it is because our neighbors are fools each thinking that his tribe is the greatest and should rule among the wazdan they will not admit that the warriors of my tribe are the bravest and our she's the most beautiful ta den grinned each of the others presents precisely the same arguments that you present omat he said which my friend is the strongest bulwark of defence possessed by the hodan come exclaimed tarzan such discussions often lead to quarrels and we three must have no quarrels i of course am interested in learning what i can of the political and economic conditions of your land i should like to know something of your religion but not at the expense of bitterness between my only friends in pal yul -dan. possibly however you hold to the same god there indeed we do differ cried omat somewhat bitterly and with a trace of excitement in his voice differ almost shouted ta den and why should we not differ who could agree with the preposterous stop cried tarzan now indeed have i stirred up a hornet's nest let us speak no more of matters political or religious that is wiser agreed omat but i might mention for your information that the one and only god has a long tail it is sacrilege cried ta den laying his hand upon his knife jad ben otho has no tail stop shrieked omat springing forward but instantly tarzan interposed himself between them enough he snapped let us be true to our oaths of friendship that we may be honorable in the sight of god in whatever form we conceive him you are right tailless one said ta den 
come omat let us look after our friendship and ourselves secure in the conviction that jad ben otho is sufficiently powerful to look after himself done agreed omat but no buts omat admonished tarzan the shaggy black shrugged his shoulders and smiled shall we make our way down toward the valley he asked the gorge below us is uninhabited that to the left contains the caves of my people i would see panat lee once more ta den would visit his father in the valley below and tarzan seeks entrance to a lure in search of the mate that would be better dead than in the clutches of the hodon priests of jad ben otho shall we proceed let us remain together as long as possible urged ta den you omat must seek panat lee by night and by stealth for three even we three may not hope to overcome es sat and all his warriors at any time may we go to the village where my father is chief for jadan always will welcome the friends of his son but for tarzan to enter a lure is another matter though there is a way and he has the courage to put it to the test listen come close for jad ben otho has keen ears and this he must not hear and with his lips close to the ears of his companions taden the tall tree son of jadan the lion man unfolded his daring plan and at the same moment a hundred miles away a lithe figure naked but for a loincloth and weapons moved silently across a thorn-covered waterless steppe searching always along the ground before him with keen eyes and sensitive nostrils end of chapter two read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com chapter three pan at lee night had fallen upon unchartered paluldon a slender moon low in the west bathed the white faces of the chalk cliffs presented to her in a mellow unearthly glow black were the shadows in kor yul ja gorge of lions where dwelt the tribe of the same name under essat their chief from an aperture near the summit of the lofty escarpment a hairy figure emerged the head and shoulders first and fierce eyes scanned the cliff-side in every direction it was essat the chief to right and left and below he looked as though to assure himself that he was unobserved but no other figure moved upon the cliff face nor did any hairy body protrude from any of the numerous cave mouths from the high-flung abode of the chief to the habitations of the more lowly members of the tribe nearer the cliff's base then he moved outward upon the sheer face of the white chalk wall in the half-light of the baby moon it appeared that the heavy shaggy black figure moved across the face of the perpendicular wall in some miraculous manner but closer examination would have revealed stout pegs as large around as a man's wrist protruding from holes in the cliff into which they were driven Essot's four hand-like members and his long sinuous tail permitted him to move with consummate ease whither he chose a gigantic rat upon a mighty wall as he progressed upon his way he avoided the cave mouths passing either above or below these that lay in his path the outward appearance of these caves was similar an opening from eight to as much as twenty feet long by eight high and four to six feet deep was cut into the chalk-like rock of the cliff in the back of this large opening which formed what might be described as the front veranda of the home was an opening about three feet wide and six feet high apparently forming the doorway to the interior apartment or apartments on either side of this doorway were smaller openings which it were easy to assume were windows through which light and air might find their way to the inhabitants similar windows were also dotted over the cliff face between the entrance porches suggesting that the entire face of the cliff was honeycombed with apartments from many of these smaller apertures small streams of water trickled down the escarpment and the walls above others was blackened as by smoke where the water ran the wall was eroded to a depth of from a few inches to as much as a foot suggesting that some of the tiny streams had been trickling downward to the green carpet of vegetation below for ages in this primeval setting the great pithecanthropus aroused no jarring discord for he was as much a part of it as the trees that grew upon the summit of the cliff 
or those that hid their feet among the dank ferns in the bottom of the gorge now he paused before an entrance way and listened and then noiselessly as the moonlight upon the trickling waters he merged with the shadows of the outer porch at the doorway leading into the interior he paused again listening and then quietly pushing aside the heavy skin that covered the aperture he passed within a large chamber hewn from the living rock from the far end through another doorway shone a light dimly toward this he crept with utmost stealth his naked feet giving forth no sound the knotted club that had been hanging at his back from a thong about his neck he now removed and carried in his left hand beyond this second doorway was a corridor running parallel with the cliff face in this corridor were three more doorways one at each end and a third almost opposite that in which eset stood the light was coming from an apartment at the end of the corridor at his left a sputtering flame rose and fell in a small stone receptacle that stood upon a table or bench of the same material a monolithic bench fashioned at the time the room was excavated rising massively from the floor of which it was a part in one corner of the room beyond the table had been left a dais of stone about four feet wide and eight feet long upon this were piled a foot or so of softly tanned pelts from which the fur had not been removed upon the edge of this dais sat a young female wazdan in one hand she held a thin piece of metal apparently of hammered gold with serrated edges and in the other a short stiff brush with these she was occupied in going over her smooth glossy coat which bore a remarkable resemblance to plucked sealskin her loin cloth of yellow and black striped jado skin lay on the couch beside her with the circular breastplates of beaten gold revealing the symmetrical lines of her nude figure in all its beauty and harmony of contour for even though the creature was jet black and entirely covered with hair yet she was undeniably beautiful that she was beautiful in the eyes of essat the chief was evidenced by the gloating expression upon his fierce countenance and the increased rapidity of his breathing moving quickly forward he entered the room and as he did so the young she looked up instantly her eyes filled with terror and as quickly she seized the loincloth and with a few deft movements adjusted it about her as she gathered up her breastplates essat rounded the table and moved quickly toward her what do you want she whispered though she knew full well Bennett Lee, he said your chief has come for you it was for this that you sent away my father and my brothers to spy upon the kor lul i will not have you leave the cave of my ancestors essat smiled it was the smile of a strong and wicked man who knows his power not a pleasant smile at all i will leave panet lee he said but you shall go with me to the cave of essat the chief to be the envied of the shes of kor ul ja come never cried panet lee i hate you sooner would i mate with a hodon than with you beater of women murderer of babes a frightful scowl distorted the features of the chief she jato he cried i will tame you i will break you Essat the chief takes what he will and who dares question his right or combat his least purpose will first serve that purpose then be broken as i break this and he picked a stone platter from the table and broke it in his powerful hands you might have been first and most favored in the cave of the ancestors of Essat but now shall you be last and least and when i am done with you you shall belong to all of the men of essat's cave thus for those who spurn the love of their chief he advanced quickly to seize her and as he laid a rough hand upon her she struck him heavily upon the side of the head with her golden breastplates without a sound essat the chief sank to the floor of the apartment for a moment panat lee bent over him her improvised weapon raised to strike again should he show signs of returning consciousness her glossy breasts rising and falling with her quickened breathing suddenly she stooped and removed essat's knife with its scabbard and shoulder belt slipping it over her own shoulder she quickly adjusted her breastplates and keeping a watchful glance upon the figure of the fallen chief backed from the room in a niche in the outer room just beside the doorway leading to the balcony were neatly piled a number of rounded pegs from eighteen to twenty inches in length selecting five of these she made them into a little bundle about which she twined the lower extremity of her sinuous tail 
and thus carrying them made her way to the outer edge of the balcony assuring herself that there was none about to see or hinder her she took quickly to the pegs already set in the face of the cliff and with the celerity of a monkey clambered swiftly aloft to the highest row of pegs which she followed in the direction of the lower end of the gorge for a matter of some hundred yards here above her head were a series of small round holes placed one above another in three parallel rows clinging only with her toes she removed two of the pegs from the bundle carried in her tail and taking one in either hand she inserted them in two opposite holes of the outer rows as far above her as she could reach hanging by these new holds she took one of the three remaining pegs in each of her feet leaving the fifth grasped securely in her tail reaching above her with this member she inserted the fifth peg in one of the holes of the center row and then alternately hanging by her tail her feet or her hands she moved the pegs upward to new holes thus carrying her stairway with her as she ascended at the summit of the cliff a gnarled tree exposed its time-worn roots above the topmost holes forming the last step from the sheer face of the precipice to level footing this was the last avenue of escape for members of the tribe hard pressed by enemies from below there were three such emergency exits from the village and it were death to use them in other than an emergency this panat lee well knew but she knew too that it were worse than death to remain where the angered essot may lay hands upon her when she had gained the summit the girl moved quickly through the darkness in the direction of the next gorge which cut the mountainside a mile below koryul ja it was the gorge of water koryul lol to which her father and two brothers had been sent by essat ostensibly to spy upon the neighboring tribe there was a chance a slender chance that she might find them if not there was the deserted koryul griff several miles beyond where she might hide indefinitely from man if she could elude the frightful monster from which the gorge derived its name and whose presence there had rendered its caves uninhabitable for generations Panat Lee crept stealthily along the rim of the Koryul Lull. Just where her father and brothers would watch, she did not know. Sometimes their spies remained upon the rim, sometimes they watched from the gorge's bottom. Panat Lee was at a loss to know what to do or where to go. She felt very small and helpless, alone in the vast darkness of the night. Strange noises fell upon her ears. They came from the lonely reaches of the towering mountains above her, from far away in the invisible valley, and from the nearer foothills, and once, in the distance, she heard what she thought was the bellow of a bull griff. It came from the direction of the Koryul griff. She shuddered. Presently there came to her keen ears another sound. Something approached her along the rim of the gorge. It was coming from above. She halted, listening. Perhaps it was her father, or a brother it was coming closer she strained her eyes through the darkness she did not move she scarcely breathed and then of a sudden quite close it seemed there blazed through the black night two yellow-green spots of fire panat lee was brave but as always with the primitive the darkness held infinite terrors for her not alone the terrors of the known but more frightful ones as well those of the unknown she had passed through much this night, and her nerves were keyed to the highest pitch, raw, taut nerves they were, ready to react in an exaggerated form to the slightest shock. But this was no slight shock. To hope for a father and a brother, and to see death instead glaring out of the darkness. Yes, Panat Lee was brave, but she was not of iron. With a shriek that reverberated along the hills, she turned and fled along the rim of Koryul Lull, and behind her swiftly came the devil-eyed lion of the mountains of Paludan. Panat Lee was lost. Death was inevitable. Of this there could be no doubt, but to die beneath the rending fangs of the carnivore, congenital terror of her kind, it was unthinkable. But there was an alternative. The lion was almost upon her. Another instant and he would seize her. Panat Lee turned sharply to her left. Just a few steps she took in the new direction before she disappeared over the rim of Koryul Lull. The baffled lion, planting all four feet, barely stopped upon the verge of the abyss. Glaring down into the black shadows beneath, he mounted an angry roar. Through the darkness at the bottom of Koryul Ja, Omat led the way toward the caves of his people. Behind him came Tarzan and Ta-den. 
Presently they halted beneath a great tree that grew close to the cliff. First, whispered Omat, I will go to the cave of Panat Lee. Then will I seek the cave of my ancestors to have speech with my own blood. It will not take long. Wait here, I shall return soon. Afterward shall we go together to Taden's people. He moved silently toward the foot of the cliff up which Tarzan could presently see him ascending like a great fly on a wall. In the dim light the ape-man could not see the pegs set in the face of the cliff. Omat moved warily. In the lower tier of caves there should be a sentry. His knowledge of his people and their customs told him, however, that in all probability the sentry was asleep. In this he was not mistaken, yet he did not in any way abate his wariness. Smoothly and swiftly he ascended toward the cave of Panat Lee, while from below Tarzan and Ta Den watched him. "'How does he do it?' asked tarzan i can see no foothold upon that vertical surface yet he appears to be climbing with the utmost ease ta den explained the stairway of pegs you could ascend easily he said although a tail would be of great assistance they watched until omat was about to enter the cave of panat lee without seeing any indication that he had been observed and then simultaneously both saw a head appear in the mouth of one of the lower caves it was quickly evident that its owner had discovered Omat, for immediately he started upward in pursuit. Without a word, Tarzan and Ta Den sprang forward toward the foot of the cliff. The Pithecanthropus was the first to reach it, and the ape-man saw him spring upward for a handhold on the lowest peg above him. Now Tarzan saw other pegs roughly paralleling each other in zigzag rows up the cliff. He sprang and caught one of these, pulled himself upward by one hand until he could reach a second with his other hand, and when he had ascended far enough to use his feet, discovered that he could make rapid progress. Ta Den was outstripping him, however, for these precarious ladders were no novelty to him, and further, he had an advantage in possessing a tail. Nevertheless, the ape-man gave a good account of himself, being presently urged to redoubled efforts by the fact that the Wazdan above Taden glanced down and discovered his pursuers just before the Hodan overtook him. Instantly a wild cry shattered the silence of the gorge, a cry that was immediately answered by hundreds of savage throats as warrior after warrior emerged from the entrance to his cave. The creature who had raised the alarm had now reached the recess before Panat Lee's cave, and here he halted and turned to give battle to Ta Den. Unslinging his club, which had hung down his back from a thong about his neck, he stood upon the level floor of the entranceway, effectually blocking Ta Den's ascent. From all directions the warriors of Kor Yul Ja were swarming toward the interlopers. Tarzan, who had reached a point on the same level with Ta Den, but a little to the latter's left, saw that nothing short of a miracle could save them just at the ape-man's left was the entrance to a cave that either was deserted or whose occupants had not as yet been aroused for the level recess remained unoccupied resourceful was the alert mind of tarzan of the apes and quick to respond were the trained muscles in the time that you or i might give to debating an action he would accomplish it and now though only seconds separated his nearest antagonist from him in the brief span of time at his disposal he had stepped into the recess unslung his long rope and leaning far out shot the sinuous noose with the precision of long habitude toward the menacing figure wielding its heavy club above Taden. There was a momentary pause of the rope hand as the noose sped toward its goal, a quick movement of the right wrist that closed it upon its victim as it settled over his head, and then a surging tug as, seizing the rope in both hands, Tarzan threw back upon it all the weight of his great frame. Voicing a terrified shriek, the Wazdan lunged head foremost from the recess above Taden. Tarzan braced himself for the coming shock when the creature's body should have fallen the full length of the rope and as it did there was a snap of the vertebrae that rose sickeningly in the momentary silence that had followed the doomed man's departing scream unshaken by the stress of the suddenly arrested weight at the end of the rope tarzan quickly pulled the body to his side that he might remove the noose from about its neck for he could not afford to lose so priceless a weapon during the several seconds that had elapsed since he cast the rope the wazdan warriors had remained inert as though paralyzed by wonder or by terror now again one of them found his voice and his head and straightway shrieking invectives at the strange intruder started upward for the ape-man 
urging his fellows to attack this man was the closest to tarzan but for him the ape-man could easily have reached ta den's side as the latter was urging him to do tarzan raised the body of the dead wazdan above his head held it poised there for a moment as with face raised to the heavens he screamed forth the horrid challenge of the bull apes of the tribe of kerchak and with all the strength of his giant sinews he hurled the corpse heavily upon the ascending warrior so great was the force of the impact that not only was the wazdan torn from his hold but two of the pegs to which he clung were broken short in their sockets as the two bodies the living and the dead hurtled downward toward the foot of the cliff a great cry arose from the wazdan jadguru don jadguru don they screamed and then kill him kill him and now tarzan stood in the recess beside ta den jadguru don repeated the latter smiling the terrible man tarzan the terrible they may kill you but they will never forget you they shall not ki what have we here tarzan's statement as to what they should not do was interrupted by a sudden ejaculation as two figures locked in death-like embrace stumbled through the doorway of the cave to the outer porch one was omat the other a creature of his own kind but with a rough coat the hairs of which seemed to grow straight outward from the skin stiffly unlike omat's sleek covering the two were quite evidently well matched and equally evident was the fact that each was bent upon murder they fought almost in silence except for an occasional low growl as one or the other acknowledged thus some new hurt tarzan following a natural impulse to aid his ally leaped forward to enter the dispute only to be checked by a grunted admonition from omat back he said this fight is mine alone the ape-man understood and stepped aside it is a gundbar explained ta den a chief battle this fellow must be esat the chief if omat kills him without assistance omat may become chief tarzan smiled it was the law of his own jungle the law of the tribe of kerchak the bull ape the ancient law of primitive man that needed but the refining influences of civilization to introduce the hired dagger and the poison cup then his attention was drawn to the outer edge of the vestibule above it appeared the shaggy face of one of esat's warriors tarzan sprang to intercept the man but ta den was there ahead of him mac cried the hodon to the newcomer it is gundbar the fellow looked scrutinizingly at the two fighters then turned his face downward toward his fellows mac he cried it is gundbar between esat and omat then he looked back at ta den and tarzan who are you he asked we are omat's friends replied ta den the fellow nodded we will attend to you later he said and disappeared below the edge of the recess the battle upon the ledge continued with unabated ferocity tarzan and ta den having difficulty in keeping out of the way of the contestants who tore and beat at each other with hands and feet and lashing tails Esat was unarmed, Panat Lee had seen to that, but at Omat's side swung a sheathed knife which he made no effort to draw. That would have been contrary to their savage and primitive code, for the chief battle must be fought with nature's weapons. Sometimes they separated for an instant only to rush upon each other again with all the ferocity and nearly the strength of mad bulls. Presently one of them tripped the other, but in that vice-like embrace one could not fall alone esat dragged omat with him toppling upon the brink of the niche even tarzan held his breath there they surged to and fro perilously for a moment and then the inevitable happened the two locked in murderous embrace rolled over the edge and disappeared from the ape-man's view tarzan voiced a suppressed sigh for he had liked omat and then with ta den approached the edge and looked over far below in the dim light of the coming dawn two inert forms should be lying stark in death but to tarzan's amazement such was far from the sight that met his eyes instead there were the two figures still vibrant with life and still battling only a few feet below him clinging always to the pegs with two holds a hand and a foot or a foot and a tail they seemed as much at home upon the perpendicular wall as upon the level surface of the vestibule but now their tactics were slightly altered for each seemed particularly bent upon dislodging his antagonist from his holds and precipitating him to certain death below it was soon evident that omat younger and with greater powers of endurance than esat was gaining an advantage 
now was the chief almost wholly on the defensive holding him by the cross belt with one mighty hand omat was forcing his foeman straight out from the cliff and with the other hand and one foot was rapidly breaking first one of esat's holds and then another alternating his efforts or rather punctuating them with vicious blows to the pit of his adversary's stomach rapidly was esat weakening and with the knowledge of impending death there came as there comes to every coward and bully under similar circumstances a ah, crumbling of the veneer of bravado which had long masqueraded as courage and with it crumbled his code of ethics now was esat no longer chief of kor ul ja instead he was a whimpering craven battling for life clutching at omat clutching at the nearest pegs he sought any support that would save him from that awful fall and as he strove to push aside the hand of death whose cold fingers he already felt upon his heart his tail sought omat's side and the handle of the knife that hung there tarzan saw and even as esat drew the blade from its sheath he dropped cat-like to the pegs beside the battling men esat's tail had drawn back for the cowardly fatal thrust now many others saw the perfidious act and a great cry of rage and disgust arose from savage throats but as the blade sped toward its goal the ape-man seized the hairy member that wielded it and at the same instant omat thrust the body of esat from him with such force that its weakened holds were broken and it hurtled downward a brief meteor of screaming fear to death end of chapter three read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark dot blogspot dot com chapter four tarzan jad guru as tarzan and omat clambered back to the vestibule of panatli's cave and took their stand beside ta den in readiness for whatever eventually might follow the death of esat the sun that topped the eastern hills touched also the figure of a sleeper upon a distant thorn-covered step awakening him to another day of tireless tracking along a faint and rapidly disappearing spoor for a time silence reigned in the kor ul -ja. the tribesmen waited looking now down upon the dead thing that had been their chief now at one another and now at omat and the two who stood upon his either side presently omat spoke i am omat he cried who will say that omat is not gund of kor ul -ja? he waited for a taker of his challenge one or two of the larger young bucks fidgeted restlessly and eyed him but there was no reply then omat is gund he said with finality now tell me where are panat lee her father and her brothers an old warrior spoke panat lee should be in her cave who should know that better than you who are there now her father and her brothers were sent to watch kor ul lul but none of these questions arouse any tumult in our breasts there is one that does can omat be chief of kor ul ja and yet stand at bay against his own people with a ho-don and that terrible man at his side that terrible man who has no tail hand the strangers over to your people to be slain as is the way of the wazdan and then may omat be gund neither tarzan nor ta den spoke then but they stood watching omat and waiting for his decision the ghost of a smile upon the lips of the ape-man ta den at least knew that the old warrior had spoken the truth the wazdan entertain no strangers and take no prisoners of an alien race then spoke omat always there is change he said even the old hills of pal ul don appear never twice alike the brilliant sun a passing cloud the moon a mist the changing seasons the sharp clearness following a storm these things bring each a new change in our hills from birth to death day by day there is constant change in each of us change then is one of jad ben otho's laws and now i omat your gund bring another change strangers who are brave men and good friends shall no longer be slain by the wazdan of kor ul -ja. there were growls and murmurings and a restless moving among the warriors as each eyed the others to see who would take the initiative against omat the iconoclast cease your mutterings admonished the new gund 
i am your chief my word is your law you had no part in making me chief some of you helped essat to drive me from the cave of my ancestors the rest of you permitted it i owe you nothing only these two whom you would have me kill were loyal to me i am gund and if there be any who doubts it let him speak he cannot die younger tarzan was pleased here was a man after his own heart he admired the fearlessness of omat's challenge and he was a sufficiently good judge of men to know that he had listened to no idle bluff omat would back up his words to the death if necessary and the chances were that he would not be the one to die evidently the majority of the koryul giants entertained the same conviction i will make you a good gund said omat seeing that no one appeared inclined to dispute his rights your wives and daughters will be safe they were not safe while essat ruled go now to your crops and your hunting i leave to search for panat lee aban will be gund while i am away look to him for guidance and to me for an accounting when i return and may jad ben otho smile upon you he turned toward tarzan and the hodan and you my friends he said are free to go among my people the cave of my ancestors is yours do what you will i said tarzan will go with omat to search for panat lee and i said ta den omat smiled good he exclaimed and when we have found her we shall go together upon tarzan's business and ta den's where first shall we search he turned toward his warriors who knows where she may be none knew other than that panat lee had gone to her cave with the others the previous evening there was no clue no suggestion as to her whereabouts show me where she sleeps said tarzan let me see something that belongs to her an article of her apparel then doubtless i can help you two young warriors climbed closer to the ledge upon which omat stood they were insad and odon it was the latter who spoke gund of kor ul ja he said we would go with you to search for panat lee it was the first acknowledgment of omat's chieftainship and immediately following it the tenseness that had prevailed seemed to relax the warriors spoke aloud instead of in whispers and the women appeared from the mouths of caves as with the passing of a sudden storm insad and odon had taken the lead and now all seemed glad to follow some came to talk with omat and to look more closely at tarzan others heads of caves gathered their hunters and discussed the business of the day the women and children prepared to descend to the fields with the youths and the old men whose duty it was to guard them odon and insad shall go with us announced omat we shall not need more tarzan come with me and i shall show you where panat lee sleeps though why you should wish to know i cannot guess she is not there i have looked for myself the two entered the cave where omat led the way to the apartment in which essat had surprised panat lee the previous night all here are hers said omat except the war club lying on the floor that was essat's the ape-man moved silently about the apartment the quivering of his sensitive nostrils scarcely apparent to his companion who only wondered what good purpose could be served here and chafed at the delay come said the ape-man presently and led the way toward the outer recess here their three companions were awaiting them tarzan passed to the left side of the niche and examined the pegs that lay within reach he looked at them but it was not his eyes that were examining them keener than his keen eyes was that marvellously trained sense of scent that had first been developed in him during infancy under the tutorage of his foster mother kala the she-ape and further sharpened in the grim jungles by that master teacher the instinct of self-preservation from the left side of the niche he turned to the right omat was becoming impatient let us be off he said we must search for panat lee if we would ever find her where shall we search asked tarzan omat scratched his head where he repeated why all pal you don if necessary a large job said tarzan come he added she went this way and he took to the pegs that led aloft toward the summit of the cliff here he followed the scent easily since none had passed that way since panat lee had fled at the point at which she had left the permanent pegs and resorted to those carried with her tarzan came to an abrupt halt she went this way to the summit he called back to omat who was directly behind him but there are no pegs here i do not know how you know that she went this way said omat 
but we will get pegs insad return and fetch climbing pegs for five the young warrior was soon back and the pegs distributed omat handed five to tarzan and explained their use the ape-man returned one i need but four he said omat smiled what a wonderful creature you would be if you were not deformed he said glancing with pride at his own strong tail i admit that i am handicapped replied tarzan you others go ahead and leave the pegs in place for me i am afraid that otherwise it will be slow work as i cannot hold the pegs in my toes as you do all right agreed omat ta den insad and i will go first you follow and o dan bring up the rear and collect the pegs we cannot leave them here for our enemies can't your enemies bring their own pegs asked tarzan yes but it delays them and makes easier our defence and they do not know which of all the holes you see are deep enough for pegs the others are made to confuse our enemies and are too shallow to hold the peg at the top of the cliff beside the gnarled tree tarzan again took up the trail here the scent was fully as strong as upon the pegs and the ape-man moved rapidly across the ridge in the direction of the kor ul lul presently he paused and turned toward omat here she moved swiftly running at top speed and omat she was pursued by a lion you can read that in the grass asked odon as the others gathered about the ape-man tarzan nodded i do not think the lion got her he added but that we shall determine quickly no he did not get her look and he pointed toward the southwest down the ridge following the direction indicated by his finger the others presently detected a movement in some bushes a couple of hundred yards away what is it asked omat is it she and he started toward the spot wait advised tarzan it is the lion which pursued her you can see him asked ta den no i can smell him the others looked their astonishment and incredulity but of the fact that it was indeed a lion they were not left long in doubt presently the bushes parted and the creature stepped out in full view facing them it was a magnificent beast large and beautifully maned with the brilliant leopard spots of its kind well marked and symmetrical for a moment it eyed them and then still chafing at the loss of its prey earlier in the morning it charged the polyodonians unslung their clubs and stood waiting for the onrushing beast tarzan of the apes drew his hunting knife and crouched in the path of the fanged fury it was almost upon him when it swerved to the right and leaped for omat only to be sent to the earth with a staggering blow upon the head almost instantly it was up and though the men rushed fearlessly in it managed to sweep aside their weapons with its mighty paws a single blow wrenched odon's club from his hand and sent it hurtling against Taden, knocking him from his feet taking advantage of its opportunity the lion rose to throw itself upon odon and at the same instant tarzan flung himself upon its back strong white teeth buried themselves in the spotted neck mighty arms encircled the savage throat and the sinewy legs of the ape-man locked themselves about the gaunt belly the others powerless to aid stood breathlessly about as the great lion lunged hither and thither clawing and biting fearfully and futilely at the savage creature that had fastened itself upon him over and over they rolled and now the onlookers saw a brown hand raised above the lion's side a brown hand grasping a keen blade they saw it fall and rise and fall again each time with terrific force and in its wake they saw a crimson stream trickling down jaws gorgeous coat now from the lion's throat rose hideous screams of hate and rage and pain as he redoubled his efforts to dislodge and punish his tormentor but always the tousled black head remained half buried in the dark brown mane and the mighty arm rose and fell to plunge the knife again and again into the dying beast the polyodonians stood in mute wonder and admiration brave men and mighty hunters they were and as such the first to accord honor to a mightier and you would have had me slay him cried omat glancing at insad and odon and jad ben otho reward you that you did not breathed insad and now the lion lunged suddenly to earth and with a few spasmodic quiverings lay still the ape-man rose and shook himself even as might jaw the leopard-coated lion of pal Yudan, had he been the one to survive odon advanced quickly toward tarzan placing a palm upon his own breast and the other on tarzan's tarzan the terrible he said i ask no greater honor than your friendship and i no more than the friendship of omat's friends replied the ape-man simply returning the other's salute 
do you think asked Olmot, coming close to tarzan and laying a hand upon the other's shoulder that he got her no my friend it was a hungry lion that charged us you seem to know much of lions said insad had i a brother i could not know him better replied tarzan then where can she be continued Omot. we can but follow while the spoor is fresh answered the ape-man and again taking up his interrupted tracking he led them down the ridge and at a sharp turning of the trail to the left brought them to the verge of the cliff that dropped into koryul lull for a moment tarzan examined the ground to the right and to the left then he stood erect and looking at Omot, pointed into the gorge for a moment the wazdan gazed down into the green rift at the bottom of which a tumultuous river tumbled downward along its rocky bed then he closed his eyes as to a sudden spasm of pain and turned away you mean she jumped he asked to escape the lion replied tarzan he was right behind her look you can see where his four paws left their impress on the turf as he checked his charge upon the very verge of the abyss is there any chance commenced Omot, to be suddenly silenced by a warning gesture from tarzan down whispered the ape-man many men are coming they are running from down the ridge he flattened himself upon his belly in the grass the others following his example for some minutes they waited thus and then the others too heard the sound of running feet and now a hoarse shout followed by many more it is the war cry of the kor ul lul whispered Omot, the hunting cry of men who hunt men presently shall we see them and if jad ban otho is pleased with us they shall not too greatly outnumber us they are many said tarzan forty or fifty i should say but how many are the pursued and how many the pursuers we cannot even guess except that the latter must greatly outnumber the former else these would not run so fast here they come said ta -den. it is anon father of panat lee and his two sons exclaimed o -dan they will pass without seeing us if we do not hurry he added looking at Omot, the chief for a sign come cried the latter springing to his feet and running rapidly to intercept the three fugitives the others followed him five friends shouted Omot, as anon and his sons discovered them aden and yo echoed odon and insad the fugitives scarcely paused as these unexpected reinforcements joined them but they eyed ta -den and tarzan with puzzled glances the kor ul lul are many shouted anon would that we might pause and fight but first we must warn Esat and our people yes said Omot. we must warn our people Esat is dead said insad who is chief asked one of anon's sons Omot replied odon it is well cried anon panat lee said you would come back and slay Esat. now the enemy broke into sight behind them come cried tarzan let us turn and charge them raising a great cry they pursued but three and when they see eight charging upon them they will think that many men have come to do battle they will believe that there are more even than they see and then one who is swift will have time to reach the gorge and warn your people it is well said Omot. idan you are swift carry word to the warriors of kor ul ja that we fight the kor ul lul upon the ridge and that aban shall send a hundred men idan the son of anon sped swiftly toward the cliff dwellings of the kor ul ja while the others charged the oncoming kor ul lul the war cries of the two tribes rising and falling in a certain grim harmony the leaders of the kor ul lul paused at sight of the reinforcements waiting apparently for those behind to catch up with them and possibly also to learn how great a force confronted them the leaders swifter runners than their fellows perhaps were far in advance while the balance of their number had not yet emerged from the brush and now as omot and his companions fell upon them with a ferocity born of necessity they fell back so that when their companions at last came in sight of them they appeared to be in full rout the natural result was that the others turned and fled encouraged by this first success omot followed them into the brush his little company charging valiantly upon his either side and loud and terrifying were the savage yells with which they pursued the fleeing enemy the brush while not growing so closely together as to impede progress was of such height as to hide the members of the party from one another when they became separated by even a few yards the result was that tarzan always swift and always keen for battle was soon pursuing the enemy far in the lead of the others a lack of prudence which was to prove his undoing the warriors of kor ul lul doubtless as valorous as their foemen retreated only to a more strategic position in the brush 
nor were they long in guessing that the number of their pursuers was fewer than their own they made a stand there where the brush was densest an ambush it was and into this ran tarzan of the apes they tricked him neatly yes sad as is the narration of it they tricked the wily jungle lord but then they were fighting on their own ground every foot of which they knew as you know your front parlor and they were following their own tactics of which tarzan knew nothing a single black warrior appeared to tarzan a laggard in the rear of the retreating enemy and thus retreating he lured tarzan on at last he turned at bay confronting the ape-man with bludgeon and drawn knife and as tarzan charged him a score of burly wazdan leaped from the surrounding bush instantly but too late the giant tarmangani realized his peril there flashed before him a vision of his lost mate and a great and sickening regret surged through him with the realization that if she still lived she might no longer hope for though she might never know of the passing of her lord the fact of it must inevitably seal her doom and consequent to this thought there enveloped him a blind frenzy of hatred for these creatures who dared thwart his purpose and menace the welfare of his wife with a savage growl he threw himself upon the warrior before him twisting the heavy club from the creature's hand as if he had been a little child and with his left fist backed by the weight and sinew of his giant frame he crashed a shattering blow to the centre of the waz don's face a blow that crushed the bones and dropped the fellow in his tracks then he swung upon the others with their fallen comrades bludgeon striking to right and left mighty unmerciful blows that drove down their own weapons until that wielded by the ape-man was splintered and shattered on either hand they fell before his cudgel so rapid the delivery of his blows so cat-like his recovery that in the first few moments of the battle he seemed invulnerable to their attack but it could not last he was outnumbered twenty to one and his undoing came from a thrown club it struck him upon the back of the head for a moment he stood swaying and then like a great pine beneath the woodsman's axe he crashed to earth others of the kor lull had rushed to engage the balance of omot's party they could be heard fighting at a short distance and it was evident that the kor ja were falling slowly back and as they fell omot called to the missing one tarzan the terrible tarzan the terrible jad guru indeed repeated one of the kor ul lul rising from where tarzan had dropped him tarzan jad guru he was worse than that end of chapter four read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark dot blogspot dot com chapter five in the kor ul griff as tarzan fell among his enemies a man halted many miles away upon the outer verge of the morass that encircles palul don naked he was except for a loin-cloth and three belts of cartridges two of which passed over his shoulders crossing upon his chest and back while the third encircled his waist slung to his back by its leathern sling-strap was an enfield and he carried too a long knife a bow and a quiver of arrows he had come far through wild and savage lands menaced by fierce beasts and fiercer men yet intact to the last cartridge was the ammunition that had filled his belts the day that he set out the bow and arrows and the long knife had brought him thus far safely yet often in the face of great risks that could have been minimized by a single shot from the well-kept rifle at his back what purpose might he have for conserving this precious ammunition in risking his life to bring the last bright shining missile to his unknown goal for what for whom were these death-dealing bits of metal preserved in all the world only he knew when pan at lee stepped over the edge of the cliff above kor ul lul she expected to be dashed to instant death upon the rocks below but she had chosen this in preference to the rending fangs of jaw instead chance had ordained that she make the frightful plunge at a point where the tumbling river swung close beneath the overhanging cliff to eddy for a slow moment in a deep pool before plunging madly downward again in a cataract of boiling foam and water thundering against rocks into this icy pool the girl shot and down and down beneath the watery surface until half choked yet fighting bravely she battled her way once more to air 
swimming strongly she made the opposite shore and there dragged herself out upon the bank to lie panting and spent until the approaching dawn warned her to seek concealment for she was in the country of her people's enemies rising she moved into the concealment of the rank vegetation that grows so riotously in the well-watered cores footnote one I have used the Palul Don word for gorge with the English plural, which is not the correct native plural form. The latter, it seems to me, is awkward for us, and so I have generally ignored it throughout my manuscript, permitting, for example, Coryul Jaw to answer for both singular and plural. However, for the benefit of those who may be interested in such things, I may say that the plurals are formed simply for all words in the Palul Don language, by doubling the initial letter of the word, as kakor, gorges, pronounced as though written kakor, the a having the sound of a ah in sofa, lions, the dawn. End of footnote one. Of Paul Yuldan. Hidden amidst the plant life from the sight of any who might chance to pass along the well-beaten trail that skirted the river, Panetli sought rest and food the latter growing in abundance all about her in the form of fruits and berries and succulent tubers which she scooped from the earth with the knife of the dead esat ah if she had but known that he was dead what trials and risks and terrors she might have been saved but she thought that he still lived and so she dared not return to koryul ja at least not yet while his rage was at white heat later perhaps her father and brothers returned to their cave she might risk it but not now not now nor could she for long remain here in the neighborhood of the hostile koryul lull and somewhere she must find safety from beasts before the night set in as she sat upon the bole of a fallen tree seeking some solution of the problem of existence that confronted her there broke upon her ears from up the gorge the voices of shouting men a sound that she recognized all too well it was the war cry of the koryul lull closer and closer it approached her hiding place then through the veil of foliage she caught glimpses of three figures fleeing along the trail and behind them the shouting of the pursuers rose louder and louder as they neared her again she caught sight of the fugitives crossing the river below the cataract and again they were lost to sight and now the pursuers came into view shouting koryul lull warriors fierce and implacable forty perhaps fifty of them she waited breathless but they did not swerve from the trail and passed her unguessing that an enemy she lay hid within a few yards of them once again she caught sight of the pursued three wazdan warriors clambering the cliff face at a point where portions of the summit had fallen away presenting a steep slope that might be ascended by such as these suddenly her attention was riveted upon the three could it be oh jad ben otho had she but known a moment before when they passed she might have joined them for they were her father and two brothers now it was too late with bated breath and tense muscles she watched the race would they reach the summit would the coriol lull overhaul them they climbed well but oh so slowly now one lost his footing in the loose shale and slipped back the koryul lull were ascending one hurled his club at the nearest fugitive the great god was pleased with the brother of panatli for he caused the club to fall short of its target and to fall rolling and bounding back upon its owner carrying him from his feet and precipitating him to the bottom of the gorge standing now her hands pressed tight above her golden breastplates Panat Lee watched the race for life. Now one, her older brother, reached the summit, and clinging there to something that she could not see, he lowered his body and his long tail to the father beneath him. The latter, seizing this support, extended his own tail to the son below, the one who had slipped back, and thus, upon a living ladder of their own making, the three reached the summit, and disappeared from view before the Coryul lull overtook them. But the latter did not abandon the chase on they went until they too had disappeared from sight and only a faint shouting came down to panat lee to tell her that the pursuit continued the girl knew that she must move on at any moment now might come a hunting party combing the gorge for the smaller animals that fed or bedded there behind her were essat and the returning party of koryul lull that had pursued her kin before her across the next ridge was the koryul griff 
the lair of the terrifying monsters that brought the chill of fear to every inhabitant of pal yul -don. Below her in the valley was the country of the ho -don, where she could look for only slavery or death. Here were the Kor Yul Lul, the ancient enemies of her people, and everywhere were the wild beasts that eat the flesh of man. For but a moment she debated, and then turning her face toward the southeast, she set out across the gorge of water toward the Kor Yul Griff. At least there were no men there. As it is now, so it was in the beginning, back to the primitive progenitor of man, which is typified by Panat Lee and her kind today of all the hunters that woman fears man is the most relentless the most terrible to the dangers of man she preferred the dangers of the griff moving cautiously she reached the foot of the cliff at the far side of Coryul lull and here toward noon she found a comparatively easy ascent crossing the ridge she stood at last on the brink of Coryul griff the horror place of the folklore of her race dank and mysterious grew the vegetation below giant trees waved their plumed tops almost level with the summit of the cliff and over all brooded an ominous silence panat lee lay upon her belly and stretching over the edge scanned the cliff face below her she could see caves there and the stone pegs which the ancients had fashioned so laboriously by hand she had heard of these in the firelight tales of her childhood and of how the griffs had come from the morasses across the mountains and of how at last the people had fled after many had been seized and devoured by the hideous creatures leaving their caves untenanted for no man living knew how long some said that jad ban otho who has lived forever was still a little boy panat lee shuddered but there were caves and in them she would be safe even from the griffs she found a place where the stone pegs reached to the very summit of the cliff left there no doubt in the final exodus of the tribe when there was no longer need of safeguarding the deserted caves against invasion panat lee clambered slowly down toward the uppermost cave she found the recess in front of the doorway almost identical with those of her own tribe the floor of it though was littered with twigs and old nests and the droppings of birds until it was half choked she moved along to another recess and still another but all were alike in the accumulated filth evidently there was no need in looking further this one seemed large and commodious with her knife she fell to work cleaning away the debris by the simple expedient of pushing it over the edge and always her eyes turned constantly toward the silent gorge where lurked the fearsome creatures of pal yul -don. and other eyes were there eyes she did not see but that saw her and watched her every move fierce eyes greedy eyes cunning and cruel they watched her and a red tongue licked flabby pendulous lips they watched her and a half-human brain laboriously evolved a brutish design as in her own coriol jaw the natural springs in the cliff had been developed by the long dead builders of the caves so that fresh pure water trickled now as it had for ages within easy access to the cave entrances her only difficulty would be in procuring food and for that she must take the risk at least once in two days for she was sure that she could find fruits and tubers and perhaps small animals birds and eggs near the foot of the cliff the last two possibly in the caves themselves thus might she live on here indefinitely she felt now a certain sense of security imparted doubtless by the impregnability of her high-flung sanctuary that she knew to be safe from all the more dangerous beasts and this one from men too since it lay in the abjured coriol griff now she determined to inspect the interior of her new home the sun still in the south lighted the interior of the first apartment it was similar to those of her experience the same beasts and men were depicted in the same crude fashion in the carvings on the walls evidently there had been little progress in the race of wazdan during the generations that had come and departed since coryol griff had been abandoned by men of course panat lee thought no such thoughts for evolution and progress existed not for her or her kind things were as they had always been and would always be as they were that these strange creatures have existed thus for incalculable ages it can scarce be doubted so marked are the indications of antiquity about their dwellings 
deep furrows worn by naked feet in living rock the hollow in the jam of a stone doorway where many arms have touched in passing the endless carvings that cover oft times the entire face of a great cliff and all the walls and ceilings of every cave and each carving wrought by a different hand for each is the coat of arms one might say of the adult male who traced it and so pan at lee found this ancient cave homelike and familiar there was less litter within than she had found without and what there was was mostly an accumulation of dust beside the doorway was the niche in which wood and tinder were kept but there remained nothing now other than mere dust she had however saved a little pile of twigs from the debris on the porch in a short time she had made a light by firing a bundle of twigs and lighting others from this fire she explored some of the inner rooms nor here did she find aught that was new or strange or any relic of the departed owners other than a few broken stone dishes she had been looking for something soft to sleep upon but was doomed to disappointment as the former owners had evidently made a leisurely departure carrying all their belongings with them below in the gorge were leaves and grasses and fragrant branches but panat lee felt no stomach for descending into that horrid abyss for the gratification of mere creature comfort only the necessity for food would drive her there and so as the shadows lengthened and night approached she prepared to make as comfortable a bed as she could by gathering the dust of ages into a little pile and spreading it between her soft body and the hard floor at best it was only better than nothing but panat lee was very tired she had not slept since two nights before and in the interval she had experienced many dangers and hardships what wonder then that despite the hard bed she was asleep almost immediately she had composed herself for rest she slept and the moon rose casting its silver light upon the cliff's white face and lessening the gloom of the dark forest and the dismal gorge in the distance a lion roared there was a long silence from the upper reaches of the gorge came a deep bellow there was a movement in the trees at the cliff's foot again the bellow low and ominous it was answered from below the deserted village something dropped from the foliage of a tree directly below the cave in which panat lee slept it dropped to the ground among the dense shadows now it moved cautiously it moved toward the foot of the cliff taking form and shape in the moonlight it moved like the creature of a bad dream slowly sluggishly it might have been a huge sloth it might have been a man with so grotesque a brush does the moon paint master cubist slowly it moved up the face of the cliff like a great grub worm it moved but now the moon brush touched it again and it had hands and feet and with them it clung to the stone pegs and raised itself laboriously aloft toward the cave where panat lee slept from the lower reaches of the gorge came again the sound of bellowing and it was answered from above the village tarzan of the apes opened his eyes he was conscious of a pain in his head and at first that was about all a moment later grotesque shadows rising and falling focused his arousing perceptions presently he saw that he was in a cave a dozen wazdan warriors squatted about talking a rude stone cresset containing burning oil lighted the interior and as the flame rose and fell the exaggerated shadows of the warriors danced upon the walls behind them they brought him to you alive gund he heard one of them saying because never before was hodon like him seen he has no tail he was born without one for there is no scar to mark where a tail had been cut off the thumbs upon his hands and feet are unlike those of the races of Paluldon. he is more powerful than many men put together and he attacks with the fearlessness of jaw we brought him alive that you might see him before he is slain the chief rose and approached the ape-man who closed his eyes and feigned unconsciousness he felt hairy hands upon him as he was turned over none too gently the gund examined him from head to foot making comments especially upon the shape and size of his thumbs and great toes with these and no tail he said it cannot climb no agreed one of the warriors it would surely fall even from the cliff-pegs 
i have never seen a thing like it said the chief it is neither wazdan nor hodan i wonder from whence it came and what it is called the koryal jaw shouted aloud tarzan jad guru and we thought that they might be calling this one said a warrior shall we kill it now no replied the chief we will wait until its life returns into its head that i may question it remain here in tan and watch it when it can again hear and speak call me he turned and departed from the cave the others except in tan following him as they moved past him and out of the chamber tarzan caught snatches of their conversation which indicated that the koryal jaw reinforcements had fallen upon their little party in great numbers and driven them away evidently the swift feet of idan had saved the day for the warriors of omat the ape-man smiled then he partially opened an eye and cast it upon Intan. the warrior stood at the entrance to the cave looking out his back was toward his prisoner tarzan tested the bonds that secured his wrists they seemed none too stout and they had tied his hands in front of him evidence indeed that the wazdan took few prisoners if any cautiously he raised his wrists until he could examine the thongs that confined them a grim smile lighted his features instantly he was at work upon the bonds with his strong teeth but ever a wary eye was upon Intan, the warrior of kor lul the last knot had been loosened and tarzan's hands were free when Intan turned to cast an appraising eye upon his ward he saw that the prisoner's position was changed he no longer lay upon his back as they had left him but upon his side and his hands were drawn up against his face Intan came closer and bent down the bonds seemed very loose upon the prisoner's wrists he extended his hand to examine them with his fingers and instantly the two hands leaped from their bonds one to seize his own wrist the other his throat so unexpected the cat-like attack that Intan had not even time to cry out before steel fingers silenced him the creature pulled him suddenly forward so that he lost his balance and rolled over upon the prisoner and to the floor beyond to stop with tarzan upon his breast Intan struggled to release himself struggled to draw his knife but tarzan found it before him the wazdan's tail leaped to the other's throat encircling it he too could choke but his own knife in the hands of his antagonist severed the beloved member close to its root the wazdan's struggles became weaker a film was obscuring his vision he knew that he was dying and he was right a moment later he was dead tarzan rose to his feet and placed one foot upon the breast of his dead foe how the urge seized him to roar forth the victory cry of his kind but he dared not he discovered that they had not removed his rope from his shoulders and that they had replaced his knife in its sheath it had been in his hand when he was felled strange creatures he did not know that they held a superstitious fear of the weapons of a dead enemy believing that if buried without them he would forever haunt his slayers in search of them and that when he found them he would kill the man who killed him against the wall leaned his bow and quiver of arrows tarzan stepped toward the doorway of the cave and looked out night had just fallen he could hear voices from the nearer caves and there floated to his nostrils the odor of cooking food he looked down and experienced a sensation of relief the cave in which he had been held was in the lowest tier scarcely thirty feet from the base of the cliff he was about to chance an immediate descent when there occurred to him a thought that brought a grin to his savage lips a thought that was born of the name the wazdan had given him tarzan jad guru tarzan the terrible and a recollection of the days when he had delighted in baiting the blacks of the distant jungle of his birth he turned back into the cave where lay the dead body of Intan. with his knife he severed the warrior's head and carrying it to the outer edge of the recess tossed it to the ground below then he dropped swiftly and silently down the ladder of pegs in a way that would have surprised the koryal lull who had been so sure that he could not climb at the bottom he picked up the head of Intan and disappeared among the shadows of the trees carrying the grisly trophy by its shock of shaggy hair horrible but you are judging a wild beast by the standards of civilization you may teach a lion tricks but he is still a lion 
tarzan looked well in a tuxedo but he was still a tarmangani and beneath his pleated shirt beat a wild and savage heart nor was his madness lacking in method he knew that the hearts of the koryul lol would be filled with rage when they discovered the thing that he had done and he knew too that mixed with the rage would be a leaven of fear and it was fear of him that made tarzan master of many jungles one does not win the respect of the killers with bonbons below the village tarzan returned to the foot of the cliff searching for a point where he could make the ascent to the ridge and thus back to the village of omat the koryul jaw he came at last to a place where the river ran so close to the rocky wall that he was forced to swim it in search of a trail upon the opposite side and here it was that his keen nostrils detected a familiar spore it was the scent of panat lee at the spot where she had emerged from the pool and taken to the safety of the jungle immediately the ape-man's plans were changed panat lee lived or at least she had lived after the leap from the cliff's summit he had started in search of her for omat his friend and for omat he would continue upon the trail he had picked up thus fortuitously by accident it led him into the jungle and across the gorge and then to the point at which panat lee had commenced the ascent of the opposite cliffs here tarzan abandoned the head of inton tying it to the lower branch of a tree for he knew that it would handicap him in his ascent of the steep escarpment ape-like he ascended following easily the scent spore of panat lee over the summit and across the ridge the trail lay plain as a printed page to the delicate senses of the jungle-bred tracker tarzan knew naught of the koryul griff he had seen dimly in the shadows of the night strange monstrous forms and taden and omat had spoken of great creatures that all men feared but always everywhere by night and by day there were dangers from infancy death had stalked grim and terrible at his heels he knew little of any other existence to cope with danger was his life and he lived his life as simply and as naturally as you live yours amidst the dangers of the crowded city streets the black man who goes abroad in the jungle by night is afraid for he has spent his life since infancy surrounded by numbers of his own kind and safeguarded especially at night by such crude means as lie within his powers but tarzan had lived as the lion lives and the panther and the elephant and the ape a true jungle creature dependent solely upon his prowess and his wits playing a lone hand against creation therefore he was surprised at nothing and feared nothing and so he walked through the strange night as undisturbed and unapprehensive as the farmer to the cow lot in the darkness before the dawn once more panat lee's trail ended at the verge of a cliff but this time there was no indication that she had leaped over the edge and a moment's search revealed to tarzan the stone pegs upon which she had made her descent as he laid upon his belly leaning over the top of the cliff examining the pegs his attention was suddenly attracted by something at the foot of the cliff he could not distinguish its identity but he saw that it moved and presently that it was ascending slowly apparently by means of pegs similar to those directly below him he watched it intently as it rose higher and higher until he was able to distinguish its form more clearly with the result that he became convinced that it more nearly resembled some form of great ape than a lower order it had a tail though and in other respects it did not seem a true ape slowly it ascended to the upper tier of caves into one of which it disappeared then tarzan took up again the trail of panat lee he followed it down the stone pegs to the nearest cave and then further along the upper tier the ape-man raised his eyebrows when he saw the direction in which it led and quickened his pace he had almost reached the third cave when the echoes of koryul griff were awakened by a shrill scream of terror end of chapter five read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com chapter six the toro dawn panat lee slept the troubled sleep of physical and nervous exhaustion filled with weird dreamings she dreamed that she slept beneath a great tree in the bottom of the koryul griff 
and that one of the fearsome beasts was creeping upon her, but she could not open her eyes nor move. She tried to scream, but no sound issued from her lips. She felt the thing touch her throat, her breast, her arm, and there it closed and seemed to be dragging her toward it. With a superhuman effort of will she opened her eyes. In the instant she knew that she was dreaming, and that quickly the hallucination of the dream would fade. It had happened to her many times before, but it persisted. In the dim light that filtered into the dark chamber she saw a form beside her. She felt hairy fingers upon her and a hairy breast against which she was being drawn. Jad ben Otho! This was no dream! And then she screamed and tried to fight the thing from her. But her scream was answered by a low growl, and another hairy hand seized her by the hair of the head. The beast rose now upon its hind legs and dragged her from the cave to the moonlit recess without, and at the same instant she saw the figure of what she took to be a hodon rise above the outer edge of the niche. The beast that held her saw it too, and growled ominously, but it did not relinquish its hold upon her hair. It crouched as though waiting an attack, and it increased the volume and frequency of its growls until the horrid sounds reverberated through the gorge, drowning even the deep bellowings of the beasts below, whose mighty thunderings had broken out anew with the sudden commotion from the high-flung cave. The beast that held her crouched, and the creature that faced it crouched also, and growled as hideously as the other. Panat Lee trembled. This was no hodon, and though she feared the hodon, she feared this thing more, with its cat-like crouch and its beastly growls. She was lost, that Panat Lee knew. The two things might fight for her, but whichever one, she was lost. Perhaps during the battle, if it came to that, she might find the opportunity to throw herself over into the Coriol Griff. The thing that held her she had recognized now as a Torodon, but the other thing she could not place, though in the moonlight she could see it very distinctly. It had no tail. She could see its hands and its feet, and they were not the hands and feet of the races of Poluldon. It was slowly closing upon the Torodon, and in one hand it held a gleaming knife. Now it spoke, and to Panatli's terror was added an equal weight of consternation. "'When it leaves go of you,' it said, "'as it will presently to defend itself, run quickly behind me, Panatli, and go to the cave nearest the pegs you descended from the cliff-top. Watch from there. If I am defeated, you will have time to escape this slow thing. If I am not, I will come to you there. I am Omat's friend, and yours.' The last words took the keen edge from Panat Lee's terror, but she did not understand. How did this strange creature know her name? How did it know that she had descended the pegs by a certain cave? It must then have been here when she came. Panat Lee was puzzled. "'Who are you?' she asked. "'And from whence do you come?' "'I am Tarzan,' he replied. "'And just now I come from Omot, Gund, of Koryulja, in search of you.' Omat, gund of koryulja what wild talk was this she would have questioned him further but now he was approaching the torodon and the latter was screaming and growling so loudly as to drown the sound of her voice and then it did what the strange creature had said that it would do it released its hold upon her hair as it prepared to charge charge it did and in those close quarters there was no room to fence for openings Instantly the two beasts locked in deadly embrace, each seeking the other's throat. Punnett Lee watched, taking no advantage of the opportunity to escape which their preoccupation gave her. She watched and waited, for into her savage little brain had come the resolve to pin her faith to this strange creature who had unlocked her heart with those four words, I am Omot's friend. And so she waited with drawn knife the opportunity to do her bit in the vanquishing of the torodon that the newcomer could do it unaided she well knew to be beyond the realms of possibility for she knew well the prowess of the beast-like man with whom it fought there were not many of them in poluldon but what few there were were a terror to the women of the wazdan and the hodon for the old Torodon bulls roamed the mountains and the valleys of Paludon between rutting seasons, and woe betide the women who fell in their paths. With his tail the Torodon sought one of Tarzan's ankles, and finding it tripped him. 
the two fell heavily but so agile was the ape-man and so quick his powerful muscles that even in falling he twisted the beast beneath him so that tarzan fell on top and now the tail that had tripped him sought his throat as had the tail of intan the koryulo in the effort of turning his antagonist's body during the fall tarzan had had to relinquish his knife that he might seize the shaggy body with both hands and now the weapon lay out of reach at the very edge of the recess both hands were occupied for the moment in fending off the clutching fingers that sought to seize him and drag his throat within reach of his foe's formidable fangs and now the tail was seeking its deadly hold with a formidable persistence that would not be denied Panat Lee hovered about breathless her dagger ready but there was no opening that did not also endanger tarzan so constantly were the two duelists changing their positions tarzan felt the tail slowly but surely insinuating itself about his neck though he had drawn his head down between the muscles of his shoulders in an effort to protect this vulnerable part the battle seemed to be going against him for the giant beast against which he strove would have been a fair match in weight and strength for bolgani the gorilla and knowing this he suddenly exerted a single superhuman effort thrust far apart the giant hands and with the swiftness of a striking snake buried his fangs in the jugular of the torodon at the same instant the creature's tail coiled about his own throat and then commenced a battle royal of turning and twisting bodies as each sought to dislodge the fatal hold of the other but the acts of the ape-man were guided by a human brain and thus it was that the rolling bodies rolled in the direction that tarzan wished toward the edge of the recess the choking tail had shut the air from his lungs he knew that his gasping lips were parted and his tongue protruding and now his brain reeled and his sight grew dim but not before he reached his goal and a quick hand shot out to seize the knife that now lay within reach as the two bodies tottered perilously upon the brink of the chasm with all his remaining strength the ape-man drove home the blade once twice thrice and then all went black before him as he felt himself still in the clutches of the torridon topple from the recess fortunate it was for tarzan that panat lee had not obeyed his injunction to make good her escape while he engaged the torridon for it was to this fact that he owed his life close beside the struggling forms during the brief moments of the terrific climax she had realized every detail of the danger to tarzan with which the emergency was fraught and as she saw the two rolling over the outer edge of the niche she seized the ape-man by an ankle at the same time throwing herself prone upon the rocky floor the muscles of the torodon relaxed in death with the last thrust of tarzan's knife and with its hold upon the ape-man released it shot from sight into the gorge below it was with infinite difficulty that panat lee retained her hold upon the ankle of her protector but she did so and then slowly she sought to drag the dead weight back to the safety of the niche this however was beyond her strength and she could but hold on tightly hoping that some plan would suggest itself before her powers of endurance failed she wondered if after all the creature was already dead but that she could not bring herself to believe and if not dead how long it would be before he regained consciousness if he did not regain it soon he never would regain it that she knew for she felt her fingers numbing to the strain upon them and slipping slowly slowly from their hold it was then that tarzan regained consciousness he could not know what power upheld him but he felt that whatever it was was slowly releasing its hold upon his ankle within easy reach of his hands were two pegs and these he seized upon just as panat lee's fingers slipped from their hold as it was he came near to being precipitated into the gorge only his great strength saved him he was upright now and his feet found other pegs his first thought was of his foe where was he waiting above there to finish him tarzan looked up just as the frightened face of panat lee appeared over the threshold of the recess you live she cried yes replied tarzan where is the shaggy one panat lay pointed downward there she said dead good exclaimed the ape-man clambering to her side you are unharmed he asked you came just in time replied panat lee but who are you and how did you know that i was here and what do you know of om and where did you come from 
and what did you mean by calling omat gund wait wait cried tarzan one at a time my but you are all alike the shes of the tribe of kerchak the ladies of england and their sisters of poludon have patience and i will try to tell you all that you wish to know four of us set out with omat from koryul ja to search for you we were attacked by the koryul lull and separated i was taken prisoner but escaped again i stumbled upon your trail and followed it reaching the summit of this cliff just as the hairy one was climbing up after you i was coming to investigate when i heard your scream the rest you know but you called omat gund of koryul ja she insisted esat is gund esat is dead explained the ape-man omat slew him and now omat is gund omat came back seeking you he found esat in your cave and killed him yes said the girl esat came to my cave and i struck him down with my golden breastplates and escaped and a lion pursued you continued tarzan and you leaped from the cliff into kor ul lul but why you were not killed is beyond me is there anything beyond you exclaimed pan at lee how could you know that a lion pursued me and that i leaped from the cliff and not know that it was the pool of deep water below that saved me i would have known that too had not the kor ul lul come then and prevented me from continuing upon your trail but now i would ask you a question by what name do you call the thing with which i just fought it was a torodon she replied i have seen but one before they are terrible creatures with the cunning of a man and the ferocity of a beast great indeed must be the warrior who slays one single-handed she gazed at him in open admiration and now said tarzan you must sleep for to-morrow we shall return to kor ul ja and omat and i doubt that you have had much rest these two nights Panat Lee, lulled by a feeling of security, slept peacefully into the morning, while Tarzan stretched himself upon the hard floor of the recess just outside her cave. The sun was high in the heavens when he awoke. For two hours it had looked down upon another heroic figure miles away, the figure of a godlike man fighting his way through the hideous morass that lies like a filthy moat defending Pal Yul Don from the creatures of the outer world now waist deep in the sucking ooze now menaced by loathsome reptiles the man advanced only by virtue of herculean efforts gaining laboriously by inches along the devious way that he was forced to choose in selecting the least precarious footing near the centre of the morass was open water slimy green-hued water he reached it at last after more than two hours of such effort as would have left an ordinary man spent and dying in the sticky mud yet he was less than halfway across the marsh greasy with slime and mud was his smooth brown hide and greasy with slime and mud was his beloved enfield that had shone so brightly in the first rays of the rising sun he paused a moment upon the edge of the open water and then throwing himself forward struck out to swim across he swam with long easy powerful strokes calculated less for speed than for endurance for his was primarily a test of the latter since beyond the open water was another two hours or more of grueling effort between it and solid ground he was perhaps halfway across and congratulating himself upon the ease of the achievement of this portion of his task when there arose from the depths directly in his path a hideous reptile which with wide distended jaws bore down upon him hissing shrilly tarzan arose and stretched expanding his great chest and drank in deep draughts of the fresh morning air his clear eyes scanned the wondrous beauties of the landscape spread out before them directly below lay koryul griff a dense sombre green of gently moving treetops to tarzan it was neither grim nor forbidding it was jungle beloved jungle to his right there spread a panorama of the lower reaches of the valley of jad ben otho with its winding streams and its blue lakes gleaming whitely in the sunlight were scattered groups of dwellings the feudal strongholds of the lesser chiefs of the hodon allur the city of light he could not see as it was hidden by the shoulder of the cliff in which the deserted village lay 
for a moment tarzan gave himself over to that spiritual enjoyment of beauty that only the mankind may attain and then nature asserted herself and the belly of the beast called aloud that it was hungry again tarzan looked down at Coryo griff there was the jungle grew there a jungle that would not feed tarzan the ape-man smiled and commenced the descent to the gorge was there danger there of course who knew it better than tarzan in all jungles lies death for life and death go hand in hand and where life teems death reaps his fullest harvest never had tarzan met a creature of the jungle with which he could not cope sometimes by virtue of brute strength alone again by a combination of brute strength and the cunning of the mankind but tarzan had never met a griff he had heard the bellowings in the gorge the night before after he had lain down to sleep and he had meant to ask Panat lee this morning what manner of beast so disturbed the slumbers of its betters he reached the foot of the cliff and strode into the jungle and here he halted his keen eyes and ears watchful and alert his sensitive nostrils searching each shifting air current for the scent spore of game again he advanced deeper into the wood his light step giving forth no sound his bow and arrows in readiness a light morning breeze was blowing from up the gorge and in this direction he bent his steps many odors impinged upon his organs of scent some of these he classified without effort but others were strange the odors of beasts and birds of trees and shrubs and flowers with which he was unfamiliar he sensed faintly the reptilian odor that he had learned to connect with the strange nocturnal forms that had loomed dim and bulky on several occasions since his introduction to palul dawn and then suddenly he caught plainly the strong sweet odor of bara the deer were the belly vocal tarzans would have given a little cry of joy for it loved the flesh of bara the ape-man moved rapidly but cautiously forward the prey was not far distant and as the hunter approached it he took silently to the trees and still in his nostrils was the faint reptilian odor that spoke of a great creature which he had never yet seen except as a denser shadow among the dense shadows of the night but the odor was of such a faintness as suggests to the jungle bred the distance of absolute safety and now moving noiselessly tarzan came within sight of bara drinking at a pool where the stream that waters coriol griff crosses an open place in the jungle the deer was too far from the nearest tree to risk a charge so the ape-man must depend upon the accuracy and force of his first arrow which must drop the deer in its tracks or forfeit both deer and shaft far back came the right hand and the bow that you or i might not move bent easily beneath the muscles of the forest god there was a singing twang and bara leaping high in the air collapsed upon the ground an arrow through his heart tarzan dropped to earth and ran to his kill lest the animal might even yet rise and escape but bara was safely dead as tarzan stooped to lift it to his shoulder there fell upon his ears a thunderous bellow that seemed almost at his right elbow and as his eyes shot in the direction of the sound there broke upon his vision such a creature as paleontologists would have dreamed as having possibly existed in the dimmest vistas of earth's infancy a gigantic creature vibrant with mad rage that charged bellowing upon him when panat lee awoke she looked out upon the niche in search of tarzan he was not there she sprang to her feet and rushed out looking down into coriol griff guessing that he had gone down in search of food and there she caught a glimpse of him disappearing into the forest for an instant she was panic-stricken she knew that he was a stranger in palul dawn and that so he might not realize the dangers that lay in that gorge of terror why did she not call to him to return you or i might have done so but no palul don for they know the ways of the griff they know the weak eyes and the keen ears and that at the sound of a human voice they come to have called to tarzan then would have been to invite disaster and so she did not call instead afraid though she was she descended into the gorge for the purpose of overhauling tarzan and warning him in whispers of his danger it was a brave act since it was performed in the face of countless ages of inherited fear of the creatures that she might be called upon to face men have been decorated for less 
Panat Lee, descended from a long line of hunters, assumed that Tarzan would move up wind, and in this direction she sought his tracks, which she soon found well marked, since he had made no effort to conceal them. She moved rapidly until she reached the point at which Tarzan had taken to the trees. Of course she knew what had happened, since her own people were semi-arboreal, but she could not track him through the trees, having no such well-developed sense of scent as he. She could but hope that he had continued on upwind, and in this direction she moved, her heart pounding in terror against her ribs, her eyes glancing first in one direction and then another. She had reached the edge of a clearing when two things happened. She caught sight of Tarzan bending over a dead deer, and at the same instant a deafening roar sounded almost beside her. It terrified her beyond description, but it brought no paralysis of fear. Instead it galvanized her into instant action with the result that Panat Lee swarmed up the nearest tree to the very loftiest branch that would sustain her weight. Then she looked down. The thing that Tarzan saw charging him when the warning bellow attracted his surprised eyes loomed terrifically monstrous before him, monstrous and awe-inspiring. But it did not terrify Tarzan. It only angered him, for he saw that it was beyond even his powers to combat, and that meant that it might cause him to lose his kill, and Tarzan was hungry. There was but a single alternative to remaining for annihilation, and that was flight, swift and immediate. And Tarzan fled, but he carried the carcass of Bara the deer with him. He had not more than a dozen paces start, but on the other hand, the nearest tree was almost as close. His greatest danger lay, he imagined, in the great towering height of the creature pursuing him, for even though he reached the tree he would have to climb high in an incredibly short time as, unless appearances were deceiving, the thing could reach up and pluck him down from any branch under thirty feet above the ground, and possibly from those up to fifty feet if it reared up on its hind legs. But Tarzan was no sluggard, and though the griff was incredibly fast despite its great bulk, it was no match for Tarzan, and when it comes to climbing, the little monkeys gaze with envy upon the feats of the ape-man. And so it was that the bellowing griff came to a baffled stop at the foot of the tree, and even though he reared up and sought to seize his prey among the branches, as Tarzan had guessed he might, he failed in this also. And then, well out of reach, Tarzan came to a stop, and there, just above him, he saw Panat Lee sitting wide-eyed and trembling. "'How came you here?' he asked she told him you came to warn me he said it was very brave and unselfish of you i am chagrined that i should have been thus surprised the creature was upwind from me and yet i did not sense its near presence until it charged i cannot understand it it is not strange said Panat Lee. that is one of the peculiarities of the griff it is said that man never knows of its presence until it is upon him so silently does it move despite its great size but i should have smelled it cried tarzan disgustedly smelled it ejaculated panat lee smelled it certainly how do you suppose i found this deer so quickly and i sensed the griff too but faintly as at a great distance tarzan suddenly ceased speaking and looked down at the bellowing creature below them his nostrils quivered as though searching for a scent ah he exclaimed i have it what asked panat lee I was deceived because the creature gives off practically no odor, explained the ape-man. What I smelled was the faint aroma that doubtless permeates the entire jungle because of the long presence of many of the creatures. It is the sort of odor that would remain for a long time, faint as it is. Panat Lee, did you ever hear of a triceratops? No? Well, this thing that you call a griff is a triceratops, and it has been extinct for hundreds of thousands of years i have seen its skeleton in the museum of london and a figure of one restored i always thought that the scientists who did such work depended principally on an overwrought imagination but i see that i was wrong this living thing is not an exact counterpart of the restoration that i saw but it is so similar as to be easily recognizable and then too we must remember that during the ages that have elapsed since the paleontologist specimen lived many changes might have been wrought by evolution in the living line that has quite evidently persisted in Paleogon. triceratops london paleo i don't know what you are talking about cried panat lee tarzan smiled and threw a piece of dead wood at the face of the angry creature below them 
instantly the great bony hood over the neck was erected and a mad bellow rolled upward from the gigantic body full twenty feet at the shoulder the thing stood a dirty slate blue in color except for its yellow face with the blue bands encircling the eyes the red hood with the yellow lining and the yellow belly the three parallel lines of bony protuberances down the back gave a further touch of color to the body those following the line of the spine being red while those on either side are yellow the five and three toed hoofs of the ancient horned dinosaurs had become talons in the griff but the three horns two large ones above the eyes and a median horn on the nose had persisted through all the ages weird and terrible as was its appearance tarzan could not but admire the mighty creature looming big below him its seventy-five feet of length majestically typifying those things which all his life the ape-man had admired courage and strength in that massive tail alone was the strength of an elephant the wicked little eyes looked up at him and the horny beak opened to disclose a full set of powerful teeth herbivorous murmured the ape-man your ancestors may have been but not you and then to panatli let us go now at the cave we will have deer meat and then back to kor yul -ja and omat the girl shuddered go she repeated we will never go from here why not asked tarzan for answer she but pointed to the griff nonsense exclaimed the man it cannot climb we can reach the cliff through the trees and be back in the cave before it knows what has become of us you do not know the griff replied panatli gloomily wherever we go it will follow and always will be ready at the foot of each tree when we would descend it will never give us up we can live in trees for a long time if necessary replied tarzan and some time the thing will leave the girl shook her head never she said and then there are the torodon they will come and kill us and after eating a little we'll throw the balance to the griff the griff and the torodon are friends because the torodon shares his food with the griff you may be right said tarzan but even so i don't intend waiting here for someone to come along and eat part of me and then feed the balance to that beast below if i don't get out of this place whole it won't be my fault come along now and we'll make a try at it and so saying he moved off through the treetops with panat lee close behind below them on the ground moved the horned dinosaur and when they reached the edge of the forest where there lay fifty yards of open ground to cross to the foot of the cliff he was there with them at the bottom of the tree waiting tarzan looked ruefully down and scratched his head end of chapter six read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com chapter seven jungle craft presently he looked up at panat lee can you cross the gorge through the trees very rapidly he questioned alone she asked no replied tarzan i can follow wherever you lead she said then across and back again yes then come and do exactly as i bid he started back again through the trees swiftly swinging monkey-like from limb to limb following a zigzag course that he tried to select with an eye for the difficulties of the trail beneath where the underbrush was heaviest where fallen trees blocked the way he led the footsteps of the creature below them but all to no avail when they reached the opposite side of the gorge the griff was with them back again said tarzan and turning the two retraced their high-flung way through the upper terraces of the ancient forest of Coriol griff but the result was the same no not quite it was worse for another griff had joined the first and now two waited beneath the tree in which they stopped the cliff looming high above them with its innumerable cave mouths seemed to beckon and to taunt them it was so near yet eternity yawned between the body of the torodon lay at the cliff's foot where it had fallen it was in plain view of the two in the tree one of the griffs walked over and sniffed about it but did not offer to devour it tarzan had examined it casually as he had passed earlier in the morning he guessed that it represented either a very high order of ape or a very low order of man something akin to the java man perhaps 
a truer example of the pithecanthropi than either the hodon or the wasdon possibly the precursor of them both as his eyes wandered idly over the scene below his active brain was working out the details of the plan that he had made to permit panat lee's escape from the gorge his thoughts were interrupted by a strange cry from above them in the gorge wee oo wee oo it sounded coming closer the griffs below raised their heads and looked in the direction of the interruption one of them made a low rumbling sound in its throat it was not a bellow and it did not indicate anger immediately the wee oo responded the griffs repeated the rumbling and at intervals the wee oo was repeated coming ever closer tarzan looked at panat lee what is it he asked i do not know she replied perhaps a strange bird or another horrid beast that dwells in this frightful place ah exclaimed tarzan there it is look panat lee voiced a cry of despair a toro don the creature walking erect and carrying a stick in one hand advanced at a slow lumbering gait it walked directly toward the griffs who moved aside as though afraid tarzan watched intently the toro don was now quite close to one of the triceratops it swung its head and snapped at him viciously instantly the toro don sprang in and commenced to belabor the huge beast across the face with his stick to the ape-man's amazement the griff that might have annihilated the comparatively puny toro don instantly in any of a dozen ways cringed like a whipped cur Whee -oo! Whee -oo! shouted the toro don and the griff came slowly toward him a whack on the median horn brought it to a stop then the toro don walked around behind it clambered up its tail and seated himself astraddle of the huge back wee oo he shouted and prodded the beast with a sharp point of his stick the griff commenced to move off so rapt had tarzan been in the scene below him that he had given no thought to escape for he realized that for him and panat lee time had in these brief moments turned back countless ages to spread before their eyes a page of the dim and distant past they too had looked upon the first man and his primitive beasts of burden and now the ridden griff halted and looked up at them bellowing it was sufficient the creature had warned its master of their presence instantly the torodon urged the beast close beneath the tree which held them at the same time leaping to his feet upon the horny back tarzan saw the bestial face the great fangs the mighty muscles from the loins of such had sprung the human race and only from such could it have sprung for only such as this might have survived the horrid dangers of the age that was theirs the torodon beat upon his breast and growled horribly hideous uncouth beastly tarzan rose to his full height upon a swaying branch straight and beautiful as a demigod unspoiled by the taint of civilization a perfect specimen of what the human race might have been had the laws of man not interfered with the laws of nature the present fitted an arrow to his bow and drew the shaft far back the past basing its claims upon brute strength sought to reach the other and drag him down but the loosed arrow sank deep into the savage heart and the past sank back into the oblivion that had claimed his kind tarzan jad guru murmured panat lee unknowingly giving him out of the fullness of her admiration the same title that the warriors of her tribe had bestowed upon him the ape-man turned to her panat lee he said these beasts may keep us treed here indefinitely i doubt if we can escape together but i have a plan you remain here hiding yourself in the foliage while i start back across the gorge in sight of them and yelling to attract their attention unless they have more brains than i suspect they will follow me when they are gone you make for the cliff wait for me in the cave not longer than to-day if i do not come by to-morrow's sun you will have to start back to kor ul -ja alone here is a joint of deer meat for you he had severed one of the deer's hind legs and this he passed up to her i cannot desert you she said simply it is not the way of my people to desert a friend and an ally omat would never forgive me tell omat that i commanded you to go replied tarzan it is a command she asked it is good-bye panat lee hasten back to omat you are a fitting mate for the chief of kor ul -ja. he moved off slowly through the trees 
Goodbye, Tarzan, Jad Guru, she called after him. Fortunate are my Omat and his Panat Lee in owning such a friend. Tarzan, shouting aloud, continued upon his way, and the great griffs, lured by his voice, followed beneath. His ruse was evidently proving successful, and he was filled with elation as he led the bellowing beasts farther and farther from Panat Lee. He hoped that she would take advantage of the opportunity afforded for her escape, yet at the same time he was filled with concern as to her ability to survive the dangers which lay between Koryul Griff and Koryul Ja. There were lions and torodons and the unfriendly tribe of Koryul Lol to hinder her progress, though the distance in itself to the cliffs of her people was not great. He realized her bravery and understood the resourcefulness that she must share in common with all primitive people, who day by day must contend face to face with nature's law of the survival of the fittest, unaided by any of the numerous artificial protections that civilization has thrown around its brood of weaklings several times during this crossing of the gorge tarzan endeavored to outwit his keen pursuers but all to no avail double as he would he could not throw them off his track and ever as he changed his course they changed theirs to conform along the verge of the forest upon the southeastern side of the gorge he sought some point at which the trees touched some negotiable portion of the cliff but though he travelled far both up and down the gorge he discovered no such easy avenue of escape the ape-man finally commenced to entertain an idea of the hopelessness of his case and to realize to the full why the koryul griff had been religiously abjured by the races of paluldan for all these many ages night was falling and though since early morning he had sought diligently a way out of this cul-de-sac he was no nearer to liberty than at the moment the first bellowing griff had charged him as he stooped over the carcass of his kill but with the falling of night came renewed hope for in common with the great cats tarzan was to a greater or lesser extent a nocturnal beast it is true he could not see by night as well as they but that lack was largely recompensed for by the keenness of his scent and the highly developed sensitiveness of his other organs of perception as the blind follow and interpret their braille characters with deft fingers so tarzan reads the book of the jungle with feet and hands and eyes and ears and nose each contributing its share to the quick and accurate translation of the text but again he was doomed to be thwarted by one vital weakness he did not know the griff and before the night was over he wondered if the things never slept for wheresoever he moved they moved also and always they barred his road to liberty Finally, just before dawn, he relinquished his immediate effort and sought rest in a friendly tree crotch in the safety of the middle terrace. Once again was the sun high when Tarzan awoke, rested and refreshed. Keen to the necessities of the moment, he made no effort to locate his jailers, lest in the act he might apprise them of his movements. Instead, he sought cautiously and silently to melt away among the foliage of the trees his first move however was heralded by a deep bellow from below among the numerous refinements of civilization that tarzan had failed to acquire was that of profanity and possibly it is to be regretted since there are circumstances under which it is at least a relief to pent emotion and it may be that in effect tarzan resorted to profanity if there can be physical as well as vocal swearing since immediately the bellow announced that his hopes had been again frustrated he turned quickly and seeing the hideous face of the griff below him seized a large fruit from a nearby branch and hurled it viciously at the horned snout the missile struck full between the creature's eyes resulting in a reaction that surprised the ape-man it did not arouse the beast to a show of revengeful rage as tarzan had expected and hoped instead the creature gave a single vicious side snap at the fruit as it bounded from his skull and then turned sulkily away walking off a few steps there was that in the act that recalled immediately to tarzan's mind similar action on the preceding day when the torodon had struck one of the creatures across the face with his staff and instantly there sprung to the cunning and courageous brain a plan of escape from his predicament that might have blanched the cheek of the most heroic the gambling instinct is not strong among creatures of the wild the chances of their daily life are sufficient stimuli for the beneficial excitement of their nerve centers 
it has remained for civilized man protected in a measure from the natural dangers of existence to invent artificial stimulants in the form of cards and dice and roulette wheels yet when necessity bids there are no greater gamblers than the savage denizens of the jungle the forest and the hills for as lightly as you roll the ivory cubes upon the green cloth they will gamble with death their own lives the stake and so tarzan would gamble now pitting the seemingly wild deductions of his shrewd brain against all the proofs of the bestial ferocity of his antagonist that his experience of them had adduced against all the age-old folklore and legend that had been handed down for countless generations and passed on to him through the lips of panat lee yet as he worked in preparation for the greatest play that man can make in the game of life he smiled nor was there any indication of haste or excitement or nervousness in his demeanor first he selected a long straight branch about two inches in diameter at its base this he cut from the tree with his knife removed the smaller branches and twigs until he had fashioned a pole about ten feet in length this he sharpened at the smaller end the staff finished to his satisfaction he looked down upon the triceratops Whee -oo! he cried instantly the beasts raised their heads and looked at him from the throat of one of them came faintly a low rumbling sound Whee -oo! repeated tarzan and hurled the balance of the carcass of the deer to them instantly the gryfs fell upon it with much bellowing one of them attempting to seize it and keep it from the other but finally the second obtained a hold and an instant later it had been torn asunder and greedily devoured once again they looked up at the ape-man and this time they saw him descending to the ground one of them started toward him again tarzan repeated the weird cry of the torodon the griff halted in his track apparently puzzled while tarzan slipped lightly to the earth and advanced toward the nearer beast his staff raised menacingly and the call of the first man upon his lips would the cry be answered by the low rumbling of the beast of burden or the horrid bellow of the man-eater upon the answer to this question hung the fate of the ape-man panat lee was listening intently to the sounds of the departing griffs as tarzan led them cunningly from her and when she was sure that they were far enough away to ensure her safe retreat she dropped swiftly from the branches to the ground and sped like a frightened deer across the open space to the foot of the cliff stepped over the body of the torodon who had attacked her the night before and was soon climbing rapidly up the ancient stone pegs of the deserted cliff village in the mouth of the cave near that which she had occupied she kindled a fire and cooked the haunch of venison that tarzan had left her and from one of the trickling streams that ran down the face of the escarpment she obtained water to satisfy her thirst all day she waited hearing in the distance and sometimes close at hand the bellowing of the griffs which pursued the strange creature that had dropped so miraculously into her life for him she felt the same keen almost fanatical loyalty that many another had experienced for tarzan of the apes beast and human he had held them to him with bonds that were stronger than steel those of them that were clean and courageous and the weak and the helpless but never could tarzan claim among his admirers the coward the ingrate or the scoundrel from such both man and beast he had won fear and hatred to panat lee he was all that was brave and noble and heroic too he was omat's friend the friend of the man she loved for any one of these reasons panat lee would have died for tarzan for such is the loyalty of the simple-minded children of nature it has remained for civilization to teach us to weigh the relative rewards of loyalty and its antithesis the loyalty of the primitive is spontaneous unreasoning unselfish and such was the loyalty of panat lee for the tarmangani and so it was that she waited that day and night hoping that he would return that she might accompany him back to omat for her experience had taught her that in the face of danger two have a better chance than one but tarzan jad guru had not come and so upon the following morning panat lee set out upon her return to kor -yul -ja. she knew the dangers and yet she faced them with the stolid indifference of her race when they directly confronted and menaced her would be time enough to experience fear or excitement or confidence in the meantime it was unnecessary to waste nerve energy by anticipating them 
she moved therefore through her savage land with no greater show of concern than might mark your sauntering to a corner drug store for a sunday but this is your life and that is panat lee's and even now as you read this panat lee may be sitting upon the edge of the recess of omot's cave while the jaw and the jato roar from the gorge below and from the ridge above and the koryal lull threaten upon the south and the hodon from the valley of jad ban otho far below for panat lee still lives and preens her silky coat of jet beneath the tropical moonlight of pal yul -dan. but she was not to reach koryal jaw this day nor the next nor for many days after though the danger that threatened her was neither was don enemy nor savage beast she came without misadventure to the koryal lull and after descending its rocky southern wall without catching the slightest glimpse of the hereditary enemies of her people she experienced a renewal of confidence that was little short of practical assurance that she would successfully terminate her venture and be restored once more to her own people and the lover she had not seen for so many long and weary moons she was almost across the gorge now and moving with an extreme caution abated no whit by her confidence for wariness is an instinctive trait of the primitive something which cannot be laid aside even momentarily if one would survive and so she came to the trail that follows the windings of koryo lull from its uppermost reaches down into the broad and fertile valley of jad ben otho and as she stepped into the trail there arose on either side of her from out of the bushes that border the path as though materialized from thin air a score of tall white warriors of the hodon like a frightened deer panat lee cast a single startled look at these menacers of her freedom and leaped quickly toward the bushes in an effort to escape but the warriors were too close at hand they closed upon her from every side and then drawing her knife she turned at bay metamorphosed by the fires of fear and hate from a startled deer to a raging tiger cat they did not try to kill her but only to subdue and capture her and so it was that more than a single hodon warrior felt the keen edge of her blade in his flesh before they had succeeded in overpowering her by numbers and still she fought and scratched and bit after they had taken the knife from her until it was necessary to tie her hands and fasten a piece of wood between her teeth by means of thongs passed behind her head at first she refused to walk when they started off in the direction of the valley but after two of them had seized her by the hair and dragged her for a number of yards she thought better of her original decision and came along with them though still as defiant as her bound wrists and gagged mouth would permit near the entrance to kor yul lul they came upon another body of their warriors with which were several wazdan prisoners from the tribe of kor yul lul it was a raiding party come up from a hodan city of the valley after slaves this panat lee knew for the occurrence was by no means unusual during her lifetime the tribe to which she belonged had been sufficiently fortunate or powerful to withstand successfully the majority of such raids made upon them but yet panat lee had known of friends and relatives who had been carried into slavery by the hodan and she knew too another thing which gave her hope as doubtless it did to each of the other captives that occasionally the prisoners escaped from the cities of the hairless whites after they had joined the other party the entire band set forth into the valley and presently from the conversation of her captors panat lee knew that she was headed for alur the city of light while in the cave of his ancestors omat chief of the kor yul -ja, bemoaned the loss of both his friend and she that was to have been his mate end of chapter seven read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark dot blogspot dot com chapter eight a lure as the hissing reptile bore down upon the stranger swimming in the open water near the centre of the morass on the frontier of pal yul -dan, it seemed to the man that this indeed must be the futile termination of an arduous and danger-filled journey it seemed too equally futile to pit his puny knife against this frightful creature had he been attacked on land it is possible that he might as a last resort have used his enfield though he had come thus far through all these weary danger-ridden miles without recourse to it though again and again had his life hung in the balance in the face of the savage denizens of forest jungle and steppe 
for whatever it may have been for which he was preserving his precious ammunition he evidently held it more sacred even than his life for as yet he had not used a single round and now the decision was not required of him since it would have been impossible for him to have unslung his enfield loaded and fired with the necessary celerity while swimming though his chance for survival seemed slender and hope at its lowest ebb he was not minded therefore to give up without a struggle instead he drew his blade and awaited the oncoming reptile the creature was like no living thing he ever before had seen although possibly it resembled a crocodile in some respects more than it did anything with which he was familiar as this frightful survivor of some extinct progenitor charged upon him with distended jaws there came to the man quickly a full consciousness of the futility of endeavouring to stay the mad rush or pierce the armour-coated hide with his little knife the thing was almost upon him now and whatever form of defence he chose must be made quickly there seemed but a single alternative to instant death and this he took at almost the instant the great reptile towered directly above him with the celerity of a seal he dove head foremost beneath the oncoming body and at the same instant turning upon his back he plunged his blade into the soft cold surface of the slimy belly as the momentum of the hurtling reptile carried it swiftly over him and then with powerful strokes he swam on beneath the surface for a dozen yards before he rose a glance showed him the stricken monster plunging madly in pain and rage upon the surface of the water behind him that it was writhing in its death agonies was evidenced by the fact that it made no effort to pursue him and so to the accompaniment of the shrill screaming of the dying monster the man won at last to the farther edge of the open water to take up once more the almost superhuman effort of crossing the last stretch of clinging mud which separated him from the solid ground of palul don a good two hours it took him to drag his now weary body through the clinging stinking muck but at last mud covered and spent he dragged himself out upon the soft grasses of the bank a hundred yards away a stream winding its way down from the distant mountains emptied into the morass and after a short rest he made his way to this and seeking a quiet pool bathed himself and washed the mud and slime from his weapons accoutrements and loincloth another hour was spent beneath the rays of the hot sun in wiping polishing and oiling his enfield though the means at hand for drying it consisted principally of dry grasses it was afternoon before he had satisfied himself that his precious weapon was safe from any harm by dirt or dampness and then he arose and took up the search for the spoor he had followed to the opposite side of the swamp would he find again the trail that had led into the opposite side of the morass to be lost there even to his trained senses if he found it not again upon this side of the almost impassable barrier he might assume that his long journey had ended in failure and so he sought up and down the verge of the stagnant water for traces of an old spoor that would have been invisible to your eyes or mine even had we followed directly in the tracks of its maker as tarzan advanced upon the gryfs he imitated as closely as he could recall them the methods and mannerisms of the torodon but up to the instant that he stood close beside one of the huge creatures he realized that his fate still hung in the balance for the thing gave forth no sign either menacing or otherwise it only stood there watching him out of its cold reptilian eyes and then tarzan raised his staff and with a menacing whee -oo, struck the griff a vicious blow across the face the creature made a sudden side snap in his direction a snap that did not reach him and then turned sullenly away precisely as it had when the torodon commanded it walking around to its rear as he had seen the shaggy first man do tarzan ran up the broad tail and seated himself upon the creature's back and then again imitating the acts of the torodon he prodded it with the sharpened point of his staff and thus goading it forward and guiding it with blows first upon one side and then upon the other he started it down the gorge in the direction of the valley at first it had been in his mind only to determine if he could successfully assert any authority over the great monsters realizing that in this possibility lay his only hope of immediate escape from his jailers 
but once seated upon the back of his titanic mount the ape-man experienced the sensation of a new thrill that recalled to him the day in his boyhood that he had first clambered to the broad back of tantor the elephant and this together with the sense of mastery that was always meat and drink to the lord of the jungle decided him to put his newly acquired power to some utilitarian purpose panat lee he judged must either already have reached safety or met with death at least no longer could he be of service to her while below koryul griff in the soft green valley lay alur the city of light which since he had gazed upon it from the shoulder of pastar ul ved had been his ambition and his goal whether or not its gleaming walls held the secret of his lost mate he could not even guess but if she lived at all within the precincts of pal ul don it must be among the ho-don since the hairy black men of this forgotten world took no prisoners and so to allure he would go and how more effectively than upon the back of this grim and terrible creature that the races of pal ul don held in such awe a little mountain stream tumbles down from koryul griff to be joined in the foothills with that which empties the waters of koryul lul into the valley forming a small river which runs southwest eventually entering the valley's largest lake at the city of allur through the centre of which the stream passes an ancient trail well marked by countless generations of naked feet of man and beast leads down toward allur beside the river and along this tarzan guided the griff once clear of the forest which ran below the mouth of the gorge tarzan caught occasional glimpses of the city gleaming in the distance far below him the country through which he passed was resplendent with the riotous beauties of tropical verdure thick lush grasses grew waist-high upon either side of the trail and the way was broken now and again by patches of open park-like forest or perhaps a little patch of dense jungle where the trees overarched the way and trailing creepers depended in graceful loops from branch to branch at times the ape-man had difficulty in commanding obedience upon the part of his unruly beast but always in the end its fear of the relatively puny goad urged it on to obedience late in the afternoon as they approached the confluence of the stream they were skirting and another which appeared to come from the direction of koryul ja the ape-man emerging from one of the jungle patches discovered a considerable party of hodon upon the opposite bank simultaneously they saw him and the mighty creature he bestrode for a moment they stood in wide-eyed amazement and then in answer to the command of their leader they turned and bolted for the shelter of the nearby wood the ape-man had but a brief glimpse of them but it was sufficient indication that there were wasdon with them doubtless prisoners taken in one of the raids upon the wasdon villages of which ta den and omat had told him at the sound of their voices the griff had bellowed terrifically and started in pursuit even though a river intervened but by dint of much prodding and beating tarzan had succeeded in heading the animal back into the path though thereafter for a long time it was sullen and more intractable than ever as the sun dropped nearer the summit of the western hills tarzan became aware that his plan to enter a lure on the back of a griff was likely doomed to failure since the stubbornness of the great beast was increasing momentarily doubtless due to the fact that its huge belly was crying out for food the ape-man wondered if the torodons had any means of picketing their beasts for the night but as he did not know and as no plan suggested itself he determined that he should have to trust to the chance of finding it again in the morning there now arose in his mind a question as to what would be their relationship when tarzan had dismounted would it again revert to that of hunter and quarry or would fear of the goad continue to hold its supremacy over the natural instinct of the hunting flesh-eater tarzan wondered but as he could not remain upon the griff forever and as he preferred dismounting and putting the matter to a final test while it was still light he decided to act at once how to stop the creature he did not know as up to this time his sole desire had been to urge it forward by experimenting with his staff however he found that he could bring it to a halt by reaching forward and striking the thing upon its beak-like snout close by grew a number of leafy trees in any of which the ape-man could have found sanctuary but it had occurred to him that should he immediately take to the trees it might suggest to the mind of the griff that the creature that had been commanding him all day feared him 
with the result that tarzan would once again be held a prisoner by the triceratops and so when the griff halted tarzan slid to the ground struck the creature a careless blow across the flank as though in dismissal and walked indifferently away from the throat of the beast came a low rumbling sound and without even a glance at tarzan it turned and entered the river where it stood drinking for a long time convinced that the griff no longer constituted a menace to him the ape-man spurred on himself by the gnawing of hunger unslung his bow and selecting a handful of arrows set forth cautiously in search of food evidence of the near presence of which was being borne up to him by a breeze from down river ten minutes later he had made his kill again one of the poluldon specimens of antelope all species of which tarzan had known since childhood as bara the deer since in the little primer that had been the basis of his education the picture of a deer had been the nearest approach to the likeness of the antelope from the giant eland to the smaller bushbuck of the hunting grounds of his youth cutting off a haunch he cached it in a nearby tree and throwing the balance of the carcass across his shoulder trotted back toward the spot at which he had left the griff the great beast was just emerging from the river when tarzan seeing it issued the weird cry of the torodon the creature looked in the direction of the sound voicing at the same time the low rumble with which it answered the call of its master twice tarzan repeated his cry before the beast moved slowly toward him and when it had come within a few paces he tossed the carcass of the deer to it upon which it fell with greedy jaws if anything will keep it within call mused the ape-man as he returned to the tree in which he had cached his own portion of his kill it is the knowledge that i will feed it but as he finished his repast and settled himself comfortably for the night high among the swaying branches of his eyrie he had little confidence that he would ride into a lure the following day upon his prehistoric steed when tarzan awoke early the following morning he dropped lightly to the ground and made his way to the stream removing his weapons and loincloth he entered the cold waters of the little pool and after his refreshing bath returned to the tree for breakfast upon another portion of bara the deer adding to his repast some fruits and berries which grew in abundance near by his meal over he sought the ground again and raising his voice in the weird cry that he had learned he called aloud on the chance of attracting the griff but though he waited for some time and continued calling there was no response and he was finally forced to the conclusion that he had seen the last of his great mount of the preceding day and so he set his face toward allure pinning his faith upon his knowledge of the hodon tongue his great strength and his native wit refreshed by food and rest the journey toward allure made in the cool of the morning along the bank of the joyous river he found delightful in the extreme differentiating him from his fellows of the savage jungle were many characteristics other than those physical and mental not the least of these were in a measure spiritual and one that had doubtless been as strong as another in influencing tarzan's love of the jungle had been his appreciation of the beauties of nature the apes cared more for a grubworm in a rotten log than for all the majestic grandeur of the forest giants waving above them the only beauties that numa acknowledged were those of his own person as he paraded them before the admiring eyes of his mate but in all the manifestations of the creature power of nature of which tarzan was cognizant he appreciated the beauties as tarzan neared the city his interest became centered upon the architecture of the outlying buildings which were hewn from the chalk-like limestone of what had once been a group of low hills similar to many of the grass-covered hillocks that dotted the valley in every direction ta den's explanation of the hodon methods of house construction accounted for the oft-times remarkable shapes and proportions of the buildings which during the ages that must have been required for their construction had been hewn from the limestone hills the exteriors chiselled to such architectural forms as appealed to the eyes of the builders while at the same time following roughly the original outlines of the hills in an evident desire to economize both labor and space the excavation of the apartments within had been similarly governed by necessity as he came nearer tarzan saw that the waste material from these building operations had been utilized in the construction of outer walls about each building or group of buildings resulting from a single hillock 
and later he was to learn that it had also been used for the filling of inequalities between the hills and the forming of paved streets throughout the city the result possibly more of the adoption of an easy method of disposing of the quantities of broken limestone than by any real necessity for pavements there were people moving about within the city and upon the narrow ledges and terraces that broke the lines of the buildings and which seemed to be a peculiarity of hodon architecture a concession no doubt to some inherent instinct that might be traced back to their early cliff-dwelling progenitors tarzan was not surprised that at a short distance he aroused no suspicion or curiosity in the minds of those who saw him since until closer scrutiny was possible there was little to distinguish him from a native either in his general conformation or his color he had of course formulated a plan of action and having decided he did not hesitate in the carrying out his plan with the same assurance that you might venture upon the main street of a neighboring city tarzan strode into the hodon city of alur the first person to detect his spuriousness was a little child playing in the arched gateway of one of the walled buildings no tail no tail it shouted throwing a stone at him and then it suddenly grew dumb and its eyes wide as it sensed that this creature was something other than a mere hodon warrior who had lost his tail with a gasp the child turned and fled screaming into the courtyard of its home tarzan continued on his way fully realizing that the moment was imminent when the fate of his plan would be decided nor had he long to wait since the next turning of the winding street he came face to face with a hodon warrior he saw the sudden surprise in the latter's eyes followed instantly by one of suspicion but before the fellow could speak tarzan addressed him i am a stranger from another land he said i would speak with Kotan, your king the fellow stepped back laying his hand upon his knife there are no strangers that come to the gates of allure he said other than as enemies or slaves i come neither as a slave nor an enemy replied tarzan i come directly from jad ben otho look and he held out his hands that the hodan might see how greatly they differed from his own and then wheeled about that the other might see that he was tailless for it was upon this fact that his plan had been based due to his recollection of the quarrel between Taden and Omot, in which the Wazdan had claimed that Jad ben Otho had a long tail, while the Hodan had been equally willing to fight for his faith in the taillessness of his god. The warrior's eyes widened, and an expression of awe crept into them, though it was still tinged with suspicion. "'Jad ben Otho!' he murmured, and then, it is true that you are neither hodan nor wazdan and it is also true that jad ben otho has no tail come he said i will take you to kotan for this is a matter in which no common warrior may interfere follow me and still clutching the handle of his knife and keeping a wary side glance upon the ape-man he led the way through allure the city covered a large area sometimes there was a considerable distance between groups of buildings and again they were quite close together there were numerous imposing groups evidently hewn from the larger hills often rising to a height of a hundred feet or more as they advanced they met numerous warriors and women all of whom showed great curiosity in the stranger but there was no attempt to menace him when it was found that he was being conducted to the palace of the king they came at last to a great pile that sprawled over a considerable area its western front facing upon a large blue lake and evidently hewn from what had once been a natural cliff this group of buildings was surrounded by a wall of considerably greater height than any that tarzan had before seen his guide led him to a gateway before which waited a dozen or more warriors who had risen to their feet and formed a barrier across the entranceway as tarzan and his party appeared around the corner of the palace wall for by this time he had accumulated such a following of the curious as presented to the guards the appearance of a formidable mob the guide's story told tarzan was conducted into the courtyard where he was held while one of the warriors entered the palace evidently with the intention of notifying kotan fifteen minutes later a large warrior appeared followed by several others all of whom examined tarzan with every sign of curiosity as they approached the leader of the party halted before the ape-man who are you he asked and what do you want of kotan the king i am a friend replied the ape-man 
and I have come from the country of Jad ben Otho to visit Kotan of Pal Yul Don. The warrior and his followers seemed impressed. Tarzan could see the latter whispering among themselves. "'How came you here?' asked the spokesman. "'And what do you want of Kotan?' Tarzan drew himself to his full height. "'Enough!' he cried. "'Must the messenger of Jad ben Otho be subjected to the treatment that might be accorded to a wandering Wazdan? Take me to the king at once, lest the wrath of Jad ben Otho fall upon you.' There was some question in the mind of the ape-man as to how far he might carry his unwarranted show of assurance and he waited, therefore, with amused interest the result of his demand. He did not, however, have long to wait, for almost immediately the attitude of his questioner changed. He whitened, cast an apprehensive glance toward the eastern sky, and then extended his right palm toward Tarzan, placing his left over his own heart in the sign of amity that was common among the peoples of Pal Yul Don. Tarzan stepped quickly back as though from a profaning hand, a feigned expression of horror and disgust upon his face. Stop, he cried. Who would dare touch the sacred person of the messenger of Jad ben Otho? Only as a special mark of favor from Jad ben Otho may even Kotan himself receive this honor from me. Hasten! Already now have I waited too long. What manner of reception the Hodan of Allure would extend to the son of my father? At first Tarzan had been inclined to adopt the role of Jad ben Otho himself, but it occurred to him that it might prove embarrassing and considerable of a bore to be compelled constantly to portray the character of a god, but with the growing success of his scheme it had suddenly occurred to him that the authority of the son of Jad ben Otho would be far greater than that of an ordinary messenger of a god, while at the same time giving him some leeway in the matter of his acts and demeanor the ape-man reasoning that a young god would not be held so strictly accountable in the matter of his dignity and bearing as an older and greater god this time the effect of his words was immediately and painfully noticeable upon all those near him with one accord they shrank back the spokesman almost collapsing in evident terror his apologies when finally the paralysis of his fear would permit him to voice them were so abject that the ape-man could scarce repress a smile of amused contempt have mercy o dor yul otho he pleaded on poor old Daklat. precede me and i will show you to where kotan the king awaits you trembling aside snakes and vermin he cried pushing his warriors to right and left for the purpose of forming an avenue for tarzan come cried the ape-man peremptorily lead the way and let these others follow the now thoroughly frightened Daklat did as he was bid and tarzan of the apes was ushered into the palace of kotan the King of Paludon. End of chapter eight. Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com. Chapter nine. Blood stained altars. The entrance through which he caught his first glimpse of the interior was rather beautifully carved in geometric designs and within the walls were similarly treated though as he proceeded from one apartment to another he found also the figures of animals birds and men taking their places among the more formal figures of the mural decorator's art stone vessels were much in evidence as well as ornaments of gold and the skins of many animals but nowhere did he see an indication of any woven fabric indicating that in that respect at least the hodon were still low in the scale of evolution and yet the proportions and symmetry of the corridors and apartments bespoke a degree of civilization the way led through several apartments and long corridors up at least three flights of stone stairs and finally out upon a ledge upon the western side of the building overlooking the blue lake along this ledge or arcade his guide led him for a hundred yards to stop at last before a wide entranceway leading into another apartment of the palace here tarzan beheld a considerable concourse of warriors in an enormous apartment the domed ceiling of which was fully fifty feet above the floor almost filling the chamber was a great pyramid ascending in broad steps well up under the dome in which were a number of round apertures which let in the light the steps of the pyramid were occupied by warriors to the very pinnacle 
upon which sat a large imposing figure of a man whose golden trappings shone brightly in the light of the afternoon sun a shaft of which poured through one of the tiny apertures of the dome go tan cried dak lot addressing the resplendent figure at the pinnacle of the pyramid go tan and warriors of paluldan behold the honor that jad ben otho has done you in sending as his messenger his own son and dak lot stepping aside indicated tarzan with a dramatic sweep of his hand ko tan rose to his feet and every warrior within sight craned his neck to have a better view of the newcomer those upon the opposite side of the pyramid crowded to the front as the words of the old warrior reached them skeptical were the expressions on most of the faces but theirs was a skepticism marked with caution no matter which way fortune jumped they wished to be upon the right side of the fence for a moment all eyes were centered upon tarzan and then gradually they drifted to Kotan, for from his attitude would they receive the cue that would determine theirs but Kotan was evidently in the same quandary as they the very attitude of his body indicated it it was one of indecision and of doubt the ape-man stood erect his arms folded upon his broad chest an expression of haughty disdain upon his handsome face but to daklot there seemed to be indications also of growing anger the situation was becoming strained daklot fidgeted casting apprehensive glances at tarzan and appealing ones at kotan the silence of the tomb wrapped the great chamber of the throne room of pal yul -don. at last kotan spoke who says that he is dor yul -Otho? he asked casting a terrible look at dak -Lot. he does almost shouted the terrified noble and so it must be true queried ko -Tan. could it be that there was a trace of irony in the chief's tone otho forbid dak -Lot cast a side glance at tarzan a glance that he intended should carry the assurance of his own faith but that succeeded only in impressing the ape-man with the other's pitiable terror o ko -tan, pleaded dak -Lot, your own eyes must convince you that indeed he is the son of otho behold his godlike figure his hands and his feet that are not as ours and that he is entirely tailless as is his mighty father ko -tan appeared to be perceiving these facts for the first time and there was an indication that his skepticism was faltering at that moment a young warrior who had pushed his way forward from the opposite side of the pyramid to where he could obtain a good look at tarzan raised his voice Kotan, he cried it must be even as dak -Lot says for i am sure now that i have seen dor -Yul -Otho before yesterday as we were returning with the kor -Yul -Lo prisoners we beheld him seated upon the back of a great griff we hid in the woods before he came too near but i saw enough to make sure that he who rode upon the great beast was none other than the messenger who stands here now this evidence seemed to be quite enough to convince the majority of the warriors that they indeed stood in the presence of deity their faces showed it only too plainly and a sudden modesty that caused them to shrink behind their neighbors as their neighbors were attempting to do the same thing the result was a sudden melting away of those who stood nearest the ape-man until the steps of the pyramid directly before him lay vacant to the very apex and to Kotan. The latter, possibly influenced as much by the fearful attitude of his followers as by the evidence adduced, now altered his tone and his manner in such a degree as might comport with the requirements if the stranger was indeed the Dor -Yul -Otho, while leaving his dignity a loophole of escape should it appear that he had entertained an impostor. If indeed you are the Dor -Yul -Otho, he said addressing tarzan you will know that our doubts were but natural since we have received no sign from jad ben otho that he intended honoring us so greatly nor how could we know even that the great god had a son if you are he all pal yul -Don rejoices to honor you if you are not he swift and terrible shall be the punishment of your temerity i kotan king of pal yul -Don, have spoken and spoken well as a king should speak said tarzan breaking his long silence who fears and honors the god of his people it is well that you insist that i indeed be the dor -Yul otho before you accord me the homage that is my due jad ben otho charged me specially to ascertain if you were fit to rule his people 
my first experience of you indicates that jad ben otho chose well when he breathed the spirit of a king into the babe at your mother's breast the effect of this statement made so casually was marked in the expressions and excited whispers of the now awestruck assemblage at last they knew how kings were made it was decided by jad ben otho while the candidate was still a suckling babe wonderful a miracle and this divine creature in whose presence they stood knew all about it doubtless he even discussed such matters with their god daily if there had been an atheist among them before or an agnostic there was none now for had they not looked with their own eyes upon the son of god it is well then continued the ape-man that you should assure yourself that i am no impostor come closer that you may see that i am not as are men furthermore it is not meet that you stand upon a higher level than the son of your god there was a sudden scramble to reach the floor of the throne room nor was Kotan far behind his warriors though he managed to maintain a certain majestic dignity as he descended the broad stairs that countless naked feet had polished to a gleaming smoothness through the ages and now said tarzan as the king stood before him you can have no doubt that i am not of the same race as you your priests have told you that jad ben otho is tailless tailless therefore must be the race of gods that spring from his loins but enough of such proofs as these you know the power of jad ben otho how his lightnings gleaming out of the sky carry death as he wills it how the rains come at his bidding and the fruits and the berries and the grains the grasses the trees and the flowers spring to life at his divine direction you have witnessed birth and death and those who honor their god honor him because he controls these things how would it fare then with an impostor who claimed to be the son of this all-powerful god this then is all the proof that you require for as he would strike you down should you deny me so would he strike down one who wrongfully claimed kinship with him this line of argument being unanswerable must needs be convincing there could be no questioning of this creature's statements without the tacit admission of lack of faith in the omnipotence of jad ben otho kotan was satisfied that he was entertaining deity but as to just what form his entertainment should take he was rather at a loss to know his conception of god had been rather a vague and hazy affair though in common with all primitive people his god was a personal one as were his devils and demons the pleasures of jad ben otho he had assumed to be the excesses which he himself enjoyed but devoid of any unpleasant reaction it therefore occurred to him that the dor ul otho would be greatly entertained by eating eating large quantities of everything that kotan liked best and that he had found most injurious and there was also a drink that the women of the hodan made by allowing corn to soak in the juices of succulent fruits to which they had added certain other ingredients best known to themselves kotan knew by experience that a single draught of this potent liquor would bring happiness and surcease from worry while several would cause even a king to do things and enjoy things that he would never even think of doing or enjoying while not under the magical influence of the potion but unfortunately the next morning brought suffering in direct ratio to the joy of the preceding day a god kotan reasoned could experience all the pleasure without the headache but for the immediate present he must think of the necessary dignities and honors to be accorded to his immortal guest no foot other than a king's had touched the surface of the apex of the pyramid in the throne room at alur during all the forgotten ages through which the kings of Paluldan had ruled from its high eminence so what higher honor could kotan offer than to give place beside him to the dor ul otho and so he invited tarzan to ascend the pyramid and take his place upon the stone bench that topped it as they reached the step below the sacred pinnacle kotan continued as though to mount to his throne but tarzan laid a detaining hand upon his arm none may sit upon a level with the gods he admonished stepping confidently up and seating himself upon the throne the abashed kotan showed his embarrassment an embarrassment he feared to voice lest he incur the wrath of the king of kings but added tarzan a god may honor his faithful servant by inviting him to a place at his side come kotan thus would i honor you in the name of jad ben otho 
the ape-man's policy had for its basis an attempt not only to arouse the fearful respect of Kotan, but to do it without making of him an enemy at heart for he did not know how strong a hold the religion of the hodon had upon them for since the time that he had prevented ta den and om at from quarrelling over a religious difference the subject had been utterly taboo among them he was therefore quick to note the evident though wordless resentment of ko tan at the suggestion that he entirely relinquish his throne to his guest on the whole however the effect had been satisfactory as he could see from the renewed evidence of awe upon the faces of the soldiers at tarzan's direction the business of the court continued where it had been interrupted by his advent it consisted principally in the settling of disputes between warriors there was present one who stood upon the step just below the throne and which tarzan was to learn was the place reserved for the higher chiefs of the allied tribes which made up Kotan's kingdom the one who attracted tarzan's attention was a stalwart warrior of powerful physique and massive lion-like features he was addressing Kotan on a question that is as old as government and that will continue in unabated importance until man ceases to exist it had to do with a boundary dispute with one of his neighbors the matter itself held little or no interest for tarzan but he was impressed by the appearance of the speaker and when Kotan addressed him as jadon the ape-man's interest was permanently crystallized for jadon was the father of tadan that the knowledge could benefit him in any way seemed rather a remote possibility since he could not reveal to jadon his friendly relations with his son without admitting the falsity of his claims to godship when the affairs of the audience were concluded Kotan suggested that the son of jad ben otho might wish to visit the temple in which were performed the religious rites coincident to the worship of the great god and so the ape-man was conducted by the king himself followed by the warriors of his court through the corridors of the palace toward the northern end of the group of buildings within the royal enclosure the temple itself was really a part of the palace and similar in architecture there were several ceremonial places of varying sizes the purposes of which tarzan could only conjecture each had an altar in the west end and another in the east and were oval in shape their longest diameter lying due east and west each was excavated from the summit of a small hillock and all were without roofs the western altars invariably were a single block of stone the top of which was hollowed into an oblong basin those at the eastern ends were similar blocks of stone with flat tops and these latter unlike those at the opposite ends of the ovals were invariably stained or painted a reddish brown nor did tarzan need to examine them closely to be assured of what his keen nostrils already had told him that the brown stains were dried and drying human blood below these temple courts were corridors and apartments reaching far into the bowels of the hills dim gloomy passages that tarzan glimpsed as he was led from place to place on his tour of inspection of the temple a messenger had been dispatched by Kotan to announce the coming visit of the son of jad ben otho with the result that they were accompanied through the temple by a considerable procession of priests whose distinguishing mark of profession seemed to consist in grotesque headdresses sometimes hideous faces carved from wood and entirely concealing the countenances of their wearers or again the head of a wild beast cunningly fitted over the head of a man the high priest alone wore no such headdress he was an old man with close-set cunning eyes and a cruel thin-lipped mouth at the first sight of him tarzan realized that here lay the greatest danger to his ruse for he saw at a glance that the man was antagonistic toward him and his pretensions and he knew too that doubtless of all the people of pal ul don the high priest was most likely to harbor the truest estimate of jad ben otho and therefore would look with suspicion on one who claimed to be the son of a fabulous god no matter what suspicion lurked within his crafty mind lu don the high priest of allure did not openly question tarzan's right to the title of dor ul otho and it may be that he was restrained by the same doubts which had originally restrained Kotan and his warriors the doubt that is at the bottom of the minds of all blasphemers even and which is based upon the fear that after all there may be a god so for the time being at least ludon played safe 
yet tarzan knew as well as though the man had spoken aloud his inmost thoughts that it was in the heart of the high priest to tear the veil from his imposture at the entrance to the temple ko -tan had relinquished the guidance of the guest to lu don and now the latter led tarzan through those portions of the temple that he wished him to see he showed him the great room where the votive offerings were kept gifts from the barbaric chiefs of pal ul don and from their followers these things ranged in value from presents of dried fruits to massive vessels of beaten gold so that in the great main storeroom and its connecting chambers and corridors was an accumulation of wealth that amazed even the eyes of the owner of the secret of the treasure vaults of opar moving to and fro throughout the temple were sleek black wazdan slaves fruits of the hodan raids upon the villages of their less civilized neighbors as they passed the barred entrance to a dim corridor tarzan saw within a great company of pithecanthropi of all ages and of both sexes hodan as well as wazdan the majority of them squatted upon the stone floor in attitudes of utter dejection while some paced back and forth their features stamped with the despair of utter hopelessness and who are these who lie here thus unhappily he asked of ludon it was the first question that he had put to the high priest since entering the temple and instantly he regretted that he had asked it for ludon turned upon him a face upon which the expression of suspicion was but thinly veiled who would know better than the son of jad ben otho he retorted the questions of dor ul otho are not with impunity answered with other questions said the ape-man quietly and it may interest ludon the high priest to know that the blood of a false priest upon the altar of his temple is not displeasing in the eyes of jad ben otho ludon paled as he answered tarzan's question they are the offerings whose blood must refresh the eastern altars as the sun returns to your father at the day's end and who told you asked tarzan that jad ben otho was pleased that his people were slain upon his altars what if you were mistaken then countless thousands have died in vain replied ludon Kotan and the surrounding warriors and priests were listening attentively to the dialogue some of the poor victims behind the barred gateway had heard and rising pressed close to the barrier through which one was conducted just before sunset each day never to return liberate them cried tarzan with a wave of his hand toward the imprisoned victims of a cruel superstition for i can tell you in the name of jad ben otho that you are mistaken end of chapter nine read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com chapter ten the forbidden garden ludon paled it is sacrilege he cried for countless ages have the priests of the great god offered each night a life to the spirit of jad ben otho as it returned below the western horizon to its master and never has the great god given sign that he was displeased stop commanded tarzan it is the blindness of the priesthood that has failed to read the messages of their god your warriors die beneath the knives and clubs of the wazdan your hunters are taken by jaw and jato no day goes by but witnesses the deaths of few or many in the villages of the hodan and one death each day of those that die are the toll which jad ben otho has exacted for the lives you take upon the eastern altar what greater sign of his displeasure could you require o stupid priest ludon was silent there was raging within him a great conflict between his fear that this indeed might be the son of god and his hope that it was not but at last his fear won and he bowed his head the son of jad ben otho has spoken he said and turning to one of the lesser priests remove the bars and return these people from whence they came he thus addressed did as he was bid and as the bars came down the prisoners now all fully aware of the miracle that had saved them crowded forward and throwing themselves upon their knees before tarzan raised their voices in thanksgiving Kotan was almost as staggered as the high priest by this ruthless overturning of an age-old religious rite. "'But what,' he cried, "'may we do that will be pleasing in the eyes of Jad ben Otho?' turning a look of puzzled apprehension toward the ape-man. 
if you seek to please your god he replied place upon your altars such gifts of food and apparel as are most welcome in the city of your people these things will jad ben otho bless when you may distribute them among those of the city who need them most with such things are your storerooms filled as i have seen with mine own eyes and other gifts will be brought when the priests tell the people that in this way they find favor before their god and tarzan turned and signified that he would leave the temple as they were leaving the precincts devoted to the worship of their deity the ape-man noticed a small but rather ornate building that stood entirely detached from the others as though it had been cut from a little pinnacle of limestone which had stood out from its fellows as his interested glance passed over it he noticed that its door and windows were barred to what purpose is that building dedicated he asked of ludon who do you keep imprisoned there it is nothing replied the high priest nervously there is no one there the place is vacant once it was used but not now for many years and he moved on toward the gateway which led back into the palace here he and the priests halted while tarzan with Kotan and his warriors passed out from the sacred precincts of the temple grounds the one question which tarzan would have asked he had feared to ask for he knew that in the hearts of many lay a suspicion as to his genuineness but he determined that before he slept he would put the question to Kotan either directly or indirectly as to whether there was or had been recently within the city of alur a female of the same race as his as their evening meal was being served to them in the banquet hall of Kotan's palace by a part of the army of black slaves upon whose shoulders fell the burden of all the heavy and menial tasks of the city tarzan noticed that there came to the eyes of one of the slaves what was apparently an expression of startled recognition as he looked upon the ape-man for the first time in the banquet hall of Kotan, and again later he saw the fellow whisper to another slave and nod his head in his direction the ape-man did not recall ever having seen this was done before and he was at a loss to account for an explanation of the fellow's interest in him and presently the incident was all but forgotten Kotan was surprised and inwardly disgusted to discover that his godly guest had no desire to gorge himself upon rich foods and that he would not even so much as taste the villainous brew of the hodon to tarzan the banquet was a dismal and tiresome affair since so great was the interest of the guests in gorging themselves with food and drink that they had no time for conversation the only vocal sounds being confined to a continuous grunting which together with their table manners reminded tarzan of a visit he had once made to the famous berkshire herd of his grace the duke of westminster at woodhouse chester one by one the diners succumbed to the stupefying effects of the liquor with the result that the grunting gave place to snores so presently tarzan and the slaves were the only conscious creatures in the banquet hall rising the ape-man turned to a tall black who stood behind him i would sleep he said show me to my apartment as the fellow conducted him from the chamber the slave who had shown surprise earlier in the evening at sight of him spoke again at length to one of his fellows the latter cast a half frightened look in the direction of the departing ape-man if you are right he said they should reward us with our liberty but if you are wrong o oh, jad ben otho what will be our fate but i am not wrong cried the other then there is but one to tell this to for i have heard that he looked sour when this doryul otho was brought to the temple and that while the so-called son of jad ben otho was there he gave this one every cause to fear and hate him i mean ludon the high priest you know him asked the other slave i have worked in the temple replied his companion then go to him at once and tell him but be sure to exact the promise of our freedom for the proof and so a black wazdan came to the temple gate and asked to see ludon the high priest on a matter of great importance and though the hour was late ludon saw him and when he had heard his story he promised him and his friend not only their freedom but many gifts if they could prove the correctness of their claims and as the slave talked with the high priest in the temple at alur the figure of a man groped its way around the shoulder of pastur al ved 
and the moonlight glistened from the shiny barrel of an enfield that was strapped to the naked back and brass cartridges shed tiny rays of reflected light from their polished cases where they hung in the bandoliers across the broad brown shoulders and the lean waist tarzan's guide conducted him to a chamber overlooking the blue lake where he found a bed similar to that which he had seen in the villages of the wazdan merely a raised dais of stone upon which was piled great quantities of furry pelts and so he lay down to sleep the question that he most wished to put still unasked and unanswered with the coming of a new day he was awake and wandering about the palace and the palace grounds before there was sign of any of the inmates of the palace other than slaves or at least he saw no others at first though presently he stumbled upon an enclosure which lay almost within the centre of the palace grounds surrounded by a wall that piqued the ape-man's curiosity since he had determined to investigate as fully as possible every part of the palace and its environs this place whatever it might be was apparently without doors or windows but that it was at least partially roofless was evidenced by the sight of the waving branches of a tree which spread above the top of the wall near him finding no other method of access the ape-man uncoiled his rope and throwing it over the branch of the tree where it projected beyond the wall was soon climbing with the ease of a monkey to the summit there he found that the wall surrounded an enclosed garden in which grew trees and shrubs and flowers in riotous profusion without waiting to ascertain whether the garden was empty or contained hodon wazdan or wild beasts tarzan dropped lightly to the sward on the inside and without further loss of time commenced a systematic investigation of the enclosure his curiosity was aroused by the very evident fact that the place was not for general use even by those who had free access to other parts of the palace grounds and so there was added to its natural beauties an absence of mortals which rendered its exploration all the more alluring to tarzan since it suggested that in such a place might he hope to come upon the object of his long and difficult search in the garden were tiny artificial streams and little pools of water flanked by flowering bushes as though it had all been designed by the cunning hand of some master gardener so faithfully did it carry out the beauties and contours of nature upon a miniature scale the interior surface of the wall was fashioned to represent the white cliffs of poluldon broken occasionally by small replicas of the verdure filled gorges of the original filled with admiration and thoroughly enjoying each new surprise which the scene offered tarzan moved slowly around the garden and as always he moved silently passing through a miniature forest he came presently upon a tiny area of flower-studded sward and at the same time beheld before him the first hodon female he had seen since entering the palace a young and beautiful woman stood in the centre of the little open space stroking the head of a bird which she held against her golden breastplate with one hand her profile was presented to the ape-man and he saw that by the standards of any land she would have been accounted more than lovely seated in the grass at her feet with her back toward him was a female wazdan slave seeing that she he sought was not there and apprehensive that an alarm be raised were he discovered by the two women tarzan moved back to hide himself in the foliage but before he had succeeded the hodan girl turned quickly toward him as though apprised of his presence by that unnamed sense the manifestations of which are more or less familiar to us all at the sight of him her eyes registered only her surprise though there was no expression of terror reflected in them nor did she scream or even raise her well-modulated voice as she addressed him who are you she asked who enters thus boldly the forbidden garden at sound of her mistress voice the slave maiden turned quickly rising to her feet tarzan jad garu she exclaimed in tones of mingled astonishment and relief you know him cried her mistress turning toward the slave and affording tarzan an opportunity to raise a cautioning finger to his lips lest panat lee further betray him for it was panat lee indeed who stood before him no less a source of surprise to him than had his presence been to her thus questioned by her mistress and simultaneously admonished to silence by tarzan panat lee was momentarily silenced and then haltingly she groped for a way to extricate herself from her dilemma i thought she faltered but no i am mistaken i thought that he was one whom i had seen before near the coriol griff the hodon looked first at one and then the other an expression of doubt and questioning in her eyes but you have not answered me 
she answered presently who are you you have not heard then asked tarzan of the visitor who arrived at your king's court yesterday you mean she exclaimed that you are the dor Otho? and now the erstwhile doubting eyes reflected naught but awe i am he replied tarzan and you i am olo a daughter of Kotan the king she replied so this was olo a for love of whom ta den had chosen exile rather than priesthood tarzan had approached more closely the dainty barbarian princess daughter of Kotan, he said jad ben otho is pleased with you and as a mark of his favor he has preserved for you through many dangers him whom you love i do not understand replied the girl but the flush that mounted to her cheek belied her words Bulat is a guest in the palace of Kotan, my father. I do not know that he has faced any danger, but it is to Bulat that I am betrothed. But it is not Bulat whom you love, said Tarzan. Again the flush, and the girl half turned her face away. Have I then displeased the great god? she asked. No, replied Tarzan. As I told you, he is well satisfied, and for your sake he has saved Taden for you. Jadman Otho knows all, whispered the girl and his son shares his great knowledge no tarzan hastened to correct her lest a reputation for omniscience might prove embarrassing i know only what jad ben otho wishes me to know but tell me she said i shall be reunited with ta den surely the son of god can read the future the ape-man was glad that he had left himself an avenue of escape i know nothing of the future he replied other than what jad ben otho tells me but I think you need have no fear for the future if you remain faithful to Ta Den and Ta Den's friends. You have seen him? asked Oloa. Tell me, where is he? Yes, replied Tarzan, I have seen him. He was with Omat, the gund of Koryul Ja. A prisoner of the Wazdan? interrupted the girl. Not a prisoner, but an honored guest, replied the ape man. Wait, he exclaimed, raising his face toward the heavens. Do not speak i am receiving a message from jad ben otho my father the two women dropped to their knees covering their faces with their hands stricken with awe at the thought of the awful nearness of the great god presently tarzan touched olo a on the shoulder rise he said jad ben otho has spoken he has told me that this slave girl is from the tribe of kuryul ja where taden is and that she is betrothed to omat their chief her name is panat lee Olo a turned questioningly toward panat lee the latter nodded her simple mind unable to determine whether or not she and her mistress were the victims of a colossal hoax it is even as he says she whispered Olo a fell upon her knees and touched her forehead to tarzan's feet great is the honor that jad ben otho has done his poor servant she cried carry to him my poor thanks for the happiness that he has brought to Olo a it would please my father said tarzan if you were to cause panat lee to be returned in safety to the village of her people what cares jad ben otho for such as she asked olo a a slight trace of hauteur in her tone there is but one god replied tarzan and he is the god of the wazdan as well as of the hodan of the birds and the beasts and the flowers and of everything that grows upon the earth or beneath the waters if panat lee does right she is greater in the eyes of jad ben otho than would be the daughter of Kotan, should she do wrong it was evident that olo a did not quite understand this interpretation of divine favor so contrary was it to the teachings of the priesthood of her people in one respect only did tarzan's teachings coincide with her belief that there was but one god for the rest she had always been taught that he was solely the god of the hodan in every sense other than that the other creatures were created by jad ben otho to serve some useful purpose for the benefit of the hodan race and now to be told by the son of god that she stood no higher in divine esteem than the black handmaiden at her side was indeed a shock to her pride her vanity and her faith but who could question the word of dor Yul otho especially when she had with her own eyes seen him in actual communion with god in heaven the will of jad ben otho be done said olo a meekly if it lies within my power but it would be best o dor Yul otho to communicate your father's wish directly to the king then keep her with you said tarzan and see that no harm befalls her olo a looked ruefully at panat lee 
she was brought to me but yesterday she said and never have i had slave woman who pleased me better i shall hate to part with her but there are others said tarzan yes replied o lo a there are others but there is only one pan at lee many slaves are brought to the city asked tarzan yes she replied and many strangers come from other lands he asked she shook her head negatively only the hodan from the other side of the valley of jad ben otho she replied and they are not strangers am i then the first stranger to enter the gates of allure he asked can it be she parried that the son of jad ben otho need question a poor ignorant mortal like o lo a as i told you before replied tarzan jad ben otho alone is all-knowing then if he wished you to know this thing retorted o lo a quickly you would know it inwardly the ape-man smiled that this little heathen's astuteness should beat him at his own game yet in a measure her evasion of the question might be an answer to it there have been other strangers here recently he persisted i cannot tell you what i do not know she replied always is the palace of khotan filled with rumours but how much facts and how much fancy how may a woman of the palace know there has been such a rumour then he asked it was only a rumour that reached the forbidden garden she replied it described perhaps a woman of another race as he put the question and awaited her answer he thought that his heart ceased to beat so grave to him was the issue at stake the girl hesitated before replying and then no she said i cannot speak of this thing for if it be of sufficient importance to elicit the interest of the gods then indeed would i be subject to the wrath of my father should i discuss it in the name of jad ben otho i command you to speak said tarzan in the name of jad ben otho in whose hands lies the fate of ta den the girl paled have mercy she cried and for the sake of ta den i will tell you all that i know tell what demanded a stern voice from the shrubbery behind them the three turned to see the figure of Kotan emerging from the foliage. An angry scowl distorted his kingly features, but at sight of Tarzan it gave place to an expression of surprise, not unmixed with fear. "'Dor Otho! he exclaimed. "'I did not know that it was you!' And then, raising his head and squaring his shoulders, he said, "'But there are places where even the son of the great god may not walk, and this, the forbidden garden of Kotan, is one.' it was a challenge but despite the king's bold front there was a note of apology in it indicating that in his superstitious mind there flourished the inherent fear of man for his maker come doriel otho he continued i do not know all this foolish child has said to you but whatever you would know khotan the king will tell you o lo a go to your quarters immediately and he pointed with a stern finger toward the opposite end of the garden the princess followed by panat lee turned at once and left them we will go this way said khotan and proceeding led tarzan in another direction close to that part of the wall which they approached tarzan perceived a grotto in the miniature cliff into the interior of which khotan led him and down a rocky stairway to a gloomy corridor the opposite end of which opened into the palace proper two armed warriors stood at this entrance to the forbidden garden evidencing how jealously were the sacred precincts of the palace guarded in silence khotan led the way back to his own quarters in the palace a large chamber just outside the room toward which khotan was leading his guest was filled with chiefs and warriors awaiting the pleasure of their ruler as the two entered an aisle was formed for them the length of the chamber down which they passed in silence close to the farther door and half hidden by the warriors who stood before him was ludan the high priest tarzan glimpsed him but briefly but in that short period he was aware of a cunning and malevolent expression upon the cruel countenance that he was subconsciously aware boded him no good and then with khotan he passed into the adjoining room and the hangings dropped at the same moment the hideous headdress of an underpriest appeared in the entrance of the outer chamber its owner pausing for a moment glanced quickly around the interior and then having located him whom he sought moved rapidly in the direction of ludan there was a whispered conversation which was terminated by the high priest return immediately to the quarters of the princess he said and see that the slave is sent to me at the temple at once the underpriest turned and departed upon his mission while Ludan also left the apartment and directed his footsteps toward the sacred enclosure over which he ruled. 
a half hour later a warrior was ushered into the presence of kotan ludon the high priest desires the presence of kotan the king in the temple he announced and it is his wish that he come alone kotan nodded to indicate that he accepted the command which even the king must obey i will return presently doryul otho he said to tarzan and in the meantime my warriors and my slaves are yours to command end of chapter ten read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com chapter eleven the sentence of death but it was an hour before the king re-entered the apartment and in the meantime the ape-man had occupied himself in examining the carvings upon the walls and the numerous specimens of the handicraft of paluldonian artisans which combined to impart an atmosphere of richness and luxury to the apartment the limestone of the country close-grained and of marble whiteness yet worked with comparative ease with crude implements had been wrought by cunning craftsmen into bowls and urns and vases of considerable grace and beauty into the carved designs of many of these virgin gold had been hammered presenting the effect of a rich and magnificent cloison a barbarian himself the art of barbarians had always appealed to the ape-man to whom they represented a natural expression of man's love of the beautiful to even a greater extent than the studied and artificial efforts of civilization here was the real art of old masters the other the cheap imitation of the chromo it was while he was thus pleasurably engaged that Kotan returned as tarzan attracted by the movement of the hangings through which the king entered turned and faced him he was almost shocked by the remarkable alteration of the king's appearance his face was livid his hands trembled as with palsy and his eyes were wide as with fright his appearance was one apparently of a combination of consuming anger and withering fear tarzan looked at him questioningly you have had bad news kotan he asked the king mumbled an unintelligible reply behind there thronged into the apartment so great a number of warriors that they choked the entrance way the king looked apprehensively to right and left he cast terrified glances at the ape-man and then raising his face and turning his eyes upward he cried jad ben otho be my witness that i do not this thing of my own accord there was a moment's silence which was again broken by kotan seize him he cried to the warriors about him for ludon the high priest swears that he is an impostor to have offered armed resistance to this great concourse of warriors in the very heart of the palace of their king would have been worse than fatal already tarzan had come far by his wits and now that within a few hours he had had his hopes and his suspicions partially verified by the vague admissions of olo a he was impressed with the necessity of inviting no mortal risk that he could avoid stop he cried raising his palm against them what is the meaning of this ludon claims he has proof that you are not the son of jad ben otho cried kotan he demands that you be brought to the throne room to face your accusers if you are what you claim to be none knows better than you that you need have no fear in acquiescing to his demands but remember always that in such matters the high priest commands the king and that i am only the bearer of these commands not their author tarzan saw that kotan was not entirely convinced of his duplicity as was evidenced by his palpable design to play safe let not your warriors seize me he said to kotan lest jad ben otho mistaking their intention strike them dead the effect of his words was immediate upon the men in the front rank of those who faced him each seeming suddenly to acquire a new modesty that compelled him to self-effacement behind those directly in his rear a modesty that became rapidly contagious the ape-man smiled fear not he said i will go willingly to the audience chamber to face the blasphemers who accuse me arrived at the great throne room a new complication arose kotan would not acknowledge the right of ludon to occupy the apex of the pyramid and ludon would not consent to occupying an inferior position while tarzan to remain consistent with his high claims insisted that no one should stand above him but only to the ape-man was the humor of the situation apparent 
to relieve the situation ja don suggested that all three of them occupy the throne but this suggestion was repudiated by Kotan, who argued that no mortal other than a king of Poluldon had ever sat upon the high eminence, and that furthermore there was not room for three there. But who, said Tarzan, is my accuser, and who is my judge? Lodan is your accuser, explained Kotan. And Lodan is your judge, cried the high priest. I am to be judged by him who accuses me then, said Tarzan. It were better to dispense then with any formalities and ask Ludon to sentence me. His tone was ironical, and his sneering face, looking straight into that of the high priest, but caused the latter's hatred to rise to still greater proportions. It was evident that Kotan and his warriors saw the justice of Tarzan's implied objection to this unfair method of dispensing justice. Only Kotan can judge in the throne room of his palace, said Jadon let him hear ludon's charges and the testimony of his witnesses and then let kotan's judgment be final kotan however was not particularly enthusiastic over the prospect of sitting in trial upon one who might after all very possibly be the son of his god and so he temporized seeking for an avenue of escape it is purely a religious matter he said and it is traditional that the kings of poludon interfere not in questions of the church then let the trial be held in the temple cried one of the chiefs for the warriors were as anxious as their king to be relieved of all responsibility in the matter this suggestion was more than satisfactory to the high priest who inwardly condemned himself for not having thought of it before it is true he said this man's sin is against the temple let him be dragged thither then for trial the son of jad ben otho will be dragged nowhere cried tarzan but when this trial is over it is possible that the corpse of ludon the high priest will be dragged from the temple of the god he would desecrate think well then ludon before you commit this folly his words intended to frighten the high priest from his position failed utterly in consummating their purpose ludon showed no terror at the suggestion the ape-man's words implied here is one thought tarzan who knowing more of his religion than any of his fellows realizes fully the falsity of my claims as he does the falsity of the faith he preaches he realized however that his only hope lay in seeming indifference to the charges kotan and the warriors were still under the spell of their belief in him and upon this fact must he depend in the final act of the drama that ludon was staging for his rescue from the jealous priest whom he knew had already passed sentence upon him in his own heart with a shrug he descended the steps of the pyramid it matters not to dor -yul otho he said where ludon enrages his god for jad ben otho can reach as easily into the chambers of the temple as into the throne room of kotan immeasurably relieved by this easy solution of their problem the king and the warriors thronged from the throne room toward the temple grounds their faith in tarzan increased by his apparent indifference of the charges against him ludon led them to the largest of the altar courts taking his place behind the western altar he motioned kotan to a place upon the platform at the left hand of the altar and directed tarzan to a similar place at the right as tarzan ascended the platform his eyes narrowed angrily at the sight which met them the basin hollowed in the top of the altar was filled with water in which floated the naked corpse of a newborn babe what means this he cried angrily turning upon ludon the latter smiled malevolently that you do not know he replied is but added evidence of the falsity of your claim he who poses as the son of god did not know that as the last rays of the setting sun flood the eastern altar of the temple the life-blood of an adult reddens the white stone for the edification of jad ben otho and that when the sun rises again from the body of its maker it looks first upon this western altar and rejoices in the death of a newborn babe each day the ghost of which accompanies it across the heavens by day as the ghost of the adult returns with it to jad ben otho at night even the little children of the hodon know these things while he who claims to be the son of jad ben otho knows them not and if this proof be not enough there is more come wazdan he cried pointing to a tall slave who stood with a group of other blacks and priests on the temple floor at the left of the altar the fellow came forward fearfully 
tell us what you know of this creature cried lu don pointing to tarzan i have seen him before said the waz don i am of the tribe of kor ul lul and one day recently a party of which i was one encountered a few of the warriors of the kor ul ja upon the ridge which separates our villages among the enemy was this strange creature whom they called tarzan jad guru and terrible indeed was he for he fought with the strength of many men so that it required twenty of us to subdue him but he did not fight as a god fights and when a club struck him upon the head he sank unconscious as might an ordinary mortal we carried him with us to our village as a prisoner but he escaped after cutting off the head of the warrior we left to guard him and carrying it down into the gorge and tying it to the branch of a tree upon the opposite side the word of a slave against that of a god cried ja don who had shown previously a friendly interest in the pseudo godling it is only a step in the progress toward truth interjected lu don possibly the evidence of the only princess of the house of khotan will have greater weight with the great chief from the north though the father of a son who fled the holy offer of the priesthood may not receive with willing ears any testimony against another blasphemer jadon's hand leaped to his knife but the warriors next to him laid detaining fingers upon his arms you are in the temple of jad ben otho jadon they cautioned and the great chief was forced to swallow lu don's affront though it left in his heart bitter hatred of the high priest and now ko tan turned toward lu don what knoweth my daughter of this matter he asked you would not bring a princess of my house to testify thus publicly no replied lu don not in person but i have here one who will testify for her he beckoned to an underpriest fetch the slave of the princess he said his grotesque headdress adding a touch of the hideous to the scene the priest stepped forward dragging the reluctant panat lee by the wrist the princess oloa was alone in the forbidden garden with but this one slave explained the priest when there suddenly appeared from the foliage near by this creature who claims to be the dor ulotho when the slave saw him the princess says that she cried aloud in startled recognition and called the creature by name tarzan jad guru the same name that the slave from kor ul lul gave him this woman is not from kor ul lul but from kor ul ja the very tribe with which the kor ul lul says the creature was associating when he first saw him and further the princess said that when this woman whose name is panat lee was brought to her yesterday she told a strange story of having been rescued from a toro don in the kor ul griff by a creature such as this whom she spoke of then as tarzan jad guru and of how the two were pursued in the bottom of the gorge by two monster griffs and of how the man led them away while panat lee escaped only to be taken prisoner in the kor ul lul as she was seeking to return to her own tribe is it not plain now cried lu don that this creature is no god did he tell you that he is the son of god he almost shouted turning suddenly upon panat lee the girl shrank back terrified answer me slave cried the high priest he seemed more than mortal parried panat lee did he tell you that he was the son of god answer my question insisted lu don no she admitted in a low voice casting an appealing look of forgiveness at tarzan who returned a smile of encouragement and friendship that is no proof that he is not the son of god cried jadon dost think jad ben otho goes about crying i am god i am god hast ever heard him ludon no you have not why should his son do that which the father does not do enough cried ludon the evidence is clear the creature is an impostor and i the head priest of jad ben otho in the city of allure do condemn him to die there was a moment's silence during which ludon evidently paused for the dramatic effect of his climax and if i am wrong may jad ben otho pierce my heart with his lightnings as i stand here before you all the lapping of the wavelets of the lake against the foot of the palace wall was distinctly audible in the utter and almost breathless silence which ensued ludon stood with his face turned toward the heavens and his arms outstretched in the attitude of one who bares his breast to the dagger of an executioner the warriors and the priests and the slaves gathered in the sacred court awaiting the consuming vengeance of their god it was tarzan who broke the silence your god ignores you ludon he taunted with a sneer that he meant to still further anger the high priest he ignores you and i can prove it before the eyes of your priests and your people 
prove it blasphemer how can you prove it you have called me a blasphemer replied tarzan you have proved to your own satisfaction that i am an impostor that i an ordinary mortal have posed as the son of god demand then that jad ben otho uphold his godship and the dignity of his priesthood by directing his consuming fires through my own bosom again there ensued a brief silence while the onlookers waited for lu don to thus consummate the destruction of this presumptuous impostor you dare not taunted tarzan for you know that i would be struck dead no quicker than were you you lie cried lu don and i would do it had i not but just received a message from jad ben otho directing that your fate be different a chorus of admiring and reverential ahs arose from the priesthood Kotan and his warriors were in a state of mental confusion secretly they hated and feared ludon but so ingrained was their sense of reverence for the office of the high priest that none dared raise a voice against him none well there was jadon fearless old lion man of the north the proposition was a fair one he cried invoke the lightnings of jad ben otho upon this man if you would ever convince us of his guilt enough of this snapped ludon since when was jadon created high priest seize the prisoner he cried to the priests and warriors and on the morrow he shall die in the manner that jad ben otho has willed there was no immediate movement on the part of any of the warriors to obey the high priest's command but the lesser priests on the other hand imbued with the courage of fanaticism leaped eagerly forward like a flock of hideous harpies to seize upon their prey the game was up that tarzan knew no longer could cunning and diplomacy usurp the functions of the weapons of defence he best loved and so the first hideous priest who leaped to the platform was confronted by no suave ambassador from heaven but rather a grim and ferocious beast whose temper savoured more of hell the altar stood close to the western wall of the enclosure there was just room between the two for the high priest to stand during the performance of the sacrificial ceremonies and only lu don stood there now behind tarzan while before him were perhaps two hundred warriors and priests the presumptuous one who would have had the glory of first laying arresting hands upon the blasphemous impersonator rushed forward with outstretched hand to seize the ape-man instead it was he who was seized seized by steel fingers that snapped him up as though he had been a dummy of straw grasped him by one leg and the harness at his back and raised him with giant arms high above the altar close at his heels were others ready to seize the ape-man and drag him down and beyond the altar was lu don with drawn knife advancing toward him there was no instant to waste nor was it the way of the ape-man to fritter away precious moments in the uncertainty of belated decision before lu don or any other could guess what was in the mind of the condemned tarzan with all the force of his great muscles dashed the screaming hierophant in the face of the high priest and as though the two actions were one so quickly did he move he had leaped to the top of the altar and from there to a handhold upon the summit of the temple wall as he gained a footing there he turned and looked down upon those beneath for a moment he stood in silence and then he spoke who dare believe he cried that jad ben otho would forsake his son and then he dropped from their sight upon the other side there were two at least left within the enclosure whose hearts leaped with involuntary elation at the success of the ape-man's manoeuvre and one of them smiled openly this was jadon and the other panat lee the brains of the priest that tarzan had thrown at the head of ludon had been dashed out against the temple wall while the high priest himself had escaped with only a few bruises sustained in his fall to the hard pavement quickly scrambling to his feet he looked around in fear in terror and finally in bewilderment for he had not been a witness to the ape-man's escape seize him he cried seize the blasphemer and he continued to look around in search of his victim with such a ridiculous expression of bewilderment that more than a single warrior was compelled to hide his smiles beneath his palm the priests were rushing around wildly exhorting the warriors to pursue the fugitive but these awaited now stolidly the command of their king or high priest Kotan, more or less secretly pleased by the discomfiture of ludon waited for that worthy to give the necessary directions which he presently did when one of his acolytes excitedly explained to him the manner of tarzan's escape instantly the necessary orders were issued and priests and warriors sought the temple exit in pursuit of the ape-man 
his departing words hurled at them from the summit of the temple wall had had little effect in impressing the majority that his claims had not been disproven by ludon but in the hearts of the warriors was admiration for a brave man and in many the same unholy gratification that had risen in that of their ruler at the discomfiture of ludon a careful search of the temple grounds revealed no trace of the quarry the secret recesses of the subterranean chambers familiar only to the priesthood were examined by these while the warriors scattered through the palace and the palace grounds without the temple swift runners were dispatched to the city to arouse the people there that all might be upon the lookout for tarzan the terrible the story of his imposture and of his escape and the tales that the wazdan slaves had brought into the city concerning him were soon spread throughout allure nor did they lose aught in the spreading so that before an hour had passed the women and children were hiding behind barred doorways while the warriors crept apprehensively through the streets expecting momentarily to be pounced upon by a ferocious demon who bare-handed did victorious battle with huge griffs and whose lightest pastime consisted in tearing strong men limb from limb end of chapter eleven read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com chapter twelve the giant stranger and while the warriors and the priests of allure searched the temple and the palace in the city for the vanished ape-man there entered the head of kor ul -ja down the precipitous trail from the mountains a naked stranger bearing an enfield upon his back silently he moved downward toward the bottom of the gorge and there where the ancient trail unfolded more levelly before him he swung along with easy strides though always with the utmost alertness against possible dangers a gentle breeze came down the mountains behind him so that only his ears and his eyes were of value in detecting the presence of danger ahead generally the trail followed along the banks of the winding brooklet at the bottom of the gorge but in some places where the waters tumbled over a precipitous ledge the trail made a detour along the side of the gorge and again it wound in and out among rocky outcroppings and presently where it rounded sharply the projecting shoulder of a cliff the stranger came suddenly face to face with one who was ascending the gorge separated by a hundred paces the two halted simultaneously before him the stranger saw a tall white warrior naked but for a loin-cloth cross-belts and a girdle the man was armed with a heavy knotted club and a short knife the latter hanging in its sheath at his left hip from the end of one of his cross-belts the opposite belt supporting a leathern pouch at his right side it was Taden hunting alone in the gorge of his friend, the chief of Koryul Ja. He contemplated the stranger with surprise, but no wonder, since he recognized in him a member of the race with which his experience of Tarzan the Terrible had made him familiar, and also, thanks to his friendship for the ape-man, he looked upon the newcomer without hostility. The latter was the first to make outward sign of his intentions, raising his palm toward Ta-Dan in that gesture which has been a symbol of peace from pole to pole, since man ceased to walk upon his knuckles. Simultaneously he advanced a few paces and halted. Ta-Dan, assuming that one so like Tarzan the Terrible must be a fellow tribesman of his lost friend, was more than glad to accept this overture of peace the sign of which he returned in kind as he ascended the trail to where the other stood who are you he asked but the newcomer only shook his head to indicate that he did not understand by signs he tried to carry to the hodon the fact that he was following a trail that had led him over a period of many days from some place beyond the mountains and Taden was convinced that the newcomer sought tarzan jadguru he wished however that he might discover whether as friend or foe the stranger perceived the hodon's prehensile thumbs and great toes and his long tail with an astonishment which he sought to conceal but greater than all was the sense of relief that the first inhabitant of this strange country whom he had met had proven friendly so greatly would he have been handicapped by the necessity for forcing his way through a hostile land Taden, who had been hunting for some of the smaller mammals 
the meat of which is especially relished by the hodong forgot his intended sport in the greater interest of his new discovery he would take the stranger to omat and possibly together the two would find some way of discovering the true intentions of the newcomer and so again through signs he apprised the other that he would accompany him and together they descended toward the cliffs of omat's people as they approached these they came upon the women and children working under guard of the old men and the youths gathering the wild fruits and herbs which constitute a part of their diet as well as tending the small acres of growing crops which they cultivate the fields lay in small level patches that had been cleared of trees and brush their farm implements consisted of metal shod poles which bore a closer resemblance to spears than to tools of peaceful agriculture supplementing these were others with flattened blades that were neither hoes nor spades but instead possessed the appearance of an unhappy attempt to combine the two implements in one at first sight of these people the stranger halted and unslung his bow for these creatures were black as night their bodies entirely covered with hair but ta den interpreting the doubt in the other's mind reassured him with a gesture and a smile the wazdan however gathered around excitedly jabbering questions in a language which the stranger discovered his guide understood though it was entirely unintelligible to the former they made no attempt to molest him and he was now sure that he had fallen among a peaceful and friendly people it was but a short distance now to the caves and when they reached these ta den led the way aloft upon the wooden pegs assured that this creature whom he had discovered would have no more difficulty in following him than had tarzan the terrible nor was he mistaken for the other mounted with ease until presently the two stood within the recess before the cave of omat the chief the latter was not there and it was mid-afternoon before he returned but in the meantime many warriors came to look upon the visitor and in each instance the latter was more thoroughly impressed with the friendly and peaceable spirit of his hosts little guessing that he was being entertained by a ferocious and warlike tribe who never before the coming of ta den and tarzan had suffered a stranger among them at last omat returned and the guests sensed intuitively that he was in the presence of a great man among these people possibly a chief or king for not only did the attitude of the other black warriors indicate this but it was written also in the mane and bearing of the splendid creature who stood looking at him while ta den explained the circumstances of their meeting and i believe omat concluded the hodon that he seeks tarzan the terrible at the sound of that name the first intelligible word that had fallen upon the ears of the stranger since he had come among them his face lightened tarzan he cried tarzan of the apes and by signs he tried to tell them that it was he whom he sought they understood and also they guessed from the expression of his face that he sought tarzan from motives of affection rather than the reverse but of this omat wished to make sure he pointed to the stranger's knife and repeating tarzan's name seized ta den and pretended to stab him immediately turning questioningly toward the stranger the latter shook his head vehemently and then first placing a hand above his heart he raised his palm in the symbol of peace he is a friend of tarzan jad guru exclaimed ta den either a friend or a great liar replied omat tarzan continued the stranger you know him he lives oh god if i could only speak your language and again reverting to sign language he sought to ascertain where tarzan was he would pronounce the name and point in different directions in the cave down into the gorge back toward the mountains or out upon the valley below and each time he would raise his brows questioningly and voice the universal eh of interrogation which they could not fail to understand but always omat shook his head and spread his palms in a gesture which indicated that while he understood the question he was ignorant as to the whereabouts of the ape-man and then the black chief attempted as best he might to explain to the stranger what he knew of the whereabouts of tarzan he called the newcomer jardon which in the language of pal don means stranger and he pointed to the sun and said as this he repeated several times and then he held up one hand with the fingers outspread and touching them one by one including the thumb repeated the word adenan until the stranger understood that he meant five again he pointed to the sun and describing an arc with his forefinger starting at the eastern horizon and terminating at the western he repeated again the words as adenan 
it was plain to the stranger that the words meant that the sun had crossed the heavens five times in other words five days had passed omat then pointed to the cave where they stood pronouncing tarzan's name and imitating a walking man with the first and second fingers of his right hand upon the floor of the recess sought to show that tarzan had walked out of the cave and climbed upward on the pegs five days before but this was as far as the sign language would permit him to go this far the stranger followed him and indicating that he understood he pointed to himself and then indicating the pegs leading above announced that he would follow tarzan let us go with him said omat for as yet we have not punished the koryul lull for killing our friend and ally persuade him to wait until morning said ta -din that you may take with you many warriors and make a great raid upon the kor ul lul and this time omat do not kill your prisoners take as many as you can alive and from some of them we may learn the fate of tarzan jad guru great is the wisdom of the hodon replied omat it shall be as you say and having made prisoners of all the kor ul lul we shall make them tell us what we wish to know and then we shall march them to the rim of the kor ul griff and push them over the edge of the cliff Tadan smiled. He knew that they would not take prisoner all the Kor ul lul warriors, that they would be fortunate if they took one, and it was possible that they might even be driven back in defeat. But he knew, too, that Omat would not hesitate to carry out his threat if he had the opportunity, so implacable was the hatred of these neighbors for each other. It was not difficult to explain Omat's plan to the stranger or to win his consent, since he was aware, when the great black had made it plain, that they would be accompanied by many warriors, that their venture would probably lead them into a hostile country, and every safeguard that he could employ he was glad to avail himself of, since the furtherance of his quest was the paramount issue. He slept that night upon a pile of furs in one of the compartments of Omat's ancestral cave, and early the next day following the morning meal they sallied forth a hundred savage warriors swarming up the face of the sheer cliff and out upon the summit of the ridge the main body preceded by two warriors whose duties coincided with those of the point of modern military maneuvers safeguarding the column against the danger of too sudden contact with the enemy across the ridge they went and down into the kor ul lull and there almost immediately they came upon a lone and unarmed wazdan who was making his way fearfully up the gorge toward the village of his tribe him they took prisoner which strangely only added to his terror since from the moment that he had seen them and realized that escape was impossible he had expected to be slain immediately take him back to kor ul jaw said omat to one of his warriors and hold him there unarmed until i return and so the puzzled kor ul lul was led away while the savage company moved stealthily from tree to tree in its closer advance upon the village fortune smiled upon omat in that it gave him quickly what he sought a battle royal for they had not yet come in sight of the caves of the kor ul lul when they encountered a considerable band of warriors headed down the gorge upon some expedition like shadows the kor ul jaw melted into the concealment of the foliage upon either side of the trail ignorant of impending danger safe in the knowledge that they trod their own domain where each rock and stone was as familiar as the features of their mates the kor ul lul walked innocently into the ambush suddenly the quiet of the seeming peace was shattered by a savage cry and a hurled club felled the kor ul lul the cry was a signal for a savage chorus from a hundred kor ul jaw throats with which were soon mingled the war cries of their enemies the air was filled with flying clubs and then as the two forces mingled the battle resolved itself into a number of individual encounters as each warrior singled out a foe and closed upon him knives gleamed and flashed in the mottling sunlight that filtered through the foliage of the trees above sleek black coats were streaked with crimson stains in the thick of the fight the smooth brown skin of the stranger mingled with the black bodies of friend and foe only his keen eyes and his quick wit had shown him how to differentiate between kor ul lul and kor ul ja since with the single exception of apparel they were identical but at the first rush of the enemy he had noticed that their loincloths were not of the leopard matted hides such as were worn by his allies omat after dispatching his first antagonist glanced at jardon he fights with the ferocity of jato mused the chief powerful indeed must be the tribe from which he and tarzan jad guru come 
and then his whole attention was occupied by a new assailant the fighters surged to and fro through the forest until those who survived were spent with exhaustion all but the stranger who seemed not to know the sense of fatigue he fought on when each new antagonist would have gladly quit and when there were no more Coriol lull who were not engaged he leaped upon those who stood pantingly facing the exhausted Coriol jaw and always he carried upon his back the peculiar thing which omat had thought was some manner of strange weapon but the purpose of which he could not now account for in view of the fact that jardon never used it and that for the most part it seemed to be a nuisance and needless encumbrance since it banged and smashed against its owner as he leaped cat-like hither and thither in the course of his victorious duels the bow and arrows he had tossed aside at the beginning of the fight but the enfield he would not discard for where he went he meant that it should go until its mission had been fulfilled presently the coriol jaw seemingly shamed by the example of jardon closed once more with the enemy but the latter moved no doubt to terror by the presence of the stranger a tireless demon who appeared invulnerable to their attacks lost heart and sought to flee and then it was that at omat's command his warriors surrounded a half dozen of the most exhausted and made them prisoners it was a tired bloody and elated company that returned victorious to the coriol jaw twenty of their number were carried back and six of these were dead men it was the most glorious and successful raid that the coriol jaw had made upon the coriol lull in the memory of man and it marked omat as the greatest of chiefs but that fierce warrior knew that advantage had lain upon his side largely because of the presence of his strange ally nor did he hesitate to give credit where credit belonged with the result that jardon and his exploits were upon the tongue of every member of the tribe of coriol jaw and great was the fame of the race that could produce two such as he and tarzan jad guru and in the gorge of coriol lull beyond the ridge the survivors spoke in bated breath of this second demon that had joined forces with their ancient enemy returned to his cave omat caused the coriol lull prisoners to be brought into his presence singly and each he questioned as to the fate of tarzan without exception they told him the same story that tarzan had been taken prisoner by them five days before but that he had slain the warrior left to guard him and escaped carrying the head of the unfortunate sentry to the opposite side of coriol lull where he had left it suspended by its hair from the branch of a tree but what had become of him after they did not know not one of them until the last prisoner was examined he whom they had taken first the unarmed coriol lull making his way from the direction of the valley of jad ben otho toward the caves of his people this one when he discovered the purpose of their questioning bartered with them for the lives and liberty of himself and his fellows i can tell you much of this terrible man of whom you ask coriol ja he said i saw him yesterday and i know where he is and if you will promise to let me and my fellows return in safety to the caves of our ancestors i will tell you all and truthfully that which i know you will tell us anyway replied omat or we shall kill you you will kill me anyway retorted the prisoner unless you make me this promise so if i am to be killed the thing i know shall go with me he is right omat said ta -den. promise him that they shall have their liberty very well said omat speak coriolol and when you have told me all you and your fellows may return unharmed to your tribe it was thus commenced the prisoner three days since i was hunting with a party of my fellows near the mouth of coriolol not far from where you captured me this morning when we were surprised and set upon by a large number of hodon who took us prisoners and carried us to alur where a few were chosen to be slaves and the rest were cast into a chamber beneath the temple where are held for sacrifice the victims that are offered by the hodon to jad ben otho upon the sacrificial altars of the temple of alur it seemed then that indeed was my fate sealed and that lucky were those who had been selected for slaves among the hodon for they at least might hope to escape those in the chamber with me must be without hope but yesterday a strange thing happened there came to the temple accompanied by all the priests and by the king and many of his warriors one whom all did great reverence and when he came to the barred gateway leading to the chamber in which we wretched ones awaited our fate i saw to my surprise that it was none other than that terrible man who had so recently been a prisoner of the village of koryol lul he whom you call tarzan jadguru but whom they addressed as dor yul otho 
and he looked upon us and questioned the high priest and when he was told of the purpose for which we were imprisoned there he grew angry and cried that it was not the will of jad ben otho that his people be thus sacrificed and he commanded the high priest to liberate us and this was done the hodon prisoners were permitted to return to their homes and we were led beyond the city of alur and set upon our way toward koryul lul there were three of us but many are the dangers that lie between alur and koryul lul and we were only three and unarmed therefore none of us reached the village of our people and only one of us lives i have spoken that is all you know concerning tarzan jad guru asked Omat that is all i know replied the prisoner other than that he whom they call ludon the high priest at allure was very angry and that one of the two priests who guided us out of the city said to the other that the stranger was not dor ul otho at all that ludon said so and that he had also said that he would expose him and that he should be punished with death for his presumption that is all they said within my hearing and now chief of kor ul ja let us depart omat nodded go your way he said and aban send warriors to guard them until they are safely within the koryal lull jardon he said beckoning to the stranger come with me and rising he led the way toward the summit of the cliff and when they stood upon the ridge omat pointed down into the valley toward the city of allure gleaming in the light of the western sun there is tarzan jad guru he said and jardon understood end of chapter twelve Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com Chapter 13 The Masquerader As Tarzan dropped to the ground beyond the temple wall, there was in his mind no intention to escape from the city of Allure until he had satisfied himself that his mate was not a prisoner there but how in this strange city in which every man's hand must be now against him he was to live and prosecute his search was far from clear to him there was only one place of which he knew that he might find even temporary sanctuary and that was the forbidden garden of the king there was thick shrubbery in which a man might hide and water and fruits a cunning jungle creature if he could reach the spot unsuspected might remain concealed there for a considerable time but how he was to traverse the distance between the temple grounds and the garden unseen was a question the seriousness of which he fully appreciated mighty is tarzan he soliloquized in his native jungle but in the cities of man he is little better than they depending upon his keen observation and sense of location he felt safe in assuming that he could reach the palace grounds by means of the subterranean corridors and chambers of the temple through which he had been conducted the day before nor any slightest detail of which had escaped his keen eyes that would be better he reasoned than crossing the open grounds above where his pursuers would naturally immediately follow him from the temple and quickly discover him and so a dozen paces from the temple wall he disappeared from sight of any chance observer above down one of the stone stairways that led to the apartments beneath the way that he had been conducted the previous day had followed the windings and turnings of numerous corridors and apartments but tarzan sure of himself in such matters retraced the route accurately without hesitation he had little fear of immediate apprehension here since he believed that all the priests of the temple had assembled in the court above to witness his trial and his humiliation and his death and with this idea firmly implanted in his mind he rounded the turn of the corridor and came face to face with an under-priest his grotesque headdress concealing whatever emotion the sight of tarzan may have aroused however tarzan had one advantage over the masked votary of jad ben otho in that the moment he saw the priest he knew his intention concerning him and therefore was not compelled to delay action and so it was that before the priest could determine on any suitable line of conduct in the premises a long keen knife had been slipped into his heart as the body lunged toward the floor tarzan caught it and snatched the headdress from its shoulders for the first sight of the creature had suggested to his ever alert mind a bold scheme for deceiving his enemies the headdress saved from such possible damage as it must have sustained had it fallen to the floor with the body of its owner tarzan relinquished his hold upon the corpse 
set the headdress carefully upon the floor and stooping down severed the tail of the hodon close to its root near by at his right was a small chamber from which the priest had evidently just emerged and into this tarzan dragged the corpse the headdress and the tail quickly cutting a thin strip of hide from the loin-cloth of the priest tarzan tied it securely about the upper end of the severed member and then tucking the tail under his loin-cloth behind him secured it in place as best he could then he fitted the headdress over his shoulders and stepped from the apartment to all appearances a priest of the temple of jad ben otho unless one examined too closely his thumbs and his great toes he had noticed that among both the hodon and the wazdan it was not at all unusual that the end of the tail be carried in one hand and so he caught his own tail up lest the lifeless appearance of it dragging along behind him should arouse suspicion passing along the corridor and through the various chambers he emerged at last into the palace grounds beyond the temple the pursuit had not yet reached this point though he was conscious of a commotion not far behind him he met now both warriors and slaves but none gave him more than a passing glance a priest being too common a sight about the palace and so passing the guards unchallenged he came at last to the inner entrance to the forbidden garden and there he paused and scanned quickly that portion of the beautiful spot that lay before his eyes to his relief it seemed unoccupied and congratulating himself upon the ease with which he had so far outwitted the high powers of allure he moved rapidly to the opposite end of the enclosure here he found a patch of flowering shrubbery that might safely have concealed a dozen men crawling well within he removed the uncomfortable headdress and sat down to await whatever eventualities fate might have in store for him the while he formulated plans for the future the one night that he had spent in allure had kept him up to a late hour apprising him of the fact that while there were few abroad in the temple grounds at night there were yet enough to make it possible for him to fare forth under cover of his disguise without attracting the unpleasant attention of the guards and too he had noticed that the priesthood constituted a privileged class that seemed to come and go at will and unchallenged throughout the palace as well as the temple altogether then he decided night furnished the most propitious hours for his investigation by day he could lie up in the shrubbery of the forbidden garden reasonably free from detection from beyond the garden he heard the voices of men calling to one another both far and near and he guessed that diligent was the search that was being prosecuted for him the idle moments afforded him an opportunity to evolve a more satisfactory scheme for attaching his stolen caudal appendage he arranged it in such a way that it might be quickly assumed or discarded and this done he fell to examining the weird mask that had so effectively hidden his features the thing had been very cunningly wrought from a single block of wood very probably a section of a tree upon which the features had been carved and afterward the interior hollowed out until only a comparatively thin shell remained two semicircular notches had been rounded out from the opposite sides of the lower edge these fitted snugly over his shoulders aprons of wood extending downward a few inches upon his chest and back from these aprons hung long tassels or switches of hair tapering from the outer edges toward the centre which reached below the bottom of his torso it required but the most cursory examination to indicate to the ape-man that these ornaments consisted of human scalps taken doubtless from the heads of the sacrifices upon the eastern altars the headdress itself had been carved to depict in formal design a hideous face that suggested both man and griff there were the three white horns the yellow face with the blue bands encircling the eyes and the red hood which took the form of the posterior and anterior aprons as tarzan sat within the concealing foliage of the shrubbery meditating upon the hideous priest mask which he held in his hands he became aware that he was not alone in the garden he sensed another presence and presently his trained ears detected the slow approach of naked feet across the sward at first he suspected that it might be one stealthily searching the forbidden garden for him but a little later the figure came within the limited area of his vision which was circumscribed by stems and foliage and flowers he saw then that it was the princess oloa and that she was alone and walking with bowed head as though in meditation sorrowful meditation for there were traces of tears upon her lids shortly after his ears warned him that others had entered the garden 
men they were and their footsteps proclaimed that they walked neither slowly nor meditatively they came directly toward the princess and when tarzan could see them he discovered that both were priests Olo a princess of palyul don said one addressing her the stranger who told us that he was the son of jad ben otho has but just fled from the wrath of ludan the high priest who exposed him and all his wicked blasphemy the temple and the palace in the city are being searched and we have been sent to search the forbidden garden since Kotan the king said that only this morning he found him here though how he passed the guards he could not guess he is not here said oloa i have been in the garden for some time and have seen nor heard no other than myself however search it if you will no said the priest who had before spoken it is not necessary since he could not have entered without your knowledge and the connivance of the guards and even had he the priest who preceded us must have seen him what priest asked oloa one passed the guards shortly before us explained the man i did not see him said oloa doubtless he left by another exit remarked the second priest yes doubtless acquiesced oloa but it is strange that i did not see him the two priests made their obeisance and turned to depart stupid as buto the rhinoceros soliloquized tarzan who considered buto a very stupid creature indeed it would be easy to outwit such as these the priests had scarce departed when there came the sound of feet running rapidly across the garden in the direction of the princess to an accompaniment of rapid breathing as of one almost spent either from fatigue or excitement pan at lee exclaimed oloa what has happened you look as terrified as the doe for which you were named o oh, princess of palyul don cried pan at lee they would have killed him in the temple they would have killed the wondrous stranger who claimed to be the dor Yulotho. but he escaped said oloa you were there tell me about it the head priest would have had him seized and slain but when they rushed upon him he hurled one in the face of ludan with the same ease that you might cast your breastplates at me and then he leaped upon the altar and from there to the top of the temple wall and disappeared below they are searching for him but o oh, princess i pray that they do not find him and why do you pray that asked oloa has not one who has so blasphemed earned death ah but you do not know him replied pan at lee and you do then retorted oloa quickly this morning you betrayed yourself and then attempted to deceive me the slaves of oloa do not such things with impunity he is then the same tarzan jad guru of whom you told me speak woman and speak only the truth pan at lee drew herself up very erect her little chin held high for was not she too among her own people already as good as a princess pan at lee the koryal jaw does not lie she said to protect herself then tell me what you know of this tarzan jad guru insisted oloa i know that he is a wondrous man and very brave said pan at lee and that he saved me from the torodon and the griff as i told you and that he is indeed the same who came into the garden this morning and even now i do not know that he is not the son of jad ben otho for his courage and his strength are more than those of mortal man as are also his kindness and his honour for when he might have harmed me he protected me and when he might have saved himself he thought only of me and all this he did because of his friendship for omat who is gund of koryul ja and with whom i should have mated had the hodon not captured me he was indeed a wonderful man to look upon mused oloa and he was not as our other man not alone in the conformation of his hands and feet or the fact that he was tailless but there was that about him which made him seem different in ways more important than these and supplemented pan at lee her savage little heart loyal to the man who had befriended her and hoping to win for him the consideration of the princess even though it might not avail him and she said did he not know all about ta den and even his whereabouts tell me o oh princess could mortal know such things as these perhaps he saw ta den suggested oloa but how would he know that you loved ta den parried pan at lee i tell you my princess that if he is not a god he is at least more than hodan or wazdan he followed me from the cave of essat in koryul ja across koryul lull and two wide ridges to the very cave in koryul griff where i hid though many hours had passed since i had come that way and my bare feet left no impress upon the ground what mortal man could do such things as these and where in all pal yul don would virgin maid find friend and protector in a strange male other than he perhaps ludon may be mistaken 
perhaps he is a god said oloa influenced by her slave's enthusiastic championing of the stranger but whether god or man he is too wonderful to die cried pan at lee would that i might save him if he lived he might even find a way to give you your taden princess ah if only he could sighed oloa but alas it is too late for to-morrow i am to be given to bulat he who came to your quarters yesterday with your father asked pan at lee yes the one with the awful round face and the big belly exclaimed the princess disgustedly he is so lazy he will neither hunt nor fight to eat and drink is all that bulat is fit for and he thinks of naught else except these things and his slave women but come pan at lee gather for me some of these beautiful blossoms i would have them spread around my couch to-night that i may carry away with me in the morning the memory of the fragrance that i love best and which i know that i shall not find in the village of mosar the father of bulat i will help you pan at lee and we will gather arms full of them for i love to gather them as i love nothing else they were taden's favorite flowers the two approached the flowering shrubbery where tarzan hid but as the blooms grew plentifully upon every bush the ape-man guessed there would be no necessity for them to enter the patch far enough to discover him with little exclamations of pleasure as they found particularly large or perfect blooms the two moved from place to place upon the outskirts of tarzan's retreat oh look pan at lee cried o lo a presently there is the king of them all never did i see so wonderful a flower no i will get it myself it is so large and wonderful no other hand shall touch it and the princess wound in among the bushes toward the point where the great flower bloomed upon a bush above the ape-man's head so sudden and unexpected her approach that there was no opportunity to escape and tarzan sat silently trusting that fate might be kind to him and lead kotan's daughter away before her eyes dropped from the high growing bloom to him but as the girl cut the long stem with her knife she looked down straight into the smiling face of tarzan jadguru with a stifled scream she drew back and the ape-man rose and faced her have no fear princess he assured her it is the friend of taden who salutes you raising her fingers to his lips panat lee came now excitedly forward o oh, jad ben otho it is he and now that you have found me queried tarzan will you give me up to ludon the high priest Panat Lee threw herself upon her knees at Oloa's feet. "'Princess, princess,' she beseeched, "'do not discover him to his enemies.' "'But Kotan, my father,' whispered Oloa fearfully, "'if he knew of my perfidy his rage would be beyond naming. Even though I am a princess, Ludan might demand that I be sacrificed to appease the wrath of Jad ben Otho, and between the two of them I should be lost.' "'But they need never know,' cried Panat Lee, "'that you have seen him, unless you tell them yourself.' for as jad ben otho is my witness i will never betray you oh tell me stranger employed o lo a are you indeed a god jad ben otho is not more so replied tarzan truthfully but why do you seek to escape then from the hands of mortals if you are a god she asked when gods mingle with mortals replied tarzan they are no less vulnerable than mortals even jad ben otho should he appear before you in the flesh might be slain you have seen taden and spoken with him she asked with apparent irrelevancy yes i have seen him and spoken with him replied the ape-man for the duration of a moon i was with him constantly and she hesitated he she cast her eyes toward the ground and a flush mantled her cheek he still loves me and tarzan knew that she had been won over yes he said taden speaks only of oloa and he waits and hopes for the day when he can claim her but to-morrow they give me to bulat she said sadly may it be always to-morrow replied tarzan for to-morrow never comes ah but this unhappiness will come and for all the to-morrows of my life i must pine in misery for the taden who will never be mine but for ludon i might have helped you said the ape-man and who knows that i may not help you yet ah if only you could dor yul otho cried the girl and i know that you would if it were possible for pan at lee has told me how brave you are and at the same time how kind only jad ben otho knows what the future may bring said tarzan and now you two go your way lest someone should discover you and become suspicious we will go said o lo a but pan at lee will return with food i hope that you escape and that jad ben otho is pleased with what i have done she turned and walked away and pan at lee followed while the ape-man again resumed his hiding 
at dusk pan at lee came with food and having her alone tarzan put the question that he had been anxious to put since his conversation earlier in the day with o lo a tell me he said what you know of the rumors of which o lo a spoke of the mysterious stranger who is supposed to be hidden in a lure have you two heard of this during the short time that you have been here yes said pan at lee i have heard it spoken of among the other slaves it is something of which all whisper among themselves but of which none dares to speak aloud they say that there is a strange she hidden in the temple and that dudon wants her for a priestess and that Kotan wants her for a wife and that neither as yet dares take her for fear of the other do you know where she is hidden in the temple asked tarzan no said pan at lee how should i know i do not even know that it is more than a story but i tell you that which i have heard others say there was only one asked tarzan whom they spoke of no they speak of another who came with her but none seems to know what became of this one tarzan nodded thank you pan at lee he said you may have helped me more than either of us guess i hope that i have helped you said the girl as she turned back toward the palace and i hope so too exclaimed tarzan emphatically end of chapter thirteen read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark dot blogspot dot com chapter fourteen the temple of the griff when night had fallen tarzan donned the mask and the dead tail of the priest he had slain in the vaults beneath the temple he judged that it would not do to attempt again to pass the guard especially so late at night as it would be likely to arouse comment and suspicion and so he swung into the tree that overhung the garden wall and from its branches dropped to the ground beyond avoiding too grave risk of apprehension the ape-man passed through the grounds to the court of the palace approaching the temple from the side opposite to that at which he had left it at the time of his escape he came thus it is true through a portion of the grounds with which he was unfamiliar but he preferred this to the danger of following the beaten track between the palace apartments and those of the temple having a definite goal in mind and endowed as he was with an almost miraculous sense of location he moved with great assurance through the shadows of the temple yard taking advantage of the denser shadows close to the walls and of what shrubs and trees there were he came without mishap at last to the ornate building concerning the purpose of which he had asked ludon only to be put off with the assertion that it was forgotten nothing strange in itself but given possible importance by the apparent hesitancy of the priest to discuss its use and the impression the ape-man had gained at the time that ludon lied and now he stood at last alone before the structure which was three stories in height and detached from all the other temple buildings it had a single barred entrance which was carved from the living rock in representation of the head of a griff whose wide open mouth constituted the doorway the head hood and front paws of the creature were depicted as though it lay crouching with its lower jaw on the ground between its outspread paws small oval windows which were likewise barred flanked the doorway seeing that the coast was clear tarzan stepped into the darkened entrance where he tried the bars only to discover that they were ingeniously locked in place by some device with which he was unfamiliar and that they also were probably too strong to be broken even if he could have risked the noise which would have resulted nothing was visible within the darkened interior and so momentarily baffled he sought the windows here also the bars refused to yield up their secret but again tarzan was not dismayed since he had counted upon nothing different if the bars would not yield to his cunning they would yield to his giant strength if there proved no other means of ingress but first he would assure himself that this latter was the case moving entirely around the building he examined it carefully there were other windows but they were similarly barred he stopped often to look and listen but he saw no one and the sounds that he heard were too far away to cause him any apprehension he glanced above him at the wall of the building like so many of the other walls of the city palace and temple it was ornately carved and there were too the peculiar ledges that ran sometimes in a horizontal plane and again were tilted at an angle 
giving off times an impression of irregularity and even crookedness to the buildings it was not a difficult wall to climb at least not difficult for the ape-man but he found the bulky and awkward headdress a considerable handicap and so he laid it aside upon the ground at the foot of the wall nimbly he ascended to find the windows of the second floor not only barred but curtained within he did not delay long at the second floor since he had in mind an idea that he would find the easiest entrance through the roof which he had noticed was roughly dome-shaped like the throne room of Khotan. here there were apertures he had seen them from the ground and if the construction of the interior resembled even slightly that of the throne room bars would not be necessary upon these apertures since no one could reach them from the floor of the room there was but a single question would they be large enough to admit the broad shoulders of the ape-man he paused again at the third floor and here in spite of the hangings he saw that the interior was lighted and simultaneously there came to his nostrils from within a scent that stripped from him temporarily any remnant of civilization that might have remained and left him a fierce and terrible bull of the jungles of kerchak so sudden and complete was the metamorphosis that there almost broke from the savage lips the hideous challenge of his kind but the cunning brute mind saved him this blunder and now he heard voices within the voice of ludon he could have sworn demanding and haughty and disdainful came the answering words though utter hopelessness spoke in the tones of this other voice which brought tarzan to the pinnacle of frenzy the dome with its possible apertures was forgotten every consideration of stealth and quiet was cast aside as the ape-man drew back his mighty fist and struck a single terrific blow upon the bars of the small window before him a blow that sent the bars and the casing that held them clattering to the floor of the apartment within instantly tarzan dove head foremost through the aperture carrying the hangings of antelope hide with him to the floor below leaping to his feet he tore the entangling pelt from about his head only to find himself in utter darkness and in silence he called aloud a name that had not passed his lips for many weary months jane jane he cried where are you but there was only silence in reply again and again he called groping with outstretched hands through the stygian blackness of the room his nostrils assailed and his brain tantalized by the delicate effluvia that had first assured him that his mate had been within this very room and he had heard her dear voice combating the base demands of the vile priest ah if he had but acted with greater caution if he had but continued to move with quiet and stealth he might even at this moment be holding her in his arms while the body of ludon beneath his foot spoke eloquently of vengeance achieved but there was no time now for idle self-reproaches he stumbled blindly forward groping for he knew not what till suddenly the floor beneath him tilted and he shot downward into a darkness even more utter than that above he felt his body strike a smooth surface and he realized that he was hurtling downward as through a polished chute while from above there came the mocking tones of a taunting laugh and the voice of ludon screamed after him return to thy father o dor Ulotho. the ape-man came to a sudden and painful stop upon a rocky floor directly before him was an oval window crossed by many bars and beyond he saw the moonlight playing on the waters of the blue lake below simultaneously he was conscious of a familiar odor in the air of the chamber which a quick glance revealed in the semi-darkness as of considerable proportion it was the faint but unmistakable odor of the griff and now tarzan stood silently listening at first he detected no sounds other than those of the city which came to him through the window overlooking the lake but presently faintly as though from a distance he heard the shuffling of padded feet along a stone pavement and as he listened he was aware that the sound approached nearer and nearer it came and now even the breathing of the beast was audible evidently attracted by the noise of his descent into its cavernous retreat it was approaching to investigate he could not see it but he knew that it was not far distant and deafeningly there reverberated through those gloomy corridors the mad bellow of the griff aware of the poor eyesight of the beast and his own eyes now grown accustomed to the darkness of the cavern 
the ape-man sought to elude the infuriated charge which he well knew no living creature could withstand neither did he dare risk the chance of experimenting upon this strange griff with the tactics of the torodon that he had found so efficacious upon that other occasion when his life and liberty had been the stakes for which he cast in many respects the conditions were dissimilar before in broad daylight he had been able to approach the griff under normal conditions in its natural state and the griff itself was one that he had seen subjected to the authority of man or at least of a man-like creature but here he was confronted by an imprisoned beast in the full swing of a furious charge and he had every reason to suspect that this griff might never have felt the restraining influence of authority confined as it was in this gloomy pit to serve likely but the single purpose that tarzan had already seen so graphically portrayed in his own experience of the past few moments to elude the creature then upon the possibility of discovering some loophole of escape from his predicament seemed to the ape-man the wisest course to pursue too much was at stake to risk an encounter that might be avoided an encounter the outcome of which there was every reason to apprehend would seal the fate of the mate that he had just found only to lose again so harrowingly yet high as his disappointment and chagrin ran hopeless as his present estate now appeared there tingled in the veins of the savage lord a warm glow of thanksgiving and elation she lived after all these weary months of hopelessness and fear he had found her she lived to the opposite side of the chamber silently as the wraith of a disembodied soul the swift jungle creature moved from the path of the charging titan that guided solely in the semi-darkness by its keen ears bore down upon the spot toward which tarzan's noisy entrance into its lair had attracted it along the further wall the ape-man hurried before him now appeared the black opening of the corridor from which the beast had emerged into the larger chamber without hesitation tarzan plunged into it even here his eyes long accustomed to darkness that would have seemed a total to you or to me dimly saw the floor and the walls within a radius of a few feet enough at least to prevent him plunging into any unguessed abyss or dashing himself upon solid rock at a sudden turning the corridor was both wide and lofty which indeed it must be to accommodate the colossal proportions of the creature whose habitat it was and so tarzan encountered no difficulty in moving with reasonable speed along its winding trail he was aware as he proceeded that the trend of the passage was downward though not steeply but it seemed interminable and he wondered to what distant subterranean lair it might lead there was a feeling that perhaps after all he might better have remained in the larger chamber and risked all on the chance of subduing the griff where there was at least sufficient room and light to lend to the experiment some slight chance of success to be overtaken here in the narrow confines of the black corridor where he was assured the griff could not see him at all would spell almost certain death and now he heard the thing approaching from behind its thunderous bellows fairly shook the cliff from which the cavernous chambers were excavated to halt and meet this monstrous incarnation of fury with a futile whee -oo! seemed to tarzan the height of insanity and so he continued along the corridor increasing his pace as he realized that the griff was overhauling him presently the darkness lessened and at the final turning of the passage he saw before him an area of moonlight with renewed hope he sprang rapidly forward and emerged from the mouth of the corridor to find himself in a large circular enclosure the towering white walls of which rose high upon every side smooth perpendicular walls upon the sheer face of which was no slightest foothold to his left lay a pool of water one side of which lapped the foot of the wall at this point it was doubtless the wallow and the drinking pool of the griff and now the creature emerged from the corridor and tarzan retreated to the edge of the pool to make his last stand there was no staff with which to enforce the authority of his voice but yet he made his stand for there seemed naught else to do just beyond the entrance to the corridor the griff paused turning its weak eyes in all directions as though searching for its prey then seemed the psychological moment for his attempt and raising his voice in peremptory command the ape-man voiced the weird Wee -oo! of the torodon its effect upon the griff was instantaneous and complete 
with a terrific bellow it lowered its three horns and dashed madly in the direction of the sound to right nor to left was any avenue of escape for behind him lay the placid waters of the pool while down upon him from before thundered annihilation the mighty body seemed all ready to tower above him as the ape-man turned and dove into the dark waters dead in her breast lay hope battling for life during harrowing months of imprisonment and danger and hardship it had fitfully flickered and flamed only to sink after each renewal to smaller proportions than before and now it had died out entirely leaving only cold charred embers that jane clayton knew would never again be rekindled hope was dead as she faced ludon the high priest in her prison quarters in the temple of the griff at allure both time and hardship had failed to leave their impress upon her physical beauty the contours of her perfect form the glory of her radiant loveliness had defied them yet to these very attributes she owed the danger which now confronted her for ludon desired her from the lesser priests she had been safe but from ludon she was not safe for ludon was not as they since the high priestship of pal yul don may descend from father to son Kotan the king had wanted her, and all that had so far saved her from either was the fear of each for the other. But at last Lu Don had cast aside discretion, and had come in the silent watches of the night to claim her. Haughtily she had repulsed him, seeking ever to gain time, though what time might bring her of relief or renewed hope she could not even remotely conjecture. A leer of lust and greed shone hungrily upon his cruel countenance as he advanced across the room to seize her. She did not shrink nor cower, but stood there very erect, her chin up, her level gaze freighted with the loathing and contempt she felt for him. He read her expression, and while it angered him, it but increased his desire for possession. Here indeed was a queen, perhaps a goddess, fit mate for the high priest you shall not she said as he would have touched her one of us shall die before ever your purpose is accomplished he was close beside her now his laugh grated upon her ears love does not kill he replied mockingly he reached for her arm and at the same instant something clashed against the bars of one of the windows crashing them inward to the floor to be followed almost simultaneously by a human figure which dove head foremost into the room its head enveloped in the skin window hangings which it carried with it in its impetuous entry jane clayton saw surprise and something of terror leap to the countenance of the high priest and then she saw him spring forward and jerk upon a leather thong that depended from the ceiling of the apartment instantly there dropped from above a cunningly contrived partition that fell between them and the intruder effectively barring him from them and at the same time leaving him to grope upon its opposite side in darkness since the only cresset the room contained was upon their side of the partition faintly from beyond the wall jane heard a voice calling but whose it was and what the words she could not distinguish then she saw ludon jerk upon another thong and wait in evident expectancy of some consequent happening he did not have long to wait she saw the thong move suddenly as though jerked from above and then ludon smiled and with another signal put in motion whatever machinery it was that raised the partition again to its place in the ceiling advancing into that portion of the room that the partition had shut off from them the high priest knelt upon the floor and down tilting a section of it revealed the dark mouth of a shaft leading below laughing loudly he shouted into the hole return to thy father o dor -yul -otho. making fast the catch that prevented the trap-door from opening beneath the feet of the unwary until such time as ludon chose the high priest rose again to his feet now o beautiful one he cried and then jadon what do you hear jane clayton turned to follow the direction of ludon's eyes and there she saw framed in the entranceway to the apartment the mighty figure of a warrior upon whose massive features sat an expression of stern and uncompromising authority i come from Kotan the king replied jadon to remove the beautiful stranger to the forbidden garden the king defies me the high priest of jad ben otho cried ludon it is the king's command i have spoken snapped jadon in whose manner was no sign of either fear or respect for the priest ludon well knew why the king had chosen this messenger whose heresy was notorious but whose power had as yet protected him from the machinations of the priest 
Lu Don cast a surreptitious glance at the thongs hanging from the ceiling. Why not? If he could but maneuver to entice Jadon to the opposite side of the chamber. Come, he said in a conciliatory tone, let us discuss the matter, and move toward the spot where he would have Jadon follow him. There is nothing to discuss, replied Jadon, yet he followed the priest, fearing treachery. Jane watched them. In the face and figure of the warrior she found reflected those admirable traits of courage and honor that the profession of arms best develops. In the hypocritical priest there was no redeeming quality. Of the two, then, she might best choose the warrior. With him there was a chance, with Ludon none. Even the very process of exchange from one prison to another might offer some possibility of escape. She weighed all these things and decided, for Ludon's quick glance at the thongs had not gone unnoticed nor uninterpreted by her. Warrior, she said, addressing Jadon, if you would live, enter not to that portion of the room. Ludon cast an angry glance upon her. Silence, slave, he cried. And where lies the danger? Jadon asked of Jane, ignoring Ludon. The woman pointed to the thongs. Look! she said and before the high priest could prevent she had seized that which controlled the partition which shot downward separating ludon from the warrior and herself jadon looked inquiringly at her he would have tricked me neatly but for you he said kept me imprisoned there while he secreted you elsewhere in the mazes of his temple he would have done more than that replied jane as she pulled upon the other thong this releases the fastenings of a trap-door in the floor beyond the partition when you stepped on that you would have been precipitated into a pit beneath the temple. Ludon has threatened me with this fate often. I do not know that he speaks the truth, but he says that a demon of the temple is imprisoned there, a huge griff. There is a griff within the temple, said Jadon. What with it and the sacrifices, the priests keep us busy supplying them with prisoners, though the victims are sometimes those for whom Ludon has conceived hatred among our own people. He has had his eyes upon me for a long time. This would have been his chance, but for you. Tell me, woman, why you warned me. Are we not all equally your jailers and your enemies? None could be more horrible than Ludan, she replied, and you have the appearance of a brave and honorable warrior. I could not hope, for hope has died, and yet there is the possibility that among so many fighting men, even though they be of another race than mine, there is one who would accord honorable treatment to a stranger within his gates, even though she be a woman. Jadon looked at her for a long minute. Kotan would make you his queen, he said. That he told me himself, and surely that were honorable treatment from one who might make you a slave. Why then would he make me a queen? she asked. Jadon came closer as though in fear his words might be overheard. He believes, although he did not tell me so in fact, that you are of the race of gods. And why not? Jad ben Otho is tailless, therefore it is not strange that Kotan should suspect that only the gods are thus. His queen is dead, leaving only a single daughter. He craves a son, and what more desirable than that he should found a line of rulers for Pal Yul Don descended from the gods? But I am already wed, cried Jane. I cannot wed another. I do not want him or his throne. Kotan is king, replied Jadon simply, as though that explained and simplified everything. You will not save me then? she asked. If you were in Jalur, he replied, I might protect you even against the king. What and where is Jalur? she asked, grasping at any straw. It is the city where I rule, he answered. I am chief there and of all the valley beyond. Where is it? she insisted. And is it far? no he replied smiling it is not far but do not think of that you could never reach it there are too many to pursue and capture you if you wish to know however it lies up the river that empties into jad ben lul whose waters kiss the walls of allure up the western fork it lies with water upon three sides impregnable city of pal yul don alone of all the cities it has never been entered by a foeman since it was built there while jad ben otho was a boy and there i would be safe she asked perhaps he replied ah dead hope upon what slender provocation would you seek to glow again she sighed and shook her head realizing the inutility of hope yet the tempting bait dangled before her mind's eye ja lur 
you are wise commented ja Don, interpreting her sigh come now we will go to the quarters of the princess beside the forbidden garden there you will remain with o lo a the king's daughter it will be better than this prison you have occupied and Kotan? she asked a shudder passing through her slender frame there are ceremonies explained ja Don, that may occupy several days before you become a queen and one of them may be difficult of arrangement he laughed then what she asked only the high priest may perform the marriage ceremony for a king he explained delay she murmured blessed delay tenacious indeed of life is hope even though it be reduced to cold and lifeless char a veritable phoenix end of chapter fourteen read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com chapter fifteen the king is dead as they conversed jadon had led her down the stone stairway that leads from the upper floors of the temple of the griff to the chambers and the corridors that honeycomb the rocky hills from which the temple and the palace are hewn and now they passed from one to the other through a doorway upon one side of which two priests stood guard and upon the other two warriors the former would have halted ja Don when they saw who it was that accompanied him for well known throughout the temple was the quarrel between king and high priest for possession of this beautiful stranger only by order of lu don may she pass said one placing himself directly in front of jane clayton barring her progress through the hollow eyes of the hideous mask the woman could see those of the priest beneath gleaming with the fires of fanaticism Jadon placed an arm about her shoulders and laid his hand upon his knife. "'She passes by order of Kotan the king,' he said, "'and by virtue of the fact that Jadon the chief is her guide. Stand aside.' The two warriors upon the palace side pressed forward. "'We are here, Gund of Jalur, said one, addressing Jadon, "'to receive and obey your commands.' The second priest now interposed let them pass he admonished his companion we have received no direct commands from ludan to the contrary and it is a law of the temple and the palace that chiefs and priests may come and go without interference but i know ludan's wishes insisted the other he told you then that jadon must not pass with the stranger no but then let them pass for they are three to two and will pass anyway we have done our best grumbling the priest stepped aside ludon will exact an accounting he cried angrily ja Don turned upon him and get it when and where he will he snapped they came at last to the quarters of the princess oloa where in the main entrance way loitered a small guard of palace warriors and several stalwart black eunuchs belonging to the princess or her women to one of the latter ja Don relinquished his charge take her to the princess he commanded and see that she does not escape through a number of corridors and apartments lighted by stone cressets the eunuch led lady greystoke halting at last before a doorway concealed by hangings of jato skin where the guide beat with his staff upon the wall beside the door Oloa, princess of Palyuldan, he called here is the stranger woman the prisoner from the temple bid her enter jane heard a sweet voice from within command the eunuch drew aside the hangings and lady greystoke stepped within before her was a low ceiled room of moderate size in each of the four corners a kneeling figure of stone seemed to be bearing its portion of the weight of the ceiling upon its shoulders these figures were evidently intended to represent was don slaves and were not without bold artistic beauty the ceiling itself was slightly arched to a central dome which was pierced to admit light by day and air upon one side of the room were many windows the other three walls being blank except for a doorway in each the princess lay upon a pile of furs which were arranged over a low stone dais in one corner of the apartment and was alone except for a single was don slave girl who sat upon the edge of the dais near her feet 
as jane entered o lo a beckoned her to approach and when she stood beside the couch the girl half rose upon an elbow and surveyed her critically how beautiful you are she said simply jane smiled sadly for she had found that beauty may be a curse that is indeed a compliment she replied quickly from one so radiant as the princess Oloa. ah exclaimed the princess delightedly you speak my language i was told that you were of another race and from some far land of which we of paluldan have never heard ludan saw to it that the priests instructed me explained jane but i am from a far country princess one to which i long to return and i am very unhappy but Kotan, my father would make you his queen cried the girl that should make you very happy but it does not replied the prisoner i love another to whom i am already wed ah princess if you had known what it was to love and to be forced into marriage with another you would sympathize with me the princess oloa was silent for a long moment i know she said at last and i am very sorry for you but if the king's daughter cannot save herself from such a fate who may save a slave woman for such in fact you are the drinking in the great banquet hall of the palace of Kotan, king of paluldan had commenced earlier this night than was usual for the king was celebrating the morrow's betrothal of his only daughter to bulat son of mosar the chief whose great-grandfather had been king of paluldan and who thought that he should be king and mosar was drunk and so was bulat his son for that matter nearly all of the warriors including the king himself were drunk in the heart of Kotan was no love either for mosar or bulat nor did either of these love the king Kotan was giving his daughter to bulat in the hope that the alliance would prevent mosar from insisting upon his claims to the throne for next to jadan mosar was the most powerful of the chiefs and while Kotan looked with fear upon jadan too he had no fear that the old lion man would attempt to seize the throne though which way he would throw his influence and his warriors in the event that mosar declare war upon Kotan, the king could not guess primitive people who are also warlike are seldom inclined toward either tact or diplomacy even when sober but drunk they know not the words if aroused it was really bulat who started it this he said i drink to oloa and he emptied his tankard at a single gulp and this seizing a full one from a neighbor to her son and mine who will bring back the throne of paluldan to its rightful owners the king is not yet dead cried Kotan, rising to his feet nor is bulat yet married to his daughter and there is yet time to save paluldan from the spawn of the rabbit breed the king's angry tone and his insulting reference to bulat's well-known cowardice brought a sudden sobering silence upon the roistering company every eye turned upon bulat and mosar who sat together directly opposite the king the first was very drunk though suddenly he seemed quite sober he was so drunk that for an instant he forgot to be a coward since his reasoning powers were so effectually paralyzed by the fumes of liquor that he could not intelligently weigh the consequences of his acts it is reasonably conceivable that a drunk and angry rabbit might commit a rash deed upon no other hypothesis is the thing that bulat now did explicable he rose suddenly from the seat to which he had sunk after delivering his toast and seizing the knife from the sheath of the warrior upon his right hurled it with terrific force at Kotan. skilled in the art of throwing both their knives and their clubs are the warriors of paluldan and at this short distance and coming as it did without warning there was no defence and but one possible result Kotan the king lunged forward across the table blade buried in his heart a brief silence followed the assassin's cowardly act white with terror now bulat fell slowly back toward the doorway at his rear when suddenly angry warriors leaped with drawn knives to prevent his escape and to avenge their king but mosar now took his stand beside his son Kotan is dead he cried mosar is king let the loyal warriors of paluldan protect their ruler mosar commanded a goodly following and these quickly surrounded him and bulat 
but there were many knives against them and now jadon pressed forward through those who confronted the pretender take them both he shouted the warriors of pal -yul don will choose their own king after the assassin of Kotan has paid the penalty of his treachery directed now by a leader whom they both respected and admired those who had been loyal to Kotan rushed forward upon the faction that had surrounded mosar fierce and terrible was the fighting devoid apparently of all else than the ferocious lust to kill and while it was at its height mosar and Bulat slipped unnoticed from the banquet hall to that part of the palace assigned to them during their visit to allur they hastened here were their servants and the lesser warriors of their party who had not been bidden to the feast of Kotan. these were directed quickly to gather together their belongings for immediate departure when all was ready and it did not take long since the warriors of Palyodon require but little impedimenta on the march they moved toward the palace gate suddenly mosar approached his son the princess he whispered we must not leave the city without her she has half the battle for the throne Bulat, now entirely sober demurred he had had enough of fighting and of risk let us get out of allure quickly he urged or we shall have the whole city upon us she would not come without a struggle and that would delay us too long there is plenty of time insisted mosar they are still fighting in the paladonso it will be long before they miss us and with Kotan dead long before any will think to look to the safety of the princess our time is now it is made for us by jad ben otho come reluctantly Bulat followed his father who first instructed the warriors to await them just inside the gateway of the palace rapidly the two approached the quarters of the princess within the entranceway only a handful of warriors were on guard the eunuchs had retired there is fighting in the paladonso mosar announced in feigned excitement as they entered the presence of the guards the king desires you to come at once and has sent us to guard the apartments of the princess make haste he commanded as the men hesitated the warriors knew him and that on the morrow the princess was to be betrothed to Bulat, his son if there was trouble what more natural than that mosar and Bulat should be entrusted with the safety of the princess and then too was not mosar a powerful chief to whose orders disobedience might prove a dangerous thing they were but common fighting men disciplined in the rough school of tribal warfare but they had learned to obey a superior and so they departed for the banquet hall the place where men eat barely waiting until they had disappeared mosar crossed to the hangings at the opposite end of the entrance hall and followed by Bulat, made his way toward the sleeping apartment of olo -a, and a moment later without warning the two men burst in upon the three occupants of the room at sight of them olo -a sprang to her feet what is the meaning of this she demanded angrily mosar advanced and halted before her into his cunning mind had entered a plan to trick her if it succeeded it would prove easier than taking her by force and then his eyes fell upon jane clayton and he almost gasped in astonishment and admiration but he caught himself and returned to the business of the moment Eloa, he cried when you know the urgency of our mission you will forgive us we have sad news for you there has been an uprising in the palace and Kotan the king has been slain the rebels are drunk with liquor and now on their way here we must get you out of allure at once there is not a moment to lose come and quickly my father dead cried Oloa, and suddenly her eyes went wide then my place is here with my people she cried if Kotan is dead i am queen until the warriors choose a new ruler that is the law of Palyodon. and if i am queen none can make me wed whom i do not wish to wed and jad ben otho knows i never wish to wed thy cowardly son go she pointed a slim forefinger imperiously toward the doorway mosar saw that neither trickery nor persuasion would avail now and every precious minute counted he looked again at the beautiful woman who stood beside oloa he had never before seen her but he well knew from palace gossip that she could be no other than the godlike stranger whom Kotan had planned to make his queen Bulat, he cried to his son take you your own woman and i will take mine and with that he sprang suddenly forward and seizing jane about the waist lifted her in his arms so that before oloa or panat lee might even guess his purpose he had disappeared through the hangings near the foot of the dais and was gone with the stranger woman struggling and fighting in his grasp and then Bulat sought to seize oloa but oloa had her panat lee 
fierce little tiger girl of the savage Coriol jaw pan at lee whose name belied her and beulot found that with the two of them his hands were full when he would have lifted oloa and borne her away pan at lee seized him around the legs and strove to drag him down viciously he kicked her but she would not desist and finally realizing that he might not only lose his princess but be so delayed as to invite capture if he did not rid himself of this clawing scratching she jato he hurled oloa to the floor and seizing panat lee by the hair drew his knife and the curtains behind him suddenly parted in two swift bounds a lithe figure crossed the room and before ever the knife of beulot reached its goal his wrist was seized from behind and a terrific blow crashing to the base of his brain dropped him lifeless to the floor beulot coward traitor and assassin died without knowing who struck him down as tarzan of the apes leaped into the pool in the griff pit of the temple of allure one might have accounted for his act on the hypothesis that it was the last blind urge of self-preservation to delay even for a moment the inevitable tragedy in which each some day must play the leading role upon his little stage but no those cool gray eyes had caught the sole possibility for escape that the surroundings and the circumstances offered a tiny moonlit patch of water glimmering through a small aperture in the cliff at the surface of the pool upon its farther side with swift bold strokes he swam for speed alone knowing that the water would in no way deter his pursuer nor did it tarzan heard the great splash as the huge creature plunged into the pool behind him he heard the churning waters as it forged rapidly onward in his wake he was nearing the opening would it be large enough to permit the passage of his body that portion of it which showed above the surface of the water most certainly would not his life then depended on how much of the aperture was submerged and now it was directly before him and the griff directly behind there was no alternative there was no other hope the ape-man threw all the resources of his great strength into the last few strokes extended his hands before him as a cutwater submerged to the water's level and shot forward through the hole frothing with rage was the baffled ludon as he realized how neatly the stranger she had turned his own tables upon him he could of course escape the temple of the griff in which her quick wit had temporarily imprisoned him but during the delay however brief ja don would find time to steal her from the temple and deliver her to kotan but he would have her yet that the high priest swore in the names of jad ben otho and all the demons of his faith he hated kotan secretly he had espoused the cause of mosar in whom he would have a willing tool perhaps then this would give him the opportunity he had long awaited a pretext for inciting the revolt that would dethrone kotan and place mosar in power with ludon the real ruler of pal yul -don he licked his thin lips as he sought the window through which tarzan had entered and now ludon's only avenue of escape cautiously he made his way across the floor feeling before him with his hands and when they discovered that the trap was set for him an ugly snarl broke from the priest's lips the she-devil he muttered but she shall pay she shall pay ah jad ben otho how she shall pay for the trick she has played upon ludon he crawled through the window and climbed easily downward to the ground should he pursue jadon and the woman chancing an encounter with the fierce chief or bide his time until treachery and intrigue should accomplish his design he chose the latter solution as might have been expected of such as he going to his quarters he summoned several of his priests those who were most in his confidence and who shared his ambitions for absolute power of the temple over the palace all men who hated kotan the time has come he told them when the authority of the temple must be placed definitely above that of the palace kotan must make way for mosar for kotan has defied your high priest go then pansat and summon mosar secretly to the temple and you others go to the city and prepare the faithful warriors that they may be in readiness when the time comes for another hour they discussed the details of the coup d'etat that was to overthrow the government of pal yul -don. one knew a slave who as the signal sounded from the temple gong would thrust a knife into the heart of kotan for the price of liberty another held personal knowledge of an officer of the palace that he could use to compel the latter to admit a number of ludon's warriors to various parts of the palace 
with mosar as the cat's paw the plan seemed scarce possible of failure and so they separated going upon their immediate errands to palace and to city as pan sat entered the palace grounds he was aware of a sudden commotion in the direction of the paledonso and a few minutes later ludon was surprised to see him return to the apartments of the high priest breathless and excited what now pan sat cried ludon are you pursued by demons oh master our time has come and gone while we sat here planning Kotan is already dead and mosar fled his friends are fighting with the warriors of the palace but they have no head while jadon leads the others i could learn but little from frightened slaves who had fled at the outburst of the quarrel one told me that bulat had slain the king and that he had seen mosar and the assassin hurrying from the palace jadon muttered the high priest the fools will make him king if we do not act and act quickly get into the city Panzat. let your feet fly and raise the cry that jadon has killed the king and is seeking to wrest the throne from oloa spread the word as you know best how to spread it that jadon has threatened to destroy the priests and hurl the altars of the temple into jad ben lul rouse the warriors of the city and urge them to attack at once lead them into the temple by the secret way that only the priests know and from there we may spew them out upon the palace before they learn the truth go pansat immediately delay not an instant but stay he called as the under priest turned to leave the apartment saw or heard you anything of the strange white woman that jadon stole from the temple of the griff where we have had her imprisoned only that jadon took her into the palace where he threatened the priests with violence if they did not permit him to pass replied pansat this they told me but where within the palace she is hidden i know not Kotan ordered her to the forbidden garden said ludon doubtless we shall find her there and now pansat be upon your errand in a corridor by ludon's chamber a hideously masked priest leaned close to the curtained aperture that led within were he listening he must have heard all that passed between pansat and the high priest and that he had listened was evidenced by his hasty withdrawal to the shadows of a nearby passageway as the lesser priest moved across the chamber toward the doorway pansat went his way in ignorance of the near presence that he almost brushed against as he hurried toward the secret passage that leads from the temple of jad ben otho far beneath the palace to the city beyond nor did he sense the silent creature following in his footsteps end of chapter fifteen read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark dot blogspot dot com chapter sixteen the secret way it was a baffled griff that bellowed in angry rage as tarzan's sleek brown body cutting the moonlit waters shot through the aperture in the wall of the griff pool and out into the lake beyond the ape-man smiled as he thought of the comparative ease with which he had defeated the purpose of the high priest but his face clouded again at the ensuing remembrance of the grave danger that threatened his mate his sole object now must be to return as quickly as he might to the chamber where he had last seen her on the third floor of the temple of the griff but how he was to find his way again into the temple grounds was a question not easy of solution in the moonlight he could see the sheer cliff rising from the water for a great distance along the shore far beyond the precincts of the temple and the palace towering high above him a seemingly impregnable barrier against his return swimming close in he skirted the wall searching diligently for some foothold however slight upon its smooth forbidding surface above him and quite out of reach were numerous apertures but there were no means at hand by which he could reach them presently however his hopes were raised by the sight of an opening level with the surface of the water it lay just ahead and a few strokes brought him to it cautious strokes that brought forth no sound from the yielding waters at the nearer side of the opening he stopped and reconnoitred there was no one in sight carefully he raised his body to the threshold of the entranceway his smooth brown hide glistening in the moonlight as it shed the water in tiny sparkling rivulets 
before him stretched a gloomy corridor unlighted save for the faint illumination of the diffused moonlight that penetrated it for but a short distance from the opening moving as rapidly as reasonable caution warranted tarzan followed the corridor into the bowels of the cave there was an abrupt turn and then a flight of steps at the top of which lay another corridor running parallel with the face of the cliff this passage was dimly lighted by flickering cressets set in niches in the walls at considerable distances apart a quick survey showed the ape-man numerous openings upon each side of the corridor and his quick ears caught sounds that indicated that there were other beings not far distant priests he concluded in some of the apartments letting upon the passageway to pass undetected through this hive of enemies appeared quite beyond the range of possibility he must again seek disguise and knowing from experience how best to secure such he crept stealthily along a corridor toward the nearest doorway like numa the lion stalking a wary prey he crept with quivering nostrils to the hangings that shut off his view from the interior of the apartment beyond a moment later his head disappeared within then his shoulders and his lithe body and the hangings dropped quietly into place again a moment later there filtered into the vacant corridor without a brief gasping gurgle and again silence a minute passed a second and a third and then the hangings were thrust aside and a grimly masked priest of the temple of jad ben otho strode into the passageway with bold steps he moved along and was about to turn into a diverging gallery when his attention was aroused by voices coming from a room upon his left instantly the figure halted and crossing the corridor stood with an ear close to the skins that concealed the occupants of the room from him and him from them presently he leaped back into the concealing shadows of the diverging gallery and immediately thereafter the hangings by which he had been listening parted and a priest emerged to turn quickly down the main corridor the eavesdropper waited until the other had gained a little distance and then stepping from his place of concealment followed silently behind the way led along the corridor which ran parallel with the face of the cliff for some little distance and then pansat taking a cresset from one of the wall niches turned abruptly into a small apartment at his left the tracker followed cautiously in time to see the rays of the flickering light dimly visible from an aperture in the floor before him he found a series of steps similar to those used by the wazdan in scaling the cliff to their caves leading to a lower level first satisfying himself that his guide was continuing upon his way unsuspecting the other descended after him and continued his stealthy stalking the passageway was now both narrow and low giving but bare headroom to a tall man and it was broken often by flights of steps leading all ways downward the steps in each unit seldom numbered more than six and sometimes there was only one or two but in the aggregate the tracker imagined that they had descended between fifty and seventy-five feet from the level of the upper corridor when the passageway terminated in a small apartment at one side of which was a little pile of rubble setting his cresset upon the ground pansat commenced hurriedly to toss the bits of broken stone aside presently revealing a small aperture at the base of the wall upon the opposite side of which there appeared to be a further accumulation of rubble this he also removed until he had a hole of sufficient size to permit the passage of his body and leaving the cresset still burning upon the floor the priest crawled through the opening he had made and disappeared from the sight of the watcher hiding in the shadows of the narrow passageway behind him no sooner however was he safely gone than the other followed finding himself after passing through the hole on a little ledge about halfway between the surface of the lake and the top of the cliff above the ledge inclined steeply upward ending at the rear of a building which stood upon the edge of the cliff and which the second priest entered just in time to see pansat pass out into the city beyond as the latter turned a nearby corner the other emerged from the doorway and quickly surveyed his surroundings he was satisfied the priest who had led him hither had served his purpose in so far as the tracker was concerned above him and perhaps a hundred yards away the white walls of the palace gleamed against the northern sky the time that it had taken him to acquire definite knowledge concerning the secret passageway between the temple and the city he did not count as lost 
though he begrudged every instant that kept him from the prosecution of his main objective it had seemed to him however necessary to the success of a bold plan that he had formulated upon overhearing the conversation between ludon and pansat as he stood without the hangings of the apartment of the high priest alone against a nation of suspicious and half-savage enemies he could scarce hope for a successful outcome to the one great issue upon which hung the life and happiness of the creature he loved best for her sake he must win allies and it was for this purpose that he had sacrificed these precious moments but now he lost no further time in seeking to regain entrance to the palace grounds that he might search out whatever new prison they had found in which to incarcerate his lost love he found no difficulty in passing the guards at the entrance to the palace for as he had guessed his priestly disguise disarmed all suspicion as he approached the warriors he kept his hands behind him and trusted to fate that the sickly light of the single torch which stood beside the doorway would not reveal his unpaluldonian feet as a matter of fact so accustomed were they to the comings and goings of the priesthood that they paid scant attention to him and he passed on into the palace grounds without even a moment's delay his goal now was the forbidden garden and this he had little difficulty in reaching though he elected to enter it over the wall rather than to chance arousing any suspicion on the part of the guards at the inner entrance since he could imagine no reason why a priest should seek entrance there thus late at night he found the garden deserted nor any sign of her he sought that she had been brought hither he had learned from the conversation he had overheard between ludon and pansat and he was sure that there had been no time or opportunity for the high priest to remove her from the palace grounds the garden he knew to be devoted exclusively to the uses of the princess and her women and it was only reasonable to assume therefore that if jane had been brought to the garden it could only have been upon an order from Kotan this being the case the natural assumption would follow that he would find her in some other portion of oloa's quarters just where these lay he could only conjecture but it seemed reasonable to believe that they must be adjacent to the garden so once more he scaled the wall and passing around its end directed his steps toward an entrance way which he judged must lead to that portion of the palace nearest the forbidden garden to his surprise he found the place unguarded and then there fell upon his ear from an interior apartment the sound of voices raised in anger and excitement guided by the sound he quickly traversed several corridors and chambers until he stood before the hangings which separated him from the chamber from which issued the sounds of altercation raising the skins slightly he looked within there were two women battling with a hodon warrior one was the daughter of Kotan, and the other Panat Lee, the Kor Yul Ja. At the moment that Tarzan lifted the hangings, the warrior threw Olo A viciously to the ground, and seizing Panat Lee by the hair, drew his knife and raised it above her head. Casting the encumbering headdress of the dead priest from his shoulders, the ape man leaped across the intervening space, and seizing the brute from behind, struck him a single terrible blow as the man fell forward dead the two women recognized tarzan simultaneously panat lee fell upon her knees and would have bowed her head upon his feet had he not with an impatient gesture commanded her to rise he had no time to listen to their protestations of gratitude or answer the numerous questions which he knew would soon be flowing from these two feminine tongues tell me he cried where is the woman of my own race whom jadan brought here from the temple she is but this moment gone cried oloa mosar the father of this thing here and she indicated the body of bulot with a scornful finger seized her and carried her away which way he cried tell me quickly in what direction he took her that way cried panat lee pointing to the doorway through which mosar had passed they would have taken the princess and the stranger woman to tulur mosar's city by the dark lake i go to find her he said to pan she is my mate and if i survive i shall find means to liberate you too and return you to omat before the girl could reply he had disappeared behind the hangings of the door near the foot of the dais the corridor through which he ran was illy lighted and like nearly all its kind in the hodon city wound in and out and up and down but at last it terminated at a sudden turn which brought him into a courtyard filled with warriors a portion of the palace guard that had just been summoned by one of the lesser palace chiefs 
to join the warriors of Ko Tan in the battle that was raging in the banquet hall. At sight of Tarzan, who in his haste had forgotten to recover his disguising headdress, a great shout arose. Blasphemer! Defiler of the temple! burst hoarsely from savage throats, and mingling with these were a few who cried, Doryolotho, evidencing the fact that there were among them still some who clung to their belief in his divinity to cross the courtyard armed only with a knife in the face of this great throng of savage fighting men seemed even to the giant ape-man a thing impossible of achievement he must use his wits now and quickly too for they were closing upon him he might have turned and fled back through the corridor but flight now even in the face of dire necessity would but delay him in his pursuit of mosar and his mate stop he cried raising his palm against them i am the dor ul otho and i come to you with a word from jadon who it is my father's will shall be your king now that ko tan is slain ludon the high priest has planned to seize the palace and destroy the loyal warriors that mosar may be made king mosar who will be the tool and creature of ludon follow me there is no time to lose if you would prevent the traitors whom ludon has organized in the city from entering the palace by a secret way and overpowering jadon and the faithful band within for a moment they hesitated at last one spoke what guarantee have we he demanded that it is not you who would betray us and by leading us now away from the fighting in the banquet hall cause those who fight at jadon's side to be defeated my life will be your guarantee replied tarzan if you find that i have not spoken the truth you are sufficient in numbers to execute whatever penalty you choose but come there is not time to lose already are the lesser priests gathering their warriors in the city below and without waiting for any further parley he strode directly toward them in the direction of the gate upon the opposite side of the courtyard which led toward the principal entrance to the palace ground slower in wit than he they were swept away by his greater initiative and that compelling power which is inherent to all natural leaders and so they followed him the giant ape-man with a dead tail dragging the ground behind him a demi-god where another would have been ridiculous out into the city he led them and down toward the unpretentious building that hid ludon's secret passageway from the city to the temple and as they rounded the last turn they saw before them a gathering of warriors which was being rapidly augmented from all directions as the traitors of allure mobilized at the call of the priesthood you spoke the truth stranger said the chief who marched at tarzan's side for there are warriors with the priests among them even as you told us and now replied the ape-man that i have fulfilled my promise i will go my way after mosar who has done me a great wrong tell jadon that jad ben otho is upon his side nor do you forget to tell him also it was the dor ul otho who thwarted ludon's plan to seize the palace i will not forget replied the chief go your way we are enough to overpower the traitors tell me asked tarzan how may i know this city of tulur it lies upon the south shore of the second lake below alur replied the chief the lake that is called jadin lul they were now approaching the band of traitors who evidently thought that this was another contingent of their own party since they made no effort either toward defence or retreat suddenly the chief raised his voice in a savage war cry that was immediately taken up by his followers and simultaneously as though the cry were a command the entire party broke into a mad charge upon the surprised rebels satisfied with the outcome of his suddenly conceived plan and sure that it would work to the disadvantage of ludon tarzan turned into a side street and pointed his steps toward the outskirts of the city in search of the trail that led southward toward Tulur. End of chapter 16 Read by Don W. Jenkins Rancho San Diego, California Shaggybark.blogspot.com Chapter 17 By Jadbal Lull As Mosar carried Jane Clayton from the palace of Khotan the king, the woman struggled incessantly to regain her freedom he tried to compel her to walk but despite his threats and his abuse she would not voluntarily take a single step in the direction in which he wished her to go 
instead she threw herself to the ground each time he sought to place her upon her feet and so of necessity he was compelled to carry her though at last he tied her hands and gagged her to save himself from further lacerations for the beauty and slenderness of the woman belied her strength and courage when he came at last to where his men had gathered he was glad indeed to turn her over to a couple of stalwart warriors but these too were forced to carry her since mosar's fear of the vengeance of ko tan's retainers would brook no delays and thus they came down out of the hills from which allure is carved to the meadows that skirt the lower end of jad ben lul with jane clayton carried between two of mosar's men at the edge of the lake lay a fleet of strong canoes hollowed from the trunks of trees their bows and sterns carved in the semblance of grotesque beasts or birds and vividly coloured by some master in that primitive school of art which fortunately is not without its devotees to-day into the stern of one of these canoes the warriors tossed their captive at a sign from mosar who came and stood beside her as the warriors were finding their places in the canoes and selecting their paddles come beautiful one he said let us be friends and you shall not be harmed you will find mosar a kind master if you do his bidding and thinking to make a good impression on her he removed the gag from her mouth and the thongs from her wrists knowing well that she could not escape surrounded as she was by his warriors and presently when they were out on the lake she would be as safely imprisoned as though he held her behind bars and so the fleet moved off to the accompaniment of the gentle splashing of a hundred paddles to follow the windings of the rivers and lakes through which the waters of the valley of jad ben otho empty into the great morass to the south the warriors resting upon one knee faced the bow and in the last canoe mosar tiring of his fruitless attempts to win responses from his sullen captive squatted in the bottom of the canoe with his back toward her and resting his head upon the gunwale sought sleep thus they moved in silence between the verdure clad banks of the little river through which the waters of jad ben lul emptied now in the moonlight now in dense shadow where great trees overhung the stream and at last out upon the waters of another lake the black shores of which seemed far away under the weird influence of a moonlight night jane clayton sat alert in the stern of the last canoe for months she had been under constant surveillance the prisoner first of one ruthless race and now the prisoner of another since the long-gone day that hauptmann fritz schneider and his band of native german troops had treacherously wrought the kaiser's work of rapine and destruction on the greystoke bungalow and carried her away to captivity she had not drawn a free breath that she had survived unharmed the countless dangers through which she had passed she attributed solely to the beneficence of a kind and watchful providence at first she had been held on the orders of the german high command with a view of her ultimate value as a hostage and during these months she had been subjected to neither hardship nor oppression but when the germans had become hard pressed toward the close of their unsuccessful campaign in east africa it had been determined to take her further into the interior and now there was an element of revenge in their motives since it must have been apparent that she could no longer be of any possible military value bitter indeed were the germans against that half-savage mate of hers who had cunningly annoyed and harassed them with a fiendishness of persistence and ingenuity that had resulted in a noticeable loss in morale in the sector he had chosen for his operations they had to charge against him the lives of certain officers that he had deliberately taken with his own hands and one entire section of trench that had made possible a disastrous turning movement by the british tarzan had outgeneraled them at every point he had met cunning with cunning and cruelty with cruelties until they feared and loathed his very name the cunning trick that they had played upon him in destroying his home murdering his retainers and covering the abduction of his wife in such a way as to lead him to believe that she had been killed they had regretted a thousand times for a thousandfold had they paid the price for their senseless ruthlessness and now unable to wreak their vengeance directly upon him they had conceived the idea of inflicting further suffering upon his mate in sending her into the interior to avoid the path of the victorious british they had chosen as her escort lieutenant eric obergatz 
who had been second in command of schneider's company and who alone of its officers had escaped the consuming vengeance of the ape-man for a long time obergatz had held her in a native village the chief of which was still under the domination of his fear of the ruthless german oppressors while here only hardships and discomforts assailed her obergatz himself being held in leash by the orders of his distant superior but as time went on the life in the village grew to be a veritable hell of cruelties and oppressions practised by the arrogant prussian upon the villagers and the members of his native command for time hung heavily upon the hands of the lieutenant and with idleness combining with the personal discomforts he was compelled to endure his none too agreeable temper found an outlet first in petty interference with the chiefs and later in the practice of absolute cruelties upon them what the self-sufficient german could not see was plain to jane clayton that the sympathies of obergatz native soldiers lay with the villagers and that all were so heartily sickened by his abuse that it needed now but the slightest spark to detonate the mine of revenge and hatred that the pig-headed hun had been assiduously fabricating beneath his own person and at last it came but from an unexpected source in the form of a german native deserter from the theatre of war footsore weary and spent he dragged himself into the village late one afternoon and before obergatz was even aware of his presence the whole village knew that the power of germany in africa was at an end it did not take long for the lieutenant's native soldiers to realize that the authority that held them in service no longer existed and that with it had gone the power to pay them their miserable wage or at least so they reasoned to them obergatz no longer represented aught else than a powerless and hated foreigner and short indeed would have been his shrift had not a native woman who had conceived a dog-like affection for jane clayton hurried to her with word of the murderous plan for the fate of the innocent white woman lay in the balance beside that of the guilty teuton already they are quarrelling as to which one shall possess you she told jane when will they come for us asked jane did you hear them say to-night replied the woman for even now that he has none to fight for him they still fear the white men and so they will come at night and kill him while he sleeps jane thanked the woman and sent her away lest the suspicion of her fellows be aroused against her when they discovered that the two whites had learned of their intentions the woman went at once to the hut occupied by obergatz she had never gone there before and the german looked up in surprise as he saw who his visitor was briefly she told him what she had heard at first he was inclined to bluster arrogantly with a great display of bravado but she silenced him peremptorily such talk is useless she said shortly you have brought upon yourself the just hatred of these people regardless of the truth or falsity of the report which has been brought to them they believe in it and there is nothing now between you and your maker other than flight we shall both be dead before morning if we are unable to escape from the village unseen if you go to them now with your silly protestations of authority you will be dead a little sooner that is all you think it as bad as that he said a noticeable alteration in his tone and manner it is precisely as i have told you she replied they will come to-night and kill you while you sleep find me pistols and a rifle and ammunition and we will pretend that we go into the jungle to hunt that you have done often perhaps it will arouse suspicion that i accompany you but we must chance and be sure my dear herr lieutenant to bluster and curse and abuse your servants unless they note a change in your manner and realizing your fear know that you suspect their intention if all goes well then we can go out into the jungle to hunt and we need not return but first and now you must swear never to harm me or otherwise it would be better that i called the chief and turned you over to him and then put a bullet into my own head for unless you swear as i have asked i were no better alone in the jungle with you than here at the mercies of these degraded blacks i swear he replied solemnly in the names of my god and my kaiser that no harm shall befall you at my hands lady greystoke very well she said we will make this pact to assist each other to return to civilization but let it be understood that there is and never can be any semblance even of respect for you upon my part i am drowning and you are the straw carry that always in your mind german if obergatz had held any doubt as to the sincerity of her word it would have been wholly dissipated by the scathing contempt of her tone 
and so obergatz without further parley got pistols and an extra rifle for jane as well as bandoliers of cartridges in his usual arrogant and disagreeable manner he called his servants telling them that he and the white collie were going out into the brush to hunt the beaters would go north as far as the little hill and then circle back to the east and in toward the village the gun carriers he directed to take the extra pieces and proceed himself and jane slowly toward the east waiting for them at the ford about half a mile distance the blacks responded with greater alacrity than usual and it was noticeable to both jane and obergatz that they left the village whispering and laughing the swine think it is a great joke growled obergatz that the afternoon before i die i go out and hunt meat for them as soon as the gun-bearers disappeared into the jungle beyond the village the two europeans followed along the same trail nor was there any attempt upon the part of obergatz native soldiers or the warriors of the chief to detain them for they too doubtless were more than willing that the whites should bring them in one more mess of meat before they killed them a quarter of a mile from the village obergatz turned toward the south from the trail that led to the ford and hurrying onward the two put as great a distance as possible between them and the village before night fell they knew from the habits of their erstwhile hosts that there was little danger of pursuit by night since the villagers held numa the lion in too great respect to venture needlessly beyond their stockade during the hours that the king of beasts was prone to choose for hunting and thus began a seemingly endless sequence of frightful days and horror-laden nights as the two fought their way toward the south in the face of almost inconceivable hardships privations and dangers the east coast was nearer but obergatz positively refused to chance throwing himself into the hands of the british by returning to the territory which they now controlled insisting instead upon attempting to make his way through an unknown wilderness to south africa where among the boers he was convinced he would find willing sympathizers who would find some way to return him in safety to germany and the woman was perforce compelled to accompany him and so they had crossed the great thorny waterless steppe and come at last to the edge of the morass before paul yuldan they had reached this point just before the rainy season when the waters of the morass were at their lowest ebb at this time a hard crust is baked upon the dried surface of the marsh and there is only the open water at the centre to materially impede progress it is a condition that exists perhaps not more than a few weeks or even days at the termination of long periods of drought and so the two crossed the otherwise almost impassable barrier without realizing its latent horrors even the open water in the centre chanced to be deserted at the time by its frightful denizens which the drought and the receding waters had driven southward toward the mouth of pal Yuldan's largest river which carries the waters out of the valley of jad ben otho their wanderings carried them across the mountains and into the valley of jad ben otho at the source of one of the larger streams which bears the mountain waters down into the valley to empty them into the main river just below the great lake on whose northern shores lies allure as they had come down out of the mountains they had been surprised by a party of hodon hunters obergatz had escaped while jane had been taken prisoner and brought to allure she had neither seen nor heard aught of the german since that time and she did not know whether he had perished in this strange land or succeeded in successfully eluding its savage denizens and making his way at last into south africa for her part she had been incarcerated alternately in the palace and the temple as either Kotan or ludon succeeded in wresting her temporarily from the other by various strokes of cunning and intrigue and now at last she was in the power of a new captor one whom she knew from the gossip of the temple and the palace to be cruel and degraded and she was in the stern of the last canoe and every enemy back was toward her while almost at her feet mosar's loud snores gave ample evidence of his unconsciousness to his immediate surroundings the dark shore loomed closer to the south as jane clayton lady greystoke slid quietly over the stern of the canoe into the chill waters of the lake she scarcely moved other than to keep her nostrils above the surface while the canoe was yet discernible in the last rays of the declining moon then she struck out toward the southern shore alone unarmed all but naked in a country overrun by savage beasts and hostile men she yet felt for the first time in many months a sensation of elation and relief she was free what if the next moment brought death she knew again at least a brief instant of absolute freedom 
her blood tingled to the almost forgotten sensation and it was with difficulty that she restrained a glad triumphant cry as she clambered from the quiet waters and stood upon the silent beach before her loomed a forest darkly and from its depths came those nameless sounds that are a part of the night life of the jungle the rustling of leaves in the wind the rubbing together of contiguous branches the scurrying of a rodent all magnified by the darkness to sinister and awe-inspiring proportions the hoot of an owl the distant scream of a great cat the barking of wild dogs attested the presence of the myriad life she could not see the savage life the free life of which she was now a part and then there came to her possibly for the first time since the giant ape-man had come into her life a fuller realization of what the jungle meant to him for though alone and unprotected from its hideous danger she yet felt its lure upon her and an exaltation that she had not dared hope to feel again ah if that mighty mate of hers were but by her side what utter joy and bliss would be hers she longed for no more than this the parade of cities the comforts and luxuries of civilization held forth no allure half as insistent as the glorious freedom of the jungle a lion moaned in the blackness to her right eliciting delicious thrills that crept along her spine the hair at the back of her head seemed to stand erect yet she was unafraid the muscles bequeathed her by some primordial ancestor reacted instinctively to the presence of an ancient enemy that was all the woman moved slowly and deliberately toward the wood again the lion moaned this time nearer she sought a low-hanging branch and finding it swung easily into the friendly shelter of the tree the long and perilous journey with obergatz had trained her muscles and her nerves to such unaccustomed habits she found a safe resting place such as tarzan had taught her was best and there she curled herself thirty feet above the ground for a night's rest she was cold and uncomfortable and yet she slept for her heart was warm with renewed hope and her tired brain had found temporary surcease from worry she slept until the heat of the sun high in the heavens awakened her she was rested and now her body as well as her heart was warm a sensation of ease and comfort and happiness pervaded her being she rose upon her gently swaying couch and stretched luxuriously her naked limbs and lithe body modelled by the sunlight filtering through the foliage above combined with the lazy gesture to impart to her appearance something of the leopard with careful eyes she scrutinized the ground below and with attentive ear she listened for any warning sound that might suggest the near presence of enemies either man or beast satisfied at last that there was nothing close of which she need have fear she clambered to the ground she wished to bathe but the lake was too exposed and just a bit too far from the safety of the trees for her to risk it until she became more familiar with her surroundings she wandered aimlessly through the forest searching for food which she found in abundance she ate and rested for she had no objective as yet her freedom was too new to be spoiled by plannings for the future the haunts of civilized man seemed to her now as vague and unattainable as the half-forgotten substance of a dream if she could but live on here in peace waiting waiting for him it was the old hope revived she knew that he would come some day if he lived she had always known that though recently she had believed that he would come too late if he lived yes he would come if he lived and if he did not live she were as well off here as elsewhere for then nothing mattered only to wait for the end as patiently as might be her wanderings brought her to a crystal brook and there she drank and bathed beneath an overhanging tree that offered her quick asylum in the event of danger it was a quiet and beautiful spot and she loved it from the first the bottom of the brook was paved with pretty stones and bits of glassy obsidian as she gathered a handful of the pebbles and held them up to look at them she noticed that one of her fingers was bleeding from a clean straight cut she felt a searching for the cause and presently discovered it in one of the fragments of volcanic glass which revealed an edge that was almost razor-like jane clayton was elated here god given to her hands was the first beginning with which she might eventually arrive at both weapons and tools a cutting edge everything was possible to him who possessed it nothing without she sought until she had collected many of the precious bits of stone until the pouch that hung at her right side was almost filled 
then she climbed into the great tree to examine them at leisure there were some that looked like knife blades and some that could easily be fashioned into spearheads and many smaller ones that nature seemed to have intended for the tips of savage arrows the spear she would essay first that would be easiest there was a hollow in the bowl of the tree and a great crotch high above the ground here she cached all of her treasure except a single knife-like sliver with this she descended to the ground and searching out a slender sapling that grew arrow straight she hacked and sawed until she could break it off without splitting the wood it was just the right diameter for the shaft of a spear a hunting spear such as her beloved waziri had liked best how often had she watched them fashioning them and they had taught her how to use them too them and the heavy war spears laughing and clapping their hands as her proficiency increased she knew the arborescent grasses that yielded the longest and toughest fibers and these she sought and carried to her tree with the spear shaft that was to be clambering to her crotch she bent to her work humming softly a little tune she caught herself and smiled it was the first time in all these bitter months that song had passed her lips or such a smile i feel she sighed i almost feel that john is near my john my tarzan she cut the spear shaft to the proper length and removed the twigs and branches and the bark whittling and scraping at the nubs until the surface was all smooth and straight then she split one end and inserted a spear point shaping the wood until it fitted perfectly this done she laid the shaft aside and fell to splitting the thick grass stems and pounding and twisting them until she had separated and partially cleaned the fibres these she took down to the brook and washed and brought back again and wound tightly around the cleft end of the shaft which she had notched to receive them and the upper part of the spearhead which she had also notched slightly with a bit of stone it was a crude spear but the best that she could attain in so short a time later she promised herself she would have others many of them and they would be spears of which even the greatest of the waziri spearmen might be proud End of chapter 17 Read by Don W. Jenkins Rancho San Diego, California Shaggybark.blogspot.com Chapter 18 The Lion Pit of Tulur Though Tarzan searched the outskirts of the city until nearly dawn, he discovered nowhere the spore of his mate the breeze coming down from the mountains brought to his nostrils a diversity of scents but there was not among them the slightest suggestion of her whom he sought the natural deduction was therefore that she had been taken in some other direction in his search he had many times crossed the fresh tracks of many men leading toward the lake and these he concluded had probably been made by jane clayton's abductors it had only been to minimize the chance of error by the process of elimination that he had carefully reconnoitered every other avenue leading from Alur toward the southeast where lay Mosar's city of Tulur, and now he followed the trail to the shores of Jad ben Lul, where the party had embarked upon the quiet waters in their sturdy canoes. He found many other craft of the same description moored along the shore, and one of these he commandeered for the purpose of pursuit it was daylight when he passed through the lake which lies next below jad ben lul and paddling strongly passed within sight of the very tree in which his lost mate lay sleeping had the gentle wind that caressed the bosom of the lake been blowing from a southerly direction the giant ape-man and jane clayton would have been reunited then but an unkind fate had willed otherwise and the opportunity passed with the passing of his canoe which presently his powerful strokes carried out of sight into the stream at the lower end of the lake following the winding river which bore a considerable distance to the north before doubling back to empty into the jad ben lul the ape-man missed a portage that would have saved him hours of paddling it was at the upper end of this portage where mosar and his warriors had debarked that the chief discovered the absence of his captive as mosar had been asleep since shortly after their departure from Alur, and as none of the warriors recalled when she had last been seen it was impossible to conjecture with any degree of accuracy the place where she had escaped 
the consensus of opinion was however that it had been in the narrow river connecting jad ben lul with the lake next below it which is called jad bal lul which freely translated means the lake of gold mosar had been very wroth and having himself been the only one at fault he naturally sought with great diligence to fix the blame upon another he would have returned in search of her had he not feared to meet a pursuing company dispatched either by ja don or the high priest both of whom he knew had just grievances against him he would not even spare a boatload of his warriors from his own protection to return in quest of the fugitive but hastened onward with as little delay as possible across the portage and out upon the waters of jad in lul the morning sun was just touching the high domes of tulur when mosar's paddlers brought their canoes against the shore at that city's edge safe once more behind his own walls and protected by many warriors the courage of the chief returned sufficiently at least to permit him to dispatch three canoes in search of jane clayton and also to go as far as allure if possible to learn what had delayed Bulot, whose failure to reach the canoes with the balance of the party at the time of the flight from the northern city had in no way delayed mosar's departure his own safety being of far greater moment than that of his son as the three canoes reached the portage on their return journey the warriors who were dragging them from the water were suddenly startled by the appearance of two priests carrying a light canoe in the direction of jadin lul at first they thought them the advance guard of a larger force of ludon's followers although the correctness of such a theory was belied by their knowledge that the priests never accepted the risks or perils of a warrior's vocation nor even fought until driven into a corner and forced to do so secretly the warriors of pal yul -don held the emasculated priesthood in contempt and so instead of immediately taking up the offensive as they would have had the two men been warriors from allure instead of priests they waited to question them at sight of the warriors the priests made the sign of peace and upon being asked if they were alone they answered in the affirmative the leader of mosar's warriors permitted them to approach what do you hear he asked in the country of mosar so far from your own city we carry a message from ludon the high priest to mosar explained one is it a message of peace or of war asked the warrior it is an offer of peace replied the priest and ludon is sending no warriors behind you queried the fighting man we are alone the priest assured him none in allure save ludon knows that we have come upon this errand then go your way said the warrior who is that asked one of the priests suddenly pointing toward the upper end of the lake at the point where the river from jad bal lul entered it all eyes turned in the direction that he had indicated to see a lone warrior paddling rapidly into jad in lul the prow of his canoe pointing toward Tulur. The warriors and the priests drew into the concealment of the bushes on either side of the portage. "'It is the terrible man who called himself the Dor Yolotho, whispered one of the priests. "'I would know that figure among a great multitude as far as I could see it.' "'You are right, priest,' cried one of the warriors, who had seen Tarzan the day that he had first entered Kotan's palace. "'It is indeed he who has been rightly called Tarzan Jadguru listen priests cried the leader of the party you are two paddles in a light canoe easily you can reach to lure ahead of him and warn mosar of his coming for he has but only entered the lake for a moment the priests demurred for they had no stomach for an encounter with this terrible man but the warrior insisted and even went so far as to threaten them their canoe was taken from them and pushed into the lake and they were all but lifted bodily from their feet and put aboard it still protesting they were shoved out upon the water where they were immediately in full view of the lone paddler above them now there was no alternative the city of Tulur offered the only safety and bending to their paddles the two priests sent their craft swiftly in the direction of the city the warriors withdrew again to the concealment of the foliage if tarzan had seen them and should come hither to investigate there were thirty of them against one and naturally they had no fear of the outcome but they did not consider it necessary to go out upon the lake to meet him since they had been sent to look for the escaped prisoner and not to intercept the strange warrior the stories of whose ferocity and prowess doubtless helped them to arrive at their decision to provoke no uncalled-for quarrel with him if he had seen them he gave no sign but continued paddling steadily and strongly toward the city 
nor did he increase his speed as the two priests shot out in full view the moment the priest's canoe touched the shore by the city its occupants leaped out and hurried swiftly toward the palace gate casting affrighted glances behind them they sought immediate audience with mosar after warning the warriors on guard that tarzan was approaching they were conducted at once to the chief whose court was a smaller replica of that of the king of alur we come from ludon the high priest explained the spokesman he wishes the friendship of mosar who has always been his friend jadon is gathering warriors to make himself king throughout the villages of the hodon are thousands who will obey the commands of ludon the high priest only with ludon's assistance can mosar become king and the message from ludon is that if mosar would retain the friendship of ludon he must return immediately the woman he took from the quarters of the princess olaa at this juncture a warrior entered his excitement was evident the dor ul otha has come to tulur and demands to see mosar at once he said the dor ul otho exclaimed mosar that is the message he sent replied the warrior and indeed he is not as are the people of pal ul don he is we think the same of whom the warriors that returned from alur to-day told us and whom some call tarzan jad guru and some dor ul otho but indeed only the son of god would dare come thus alone to a strange city so it must be that he speaks the truth mosar his heart filled with terror and indecision turned questioningly toward the priests receive him graciously mosar counselled he who had spoken before his advice prompted by the petty shrewdness of his defective brain which under the added influence of ludon's tutorage leaned always toward duplicity receive him graciously and when he is quite convinced of your friendship he will be off his guard and then you may do with him as you will but if possible mosar and you would win the undying gratitude of ludon the high priest save him alive for my master mosar nodded understandingly and turning to the warrior commanded that he conduct the visitor to him we must not be seen by the creature said one of the priests give us your answer to ludon mosar and we will go our way tell ludon cried the chief that the woman would have been lost to him entirely had it not been for me i sought to bring her to tulur that i might save her for him from the clutches of jadon but during the night she escaped tell ludon that i have sent thirty warriors to search for her it is strange you did not see them as you came we did replied the priests but they told us nothing of the purpose of their journey it is as i have told you said mosar and if they find her assure your master that she will be kept unharmed in tulur for him also tell him that i will send my warriors to join with his against jadon whenever he sends word that he wants them now go for tarzan jadguru will soon be here he signalled to a slave lead the priest to the temple he commanded and ask the high priest of tulur to see that they are fed and permitted to return to alur when they will the two priests were conducted from the apartment by the slave through a doorway other than that at which they had entered and a moment later tarzan jadguru strode into the presence of mosar ahead of the warrior whose duty it had been to conduct and announce him the ape-man made no sign of greeting or of peace but strode directly toward the chief who only by the exertion of his utmost powers of will hid the terror that was in his heart at the sight of the giant figure and the scowling face i am the dor ul otho said the ape-man in level tones that carried to the mind of mosar a suggestion of cold steel i am dor ul otho and i come to tulur for the woman you stole from the apartments of o lo a the princess the very boldness of tarzan's entry into this hostile city had had the effect of giving him a great moral advantage over mosar and the savage warriors who stood upon either side of the chief truly it seemed to them that no other than the son of jad ben otho would dare so heroic an act would any mortal warrior act thus boldly and alone enter the presence of a powerful chief and in the midst of a score of warriors arrogantly demand an accounting no it was beyond reason mosar was faltering in his decision to betray the stranger by seeming friendliness he even paled to a sudden thought jad ben otho knew everything even our inmost thoughts was it not therefore possible that this creature 
if after all it should prove true that he was the dor ul otho might even now be reading the wicked design that the priests had implanted in the brain of mosar and which he had entertained so favourably the chief squirmed and fidgeted upon the bench of hewn rock that was his throne quick snapped the ape-man where is she she is not here cried mosar you lie replied tarzan as jad ben otho is my witness she is not in Tulur, insisted the chief you may search the palace and the temple and the entire city but you will not find her for she is not here where is she then demanded the ape-man you took her from the palace at alur if she is not here where is she tell me not that harm has befallen her and he took a sudden threatening step toward mosar that sent the chief shrinking back in terror wait he cried if you are indeed the dor ul otho you will know that i speak the truth i took her from the palace of Kotan to save her for ludon the high priest lest with Kotan dead jadon seize her but during the night she escaped from me between here and allure and i have but just sent three canoes full manned in search of her something in the chief's tone and the manner assured the ape-man that he spoke in part the truth and that once again he had braved incalculable dangers and suffered loss of time futilely what wanted the priests of ludon that preceded me here demanded tarzan chancing a shrewd guess that the two he had seen paddling so frantically to avoid a meeting with him had indeed come from the high priest of allur they come upon an errand similar to yours replied mosar to demand the return of the woman whom ludon thought i had stolen from him thus wronging me as deeply o dor ul otho as have you i would question the priests said tarzan bring them hither his peremptory and arrogant manner left mosar in doubt as to whether to be more incensed or terrified but ever as is the way with such as he he concluded that the first consideration was his own safety if he could transfer the attention and the wrath of this terrible man from himself to ludon's priests it would more than satisfy him and if they should conspire to harm him then mosar would be safe in the eyes of jad ben otho if it finally developed that the stranger was in reality the son of god he felt uncomfortable in tarzan's presence and this fact rather accentuated his doubt for thus indeed would mortal feel in the presence of a god now he saw a way to escape at least temporarily i will fetch them myself dor ul otho he said and turning left the apartment his hurried steps brought him quickly to the temple for the palace grounds of Tulur, which also included the temple as in all of the hodon cities covered a much smaller area than those of the larger city of alur he found ludon's messengers with the high priest of his own temple and quickly transmitted to them the commands of the ape-man what do you intend to do with him asked one of the priests i have no quarrel with him replied mosar he came in peace and he may depart in peace for who knows but that he is indeed the dor ul otho we know that he is not replied ludon's emissary we have every proof that he is only mortal a strange creature from another country already has ludon offered his life to jad ben otho if he is wrong in his belief that this creature is not the son of god if the high priest of allur who is the highest priest of all the high priests of pal ul don is thus so sure that the creature is an impostor as to stake his life upon his judgment then who are we to give credence to the claims of this stranger no mosar you need not fear him he is only a warrior who may be overcome with the same weapons that subdue your own fighting men were it not for ludon's command that he be taken alive i would urge you to set your warriors upon him and slay him but the commands of ludon are the commands of jad ben otho himself and those we may not disobey but still the remnant of a doubt stirred within the cowardly breast of mosar urging him to let another take the initiative against the stranger he is yours then he replied to do with as you will i have no quarrel with him what you may command shall be the command of ludon the high priest and further than that i shall have nothing to do in the matter the priests turned to him who guided the destinies of the temple at Tulur. have you no plan they asked high indeed will he stand in the councils of ludon and in the eyes of jad ben otho who finds the means to capture this impostor alive there is the lion pit whispered the high priest it is now vacant and what will hold ja and jato will hold this stranger if he is not the dor ul otho 
it will hold him said mosar doubtless too it would hold a griff but first you have to get the griff into it the priest pondered this bit of wisdom thoughtfully and then one of those from allure spoke it should not be difficult he said if we use the wits that jad ben otho gave us instead of the worldly muscles which were handed down to us from our fathers and our mothers and which have not even the power possessed by those of the beasts that run about on four feet ledon matched his wits with the stranger and lost suggested mosar but this is your own affair carry it out as you see best at allure khotan made much of this doryul otho and the priests conducted him through the temple it would arouse in his mind no suspicion were you to do the same and let the high priest of Tulur invite him to the temple and gathering all the priests make a great show of belief in his kinship to jad ben otho and what more natural then than that the high priest should wish to show him through the temple as did ludon at allure when khotan commanded it and if by chance he should be led through the lion pit it would be a simple matter for those who bear the torches to extinguish them suddenly and before the stranger was aware of what had happened the stone gates could be dropped thus safely securing him but there are windows in the pit that let in light interposed the high priest and even though the torches were extinguished he could still see and might escape before the stone door could be lowered send one who will cover the windows tightly with hides said the priest from allure the plan is a good one said mosar seeing an opportunity for entirely eliminating himself from any suspicion of complicity for it will require the presence of no warriors and thus with only priests about him his mind will entertain no suspicion of harm they were interrupted at this point by a messenger from the palace who brought word that the doryul otho was becoming impatient and that if the priests from allure were not brought to him at once he would come himself to the temple and get them mosar shook his head he could not conceive of such brazen courage in mortal breast and glad he was that the plan evolved for tarzan's undoing did not necessitate his active participation and so while mosar left for a secret corner of the palace by a roundabout way three priests were dispatched to tarzan and with whining words that did not entirely deceive him they acknowledged his kinship to jad ben otho and begged him in the name of the high priest to honor the temple with a visit when the priests from allure would be brought to him and would answer any questions that he put to them confident that a continuation of his bravado would best serve his purpose and also that if suspicion against him should crystallize into conviction on the part of mosar and his followers that he would be no worse off in the temple than in the palace the ape-man haughtily accepted the invitation of the high priest and so he came into the temple and was received in a manner befitting his high claims he questioned the two priests of allure from whom he obtained only a repetition of the story that mosar had told him and then the high priest invited him to inspect the temple they took him first to the altar of court of which there was only one in tulur it was almost identical in every respect with those at allure there was a bloody altar at the east end and the drowning basin at the west and the grisly fringes upon the headdresses of the priests attested the fact that the eastern altar was an active force in the rites of the temple through the chambers and corridors beneath they led him and finally with torch-bearers to light their steps into a damp and gloomy labyrinth at a low level and here in a large chamber the air of which was still heavy with the odor of lions the crafty priests of Tulur encompassed their shrewd design the torches were suddenly extinguished there was a hurried confusion of bare feet moving rapidly across the stone floor there was a loud crash as of a heavy weight of stone falling upon stone and then surrounding the ape-man naught but the darkness and the silence of the tomb end of chapter eighteen read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark dot blogspot dot com chapter nineteen diana of the jungle jane had made her first kill and she was very proud of it it was not a very formidable animal only a hare but it marked an epoch in her existence just as in the dim past the first hunter had shaped the destinies of mankind so it seemed that this event might shape hers in some new mould 
no longer was she dependent upon the wild fruits and vegetables for sustenance now she might command meat the giver of the strength and endurance she would require successfully to cope with the necessities of her primitive existence the next step was fire she might learn to eat raw flesh as had her lord and master but she shrank from that the thought even was repulsive she had however a plan for fire she had given the matter thought but had been too busy to put it into execution so long as fire could be of no immediate use to her now it was different she had something to cook and her mouth watered for the flesh of her kill she would grill it above glowing embers jane hastened to her tree among the treasures she had gathered in the bed of the stream were several pieces of volcanic glass clear as crystal she sought until she had found the one in mind which was convex then she hurried to the ground and gathered a little pile of powdered bark that was very dry and some dead leaves and grasses that had lain long in the hot sun near at hand she arranged a supply of dead twigs and branches small and large vibrant with suppressed excitement she held the bit of glass above the tinder moving it slowly until she had focused the sun's rays upon a tiny spot she waited breathlessly how slow it was were her high hopes to be dashed in spite of all her clever planning no a thin thread of smoke rose gracefully into the quiet air presently the tinder glowed and broke suddenly into flame jane clasped her hands beneath her chin with a little gurgling exclamation of delight she had achieved fire she piled on twigs and then larger branches and at last dragged a small log to the flames and pushed an end of it into the fire which was crackling merrily it was the sweetest sound that she had heard for many a month but she could not wait for the mass of embers that would be required to cook her hair as quickly as might be she skinned and cleaned her kill burying the hide and entrails that she had learned from tarzan it served two purposes one was the necessity for keeping a sanitary camp and the other the obliteration of the scent that most quickly attracts the man-eaters then she ran a stick through the carcass and held it above the flames by turning it often she prevented burning and at the same time permitted the meat to cook thoroughly all the way through when it was done she scampered high into the safety of her tree to enjoy her meal in quiet and peace never thought lady greystoke had aught more delicious passed her lips she patted her spear affectionately it had brought her this toothsome dainty and with it a feeling of greater confidence and safety than she had enjoyed since that frightful day that she and obergatz had spent their last cartridge she would never forget that day it had seemed one hideous succession of frightful beast after frightful beast they had not been long in this strange country yet they thought that they were hardened to dangers for daily they had had encounters with ferocious creatures but this day she shuddered when she thought of it and with her last cartridge she had killed a black and yellow striped lion thing with great sabre teeth just as it was about to spring upon obergatz who had futilely emptied his rifle into it the last shot his final cartridge for another day they had carried the now useless rifles but at last they had discarded them and thrown away the cumbersome bandoliers as well how they had managed to survive during the ensuing week she could never quite understand and then the hodon had come upon them and captured her obergatz had escaped she was living it all over again doubtless he was dead unless he had been able to reach this side of the valley which was quite evidently less overrun with savage beasts jane's days were very full ones now and the daylight hours seemed all too short in which to accomplish the many things she had determined upon since she had concluded that this spot presented as ideal a place as she could find to live until she could fashion the weapons she considered necessary for the obtaining of meat and for self-defence she felt that she must have in addition to a good spear a knife and a bow and arrows possibly when these had been achieved she might seriously consider an attempt to fight her way to one of civilization's nearest outposts in the meantime it was necessary to construct some sort of protective shelter in which she might feel a greater sense of security by night for she knew that there was a possibility that any night she might receive a visit from a prowling panther 
although she had as yet seen none upon this side of the valley aside from this danger she felt comparatively safe in her aerial retreat the cutting of the long poles for her home occupied all of the daylight hours that were not engaged in the search for food these poles she carried high into her tree and with them constructed a flooring across two stout branches binding the poles together and also to the branches with fibres from the tough arboraceous grasses that grew in profusion near the stream similarly she built walls and a roof the latter thatched with many layers of great leaves the fashioning of the barred windows and the door were matters of great importance and consuming interest the windows there were two of them were large and the bars permanently fixed but the door was small the opening just large enough to permit her to pass through easily on hands and knees which made it easier to barricade she lost count of the days that the house cost her but time was a cheap commodity she had more of it than of anything else it meant so little to her that she had not even any desire to keep account of it how long since she and obergatz had fled from the wrath of the negro villagers she did not know and she could only roughly guess at the seasons she worked hard for two reasons one was to hasten the completion of her little place of refuge and the other a desire for such physical exhaustion at night that she would sleep through those dreaded hours to a new day as a matter of fact the house was finished in less than a week that is it was made as safe as it ever would be though regardless of how long she might occupy it she would keep on adding touches and refinements here and there her daily life was filled with her house-building and her hunting to which was added an occasional spice of excitement contributed by roving lions to the woodcraft that she had learned from tarzan that master of the art was added a considerable store of practical experience derived from her own past adventures in the jungle and the long months with obergatz nor was any day now lacking in some added store of useful knowledge to these facts was attributable her apparent immunity from harm since they told her when jaw was approaching before he crept close enough for a successful charge and too they kept her close to those never-failing havens of retreat the trees the nights filled with their weird noises were lonely and depressing only her ability to sleep quickly and soundly made them endurable the first night that she spent in her completed house behind barred windows and barricaded door was one of almost undiluted peace and happiness the night noises seemed far removed and impersonal and the suing of the wind in the trees was gently soothing before it had carried a mournful note and was sinister in that it might hide the approach of some real danger that night she slept indeed she went further afield now in search of food so far nothing but rodents had fallen to her spear her ambition was an antelope since beside the flesh it would give her and the gut for her bow the hide would provide invaluable during the colder weather that she knew would accompany the rainy season she had caught glimpses of these wary animals and was sure that they always crossed the stream at a certain spot above her camp it was to this place that she went to hunt them with the stealth and cunning of a panther she crept through the forest circling about to get up wind from the ford pausing often to look and listen for aught that might menace her herself the personification of a hunted deer now she moved silently down upon the chosen spot what luck a beautiful buck stood drinking in the stream the woman wormed her way closer now she lay upon her belly behind a small bush within throwing distance of the quarry she must rise to her full height and throw her spear almost in the same instant and she must throw it with great force and perfect accuracy she thrilled with the excitement of the minute yet cool and steady were her swift muscles as she rose and cast her missile scarce by the width of a finger did the point strike from the spot at which it had been directed the buck leaped high landed upon the bank of the stream and fell dead jane clayton sprang quickly forward toward her kill bravo a man's voice spoke in english from the shrubbery upon the opposite side of the stream jane clayton halted in her tracks stunned almost by surprise and then a strange unkempt figure of a man stepped into view at first she did not recognize him but when she did instinctively she stepped back lieutenant obergatz she cried can it be you it can it is replied the german 
i am a strange sight no doubt but still it is i eric obergatz and you you have changed too is it not he was looking at her naked limbs and her golden breastplates the loin cloth of jato hide the harness and ornaments that constitute the apparel of a hodan woman the things that ludan had dressed her in as his passion for her grew not Kotan's daughter even had finer trappings but why are you here jane insisted i had thought you safely among civilized men by this time if you still lived gott he exclaimed i do not know why i continue to live i have prayed to die and yet i cling to life there is no hope we are doomed to remain in this horrible land until we die the bog the frightful bog i have circled its shores for a place to cross until i have entirely circled the hideous country easily enough we entered but the rains have come since and now no living man could pass that slew of slimy mud and hungry reptiles have i not tried it and the beasts that roam this accursed land they hunt me by day and by night but how have you escaped them she asked i do not know he replied gloomily i have fled and fled and fled i have remained hungry and thirsty in three tops for days at a time i have fashioned weapons clubs and spears and i have learned to use them i have slain a lion with my club so even will a cornered rat fight and we are no better than rats in this land of stupendous dangers you and i but tell me about yourself if it is surprising that i live how much more so that you still survive briefly she told him and all the while she was wondering what she might do to rid herself of him she could not conceive of a prolonged existence with him as her sole companion better a thousand times better to be alone never had her hatred and contempt for him lessened through the long weeks and months of their constant companionship and now that he could be of no service in returning her to civilization she shrank from the thought of seeing him daily and too she feared him never had she trusted him but now there was a strange light in his eye that had not been there when last she saw him she could not interpret it all she knew was that it gave her a feeling of apprehension a nameless dread you lived long then in the city of Alur? he asked speaking in the language of Dawn. you have learned this tongue she asked how i fell in with a band of half-breeds he replied members of a proscribed race that dwells in the rock-bound gut through which the principal river of the valley empties into the morass they are called waz hodon and their village is partly made up of cave dwellings and partly of houses carved from the soft rock at the foot of the cliff they are very ignorant and superstitious and when they first saw me and realized that i had no tail and that my hands and feet were not like theirs they were afraid of me they thought that i was either god or demon being in a position where i could neither escape them nor defend myself i made a bold front and succeeded in impressing them to such an extent that they conducted me to their city which they called bulur and there they fed me and treated me with kindness as i learned their language i sought to impress them more and more with the idea that i was a god and i succeeded too until an old fellow who was something of a priest among them or medicine man became jealous of my growing power that was the beginning of the end and came near to being the end in fact he told them that if i was a god i would not bleed if a knife was stuck into me if i did bleed it would prove conclusively that i was not a god without my knowledge he arranged to stage the ordeal before the whole village upon a certain night it was upon one of those numerous occasions when they eat and drink to jadban otho their pagan deity under the influence of their vile liquor they would be ripe for any bloodthirsty scheme the medicine man might evolve one of the women told me about the plan not with any intent to warn me of danger but prompted merely by feminine curiosity as to whether or not i would bleed if stuck with a dagger she could not wait it seemed for the orderly procedure of the ordeal she wanted to know at once and when i caught her trying to slip a knife into my side and questioned her she explained the whole thing with the utmost naivete the warriors already had commenced drinking it would have been futile to make any sort of appeal either to their intellects or their superstitions there was but one alternative to death and that was flight i told the woman that i was very much outraged and offended at this reflection upon my godhood and that as a mark of my disfavor i should abandon them to their fate i shall return to heaven at once i exclaimed 
she wanted to hang around and see me go but i told her that her eyes would be blasted by the fire surrounding my departure and that she must leave at once and not return to the spot for at least an hour i also impressed upon her the fact that should any other approach this part of the village within that time not only they but she as well would burst into flames and be consumed she was very much impressed and lost no time in leaving calling back as she departed that if i were indeed gone in an hour she and all the village would know that i was no less than jad ben otho himself and so they must thank me for i can assure you that i was gone in much less than an hour nor have i ventured close to the neighbourhood of the city of Boulur since and he fell to laughing in harsh cackling tones that sent a shiver through the woman's frame as obergatz talked jane had recovered her spear from the carcass of the antelope and commenced busying herself with the removal of the hide the man made no attempt to assist her but stood by talking and watching her the while he continually ran his filthy fingers through his matted hair and beard his face and body were caked with dirt and he was naked except for a torn greasy hide about his loins his weapons consisted of a club and knife of wazdan pattern that he had stolen from the city of Bulur. but what more greatly concerned the woman than his filth or his armament were his cackling laughter and the strange expression in his eyes she went on with her work however removing those parts of the buck she wanted taking only as much meat as she might consume before it spoiled as she was not sufficiently a true jungle creature to relish it beyond that stage and then she straightened up and faced the man lieutenant obergatz she said by a chance of accident we have met again certainly you would not have sought the meeting any more than i we have nothing in common other than those sentiments which may have been engendered by my natural dislike and suspicion of you one of the authors of all the misery and sorrow that i have endured for endless months this little corner of the world is mine by right of discovery and occupation go away and leave me to enjoy here what peace i may it is the least that you can do to amend the wrong that you have done me and mine the man stared at her through his fishy eyes for a moment in silence then there broke from his lips a peal of mirthless uncanny laughter go away leave you alone he cried i have found you we are going to be good friends there is no one else in the world but us no one will ever know what we do or what becomes of us and now you ask me to go away and live alone in this hellish solitude again he laughed though neither the muscles of his eyes or his mouth reflected any mirth it was just a hollow sound that imitated laughter remember your promise she said promise promise what are promises they are made to be broken we taught the world that at liege and louvain no no i will not go away i shall stay and protect you i do not need your protection she insisted you have already seen that i can use a spear yes he said but it would not be right to leave you here alone you are but a woman no no i am an officer of the kaiser and i cannot abandon you once more he laughed we could be very happy here together he added the woman could not repress a shudder nor in fact did she attempt to hide her aversion you do not like me he asked ah well it is too sad but some day you will love me and again the hideous laughter the woman had wrapped the pieces of the buck in the hide and this she now raised and threw across her shoulder in her other hand she held her spear and faced the german go she commanded we have wasted enough words this is my country and i shall defend it if i see you about again i shall kill you do you understand an expression of rage contorted over Gott's features he raised his club and started toward her stop she commanded throwing her spear hand backward for a cast you saw me kill this buck and you have said truthfully that no one will ever know what we do here put these two facts together german and draw your own conclusions before you take another step in my direction the man halted and his club hand dropped to his side come he begged in what he intended as a conciliatory tone let us be friends lady greystoke we can be of great assistance to each other and i promise not to harm you remember liege and lovan she reminded him with a sneer i am going now be sure that you do not follow me as far as you can walk in a day from this spot in any direction you may consider the limits of my domain if 
ever again i see you within these limits i shall kill you there could be no question that she meant what she said and the man seemed convinced for he but stood sullenly eyeing her as she backed from sight beyond a turn in the game trail that crossed the ford where they had met and disappeared in the forest end of chapter nineteen read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com chapter twenty silently in the night in a lure the fortunes of the city had been tossed from hand to hand the party of Kotan's loyal warriors that Tarzan had led to the rendezvous at the entrance to the secret passage below the palace gates had met with disaster. Their first rush had been met with soft words from the priests. They had been exhorted to defend the faith of their fathers from blasphemers. Jadon was painted to them as a defiler of temples, and the wrath of Jad ben Otho was prophesied for those who embraced his cause. The priests insisted that Ludon's only wish was to prevent the seizure of the throne by Jadon until a new king could be chosen according to the laws of the Hodon. The result was that many of the palace warriors joined their fellows of the city, and when the priests saw that those whom they could influence outnumbered those who remained loyal to the palace, they caused the former to fall upon the latter, with the result that many were killed and only a handful succeeded in reaching the safety of the palace gates, which they quickly barred. The priests led their own forces through the secret passageway into the temple, while some of the loyal ones sought out Jadon and told him all that had happened. The fight in the banquet hall had spread over a considerable portion of the palace grounds, and had at last resulted in the temporary defeat of those who had opposed Jadon this force counseled by under priests sent for the purpose by ludon had withdrawn within the temple grounds so that now the issue was plainly marked as between jadon on the one side and ludon on the other the former had been told of all that had occurred in the apartments of oloa to whose safety he had attended at the first opportunity and he had also learned of tarzan's part in leading his men to the gathering of ludon's warriors these things had naturally increased the old warrior's former inclinations of friendliness toward the ape-man, and now he regretted that the other had departed from the city. The testimony of Oloa and Panat Lee was such as to strengthen whatever belief in the godliness of the stranger Jadon and others of the warriors had previously entertained, until presently there appeared a strong tendency upon the part of this palace faction to make the Doriul Otho an issue of their original quarrel with Ludon. Whether this occurred as the natural sequence to repeated narrations of the ape man's exploits, which lost nothing by repetition, in conjunction with Ludon's enmity toward him, or whether it was the shrewd design of some wily old warrior such as Jadon, who realized the value of adding a religious cause to their temporal one, it were difficult to determine but the fact remained that jadon's followers developed bitter hatred for the followers of ludon because of the high priest's antagonism to tarzan unfortunately however tarzan was not there to inspire the followers of jadon with the holy zeal that might have quickly settled the dispute in the old chieftain's favor instead he was miles away and because their repeated prayers for his presence were unanswered the weaker spirits among them commenced to suspect that their cause did not have divine favor there was also another and a potent cause for defection from the ranks of jadon it emanated from the city where the friends and relatives of the palace warriors who were largely also the friends and relatives of ludon's forces found the means urged on by the priesthood to circulate throughout the palace pernicious propaganda aimed at jadon's cause the result was that Ludon's power increased while that of Jadon waned. Then followed a sortie from the temple which resulted in the defeat of the palace forces, and though they were able to withdraw in decent order, withdraw they did, leaving the palace to Ludon, who was now virtually ruler of Pal Yul Don. Jadon, taking with him the princess, her women, and their slaves, including Panat Lee, as well as the women and children of his faithful followers, 
retreated not only from the palace but from the city of alur as well and fell back upon his own city of jalur here he remained recruiting his forces from the surrounding villages of the north which being far removed from the influence of the priesthood of alur were enthusiastic partisans in any cause that the old chieftain espoused since for years he had been revered as their friend and protector and while these events were transpiring in the north tarzan jad guru lay in the lion pit at tulur while messengers passed back and forth between mosar and ludon as the two dickered for the throne of pal Yuldan. mosar was cunning enough to guess that should an open breach occur between himself and the high priest he might use his prisoner to his own advantage for he had heard whisperings among even his own people that suggested that there were those who were more than a trifle inclined to belief in the divinity of the stranger and that he might indeed be the doryul otho ludon wanted tarzan himself he wanted to sacrifice him upon the eastern altar with his own hands before a multitude of people since he was not without evidence that his own standing and authority had been lessened by the claims of the bold and heroic figure of the stranger the method that the high priest of tulur had employed to trap tarzan had left the ape-man in possession of his weapons though there seemed little likelihood of their being of any service to him he also had his pouch in which were the various odds and ends which are the natural accumulation of all receptacles from a gold mesh bag to an attic there were bits of obsidian and choice feathers for arrows some pieces of flint and a couple of steel an old knife a heavy bone needle and strips of dried gut nothing very useful to you or me perhaps but nothing useless to the savage life of the ape-man when tarzan realized the trick that had been so neatly played upon him he had awaited expectantly the coming of the lion for though the scent of jaw was old he was sure that sooner or later they would let one of the beasts in upon him his first consideration was a thorough exploration of his prison he had noticed the hide covered windows and these he immediately uncovered letting in the light and revealing the fact that though the chamber was far below the level of the temple courts it was yet many feet above the base of the hill from which the temple was hewn the windows were so closely barred that he could not see over the edge of the thick wall in which they were cut to determine what lay close in below him at a little distance were the blue waters of jadin lul and beyond the verdure clad farther shore and beyond that the mountains it was a beautiful picture upon which he looked a picture of peace and harmony and quiet nor anywhere a slightest suggestion of the savage men and beasts that claimed this lovely landscape as their own what a paradise and some day civilized man would come and spoil it ruthless axes would raise that age-old wood black sticky smoke would rise from ugly chimneys against that azure sky grimy little boats with wheels behind or upon either side would churn the mud from the bottom of jadin lul turning its blue waters to a dirty brown hideous piers would project into the lake from squalid buildings of corrugated iron doubtless for of such are the pioneer cities of the world but would civilized man come tarzan hoped not for countless generations civilization had ramped about the globe it had dispatched its emissaries to the north pole and the south it had circled pal yul don once perhaps many times but it had never touched her god grant that it never would perhaps he was saving this little spot to be always just as he had made it for the scratching of the hodon and the wasdon upon his rocks had not altered the fair face of nature through the windows came sufficient light to reveal the whole interior to tarzan the room was fairly large and there was a door at each end a large door for men and a smaller one for lions both were closed with heavy masses of stone that had been lowered in grooves running to the floor the two windows were small and closely barred with the first iron that tarzan had seen in pal yul don the bars were let into holes in the casing and the hole so strongly and neatly contrived that escape seemed impossible yet within a few minutes of his incarceration tarzan had commenced to undertake his escape 
the old knife in his pouch was brought into requisition and slowly the ape-man began to scrape and chip away the stone from about the bars of one of the windows it was slow work but tarzan had the patience of absolute health each day food and water were brought to him and slipped quickly beneath the smaller door which was raised just sufficiently to allow the stone receptacles to pass in the prisoner began to believe that he was being preserved for something besides lions. However, that was immaterial. If they would but hold off for a few more days, they might select what fate they would. He would not be there when they arrived to announce it. And then one day came Pansat, Ludan's chief tool, to the city of Tulur. He came ostensibly with a fair message for Mosar from the high priest at Alur ludon had decided that mosar should be king and he invited mosar to come at once to alur and then pansat having delivered the message asked that he might go to the temple of tulur and pray and there he sought the high priest of tulur to whom was the true message that ludon had sent the two were closeted alone in a little chamber and pansat whispered into the ear of the high priest mosar wishes to be king he said and ludon wishes to be king mosar wishes to retain the stranger who claims to be the dor ul otho and ludan wishes to kill him and now he leaned even closer to the ear of the high priest of tulur if you would be high priest of alur it is within your power pansat ceased speaking and waited for the other's reply the high priest was visibly affected to be high priest at alur that was almost as good as being king of all pal ul -dan for great were the powers of him who conducted the sacrifices upon the altars of Alur. How, whispered the high priest, how may I become high priest at Alur? Again Pansat leaned close. By killing the one and bringing the other to Alur, replied he. Then he rose and departed, knowing that the other had swallowed the bait and could be depended upon to do whatever was required to win him the great prize nor was pansat mistaken other than in one trivial consideration this high priest would indeed commit murder and treason to attain the high office at allure but he had misunderstood which of his victims was to be killed and which to be delivered to ludon pansat knowing himself all the details of the plannings of ludon had made the quite natural error of assuming that the other was perfectly aware that only by publicly sacrificing the false Doriel Otho could the high priest at Allure bolster his waning power, and that the assassination of Mosar the pretender would remove from Ludon's camp the only obstacle to his combining the offices of high priest and king. The high priest at Tulur thought that he had been commissioned to kill Tarzan and bring Mosar to Allure. He also thought that when he had done these things he would be made high priest at Allure but he did not know that already the priest had been selected who was to murder him within the hour that he arrived at allur nor did he know that a secret grave had been prepared for him in the floor of a subterranean chamber in the very temple he dreamed of controlling and so when he should have been arranging the assassination of his chief he was leading a dozen heavily bribed warriors through the dark corridors beneath the temple to slay tarzan in the lion pit night had fallen a single torch guided the footsteps of the murderers as they crept stealthily upon their evil way for they knew that they were doing the thing that their chief did not want done and their guilty consciences warned them to stealth in the dark of his cell the ape-man worked at his seemingly endless chipping and scraping his keen ears detected the coming of footsteps along the corridor without footsteps that approached the larger door always before had they come to the smaller door the footsteps of a single slave who brought his food this time there were many more than one and their coming at this time of night carried a sinister suggestion tarzan continued to work at his scraping and chipping he heard them stop beyond the door all was silence broken only by the scrape 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 of the ape-man's tireless blade those without heard it and listening sought to explain it they whispered in low tones making their plans two would raise the door quickly and the others would rush in and hurl their clubs at the prisoner they would take no chances for the stories that had circulated in allure had been brought to tulur stories of the great strength and wonderful prowess of tarzan jad guru that caused the sweat to stand upon the brows of the warriors 
though it was cool in the damp corridor and they were twelve to one and when the high priest gave the signal the door shot upward and ten warriors leaped into the chamber with poised clubs three of the heavy weapons flew across the room toward a darker shadow that lay in the shadow of the opposite wall then the flare of the torch in the priest's hand lighted the interior and they saw that the thing at which they had flung their clubs was a pile of skins torn from the windows and that except for themselves the chamber was vacant one of them hastened to a window all but a single bar was gone and to this was tied one end of a braided rope fashioned from strips cut from the leather window hangings to the ordinary dangers of jane clayton's existence was now added the menace of obergatz's knowledge of her whereabouts the lion and the panther had given her less cause for anxiety than did the return of the unscrupulous hun whom she had always distrusted and feared and whose repulsiveness was now immeasurably augmented by his unkempt and filthy appearance his strange and mirthless laughter and his unnatural demeanour she feared him now with a new fear as though he had suddenly become the personification of some nameless horror the wholesome outdoor life that she had been leading had strengthened and rebuilt her nervous system yet it seemed to her as she thought of him that if this man should ever touch her she should scream and possibly even faint again and again during the day following their unexpected meeting the woman reproached herself for not having killed him as she would jaw or jato or any other predatory beast that menaced her existence or her safety there was no attempt at self-justification for these sinister reflections they needed no justification the standards by which the acts of such as you or i may be judged could not apply to hers we have recourse to the protection of friends and relatives and the civil soldiery that upholds the majesty of the law and which may be invoked to protect the righteous weak against the unrighteous strong but jane clayton comprised within herself not only the righteous weak but all the various agencies for the protection of the weak to her then lieutenant eric obergatz presented no different problem than did jaw the lion other than that she considered the former the more dangerous animal and so she determined that should he ignore her warning there would be no temporizing upon the occasion of their next meeting the same swift spear that would meet jaw's advances would meet his that night her snug little nest perched high in the great tree seemed less the sanctuary that it had before what might resist the sanguinary intentions of a prowling panther would prove no greater barrier to man and influenced by this thought she slept less well than before the slightest noise that broke the monotonous hum of the nocturnal jungle started her into alert wakefulness to lie with straining ears in an attempt to classify the origin of the disturbance and once she was awakened thus by a sound that seemed to come from something moving in her own tree she listened intently scarce breathing yes there it was again a scuffing of something soft against the hard bark of the tree the woman reached out in the darkness and grasped her spear now she felt a slight sagging of one of the limbs that supported her shelter as though the thing whatever it was was slowly raising its weight to the branch it came nearer now she thought that she could detect its breathing it was at the door she could hear it fumbling with the frail barrier what could it be it made no sound by which she might identify it she raised herself upon her hands and knees and crept stealthily the little distance to the door her spear clutched tightly in her hand whatever the thing was it was evidently attempting to gain entrance without awakening her it was just beyond the pitiful little contraption of slender boughs that she had bound together with grasses and called the door only a few inches lay between the thing and her rising to her knees she reached out with her left hand and felt until she found a place where a crooked branch had left an opening a couple of inches wide near the centre of the barrier into this she inserted the point of her spear the thing must have heard her move within for suddenly it abandoned its efforts for stealth and tore angrily at the obstacle at the same moment jane thrust her spear forward with all her strength she felt it enter flesh there was a scream and a curse from without followed by the crashing of a body through limbs and foliage her spear was almost dragged from her grasp but she held on to it until it broke free from the thing it had pierced it was obergatz the curse had told her that 
from below came no further sound had she then killed him she prayed so with all her heart she prayed it to be freed from the menace of this loathsome creature were relief indeed during all the balance of the night she lay there awake listening below her she imagined she could see the dead man with his hideous face bathed in the cold light of the moon lying there upon his back staring up at her she prayed that jaw might come and drag it away but all during the remainder of the night she heard never another sound above the drowsy hum of the jungle she was glad that he was dead but she dreaded the gruesome ordeal that awaited her on the morrow for she must bury the thing that had been eric obergatz and live on there above the shallow grave of the man she had slain she reproached herself for her weakness repeating over and over that she had killed in self-defence that her act was justified but she was still a woman of to-day and strong upon her were the iron mandates of the social order from which she had sprung its interdictions and its superstitions at last came the tardy dawn slowly the sun topped the distant mountains beyond jad and lull and yet she hesitated to loosen the fastenings of her door and look out upon the thing below but it must be done she steeled herself and untied the rawhide thong that secured the barrier she looked down and only the grass and the flowers looked up at her she came from her shelter and examined the ground upon the opposite side of the tree there was no dead man there nor anywhere as far as she could see slowly she descended keeping a wary eye and an alert ear ready for the first intimation of danger at the foot of the tree was a pool of blood and a little trail of crimson drops upon the grass leading away parallel with the shore of jad ben lul then she had not slain him she was vaguely aware of a peculiar double sensation of relief and regret now she would be always in doubt he might return but at least she would not have to live above his grave she thought some of following the bloody spoor on the chance that he might have crawled away to die later but she gave up the idea for fear that she might find him dead near by or worse yet badly wounded what then could she do she could not finish him with her spear no she knew that she could not do that nor could she bring him back and nurse him nor could she leave him there to die of hunger or of thirst or to become the prey of some prowling beast it were better then not to search for him for fear that she might find him that day was one of nervous starting to every sudden sound the day before she would have said that her nerves were of iron but not to-day she knew now the shock that she had suffered and that this was the reaction to-morrow it might be different but something told her that never again would her little shelter and the patch of forest and jungle that she called her own be the same there would hang over them always the menace of this man no longer would she pass restful nights of deep slumber the peace of her little world was shattered for ever that night she made her door doubly secure with additional thongs of rawhide cut from the pelt of the buck she had slain the day that she met obergatz she was very tired for she had lost much sleep the night before but for a long time she lay with wide open eyes staring into the darkness what saw she there visions that brought tears to those brave and beautiful eyes visions of a rambling bungalow that had been home to her and that was no more destroyed by the same cruel force that haunted her even now in this remote uncharted corner of the earth visions of a strong man whose protecting arm would never press her close again visions of a tall straight son who looked at her adoringly out of brave smiling eyes that were like his father's always the vision of the crude simple bungalow rather than of the stately halls that had been as much a part of her life as the other but he had loved the bungalow and the broad free acres best so she had come to love them best too at last she slept the sleep of utter exhaustion how long it lasted she did not know but suddenly she was wide awake and once again she heard the scuffling of a body against the bark of her tree and again the limb bent to a heavy weight he had returned she went cold trembling with ague was it he or oh god had she killed him and then was this she tried to drive the horrid thought from her mind for this way she knew lay madness and once again she crept to the door for the thing was outside just as it had been last night her hands trembled as she placed the point of her weapon to the opening 
she wondered if it would scream as it fell end of chapter twenty read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com chapter twenty one the maniac the last bar that would make the opening large enough to permit his body to pass had been removed as tarzan heard the warriors whispering beyond the stone door of his prison long since had the rope of hide been braided to secure one end to the remaining bar that he had left for this purpose was the work of but a moment and while the warriors whispered without the brown body of the ape-man slipped through the small aperture and disappeared below the sill tarzan's escape from the cell left him still within the walled area that comprised the palace and temple grounds and buildings he had reconnoitred as best he might from the window after he had removed enough bars to permit him to pass his head through the opening so that he knew what lay immediately before him a winding and usually deserted alleyway leading in the direction of the outer gate that opened from the palace grounds into the city the darkness would facilitate his escape he might even pass out of the palace and the city without detection if he could elude the guard at the palace gate the rest would be easy he strode along confidently exhibiting no fear of detection for he reasoned that thus would he disarm suspicion in the darkness he easily could pass for a hodon and in truth though he passed several after leaving the deserted alley no one accosted or detained him and thus he came at last to the guard of a half a dozen warriors before the palace gate these he attempted to pass in the same unconcerned fashion and he might have succeeded had it not been for one who came running rapidly from the direction of the temple shouting let no one pass the gates the prisoner has escaped from the paluja instantly a warrior barred his way and simultaneously the fellow recognized him zator he exclaimed here he is now fall upon him fall upon him back back before i kill you the others came forward it cannot be said that they rushed forward if it was their wish to fall upon him there was a noticeable lack of enthusiasm other than that which directed their efforts to persuade someone else to fall upon him his fame as a fighter had been too long a topic of conversation for the good of the morale of mosar's warriors it were safer to stand at a distance and hurl their clubs and this they did but the ape-man had learned something of the use of this weapon since he had arrived in pal yul -don and as he learned great had grown his respect for this most primitive of arms he had come to realize that the black savages he had known had never appreciated the possibilities of their knob-sticks nor had he and he had discovered too why the pal yul had turned their ancient spears into plowshares and pinned their faith to the heavy-ended club alone in deadly execution it was far more effective than a spear and it answered to every purpose of a shield combining the two in one and thus reducing the burden of the warrior thrown as they throw it after the manner of the hammer throwers of the olympian games an ordinary shield would prove more a weakness than a strength while one that would be strong enough to prove a protection would be too heavy to carry only another club deftly wielded to deflect the course of an enemy missile is in any way effective against these formidable weapons and too the war club of pal yul -don can be thrown with accuracy a far greater distance than any spear and now was put to the test that which tarzan had learned from omat and ta -den. his eyes and his muscles trained by a lifetime of necessity moved with the rapidity of light and his brain functioned with an uncanny celerity that suggested nothing less than prescience and these things more than compensated for his lack of experience with the war club he handled so dexterously weapon after weapon he warded off and always he moved with a single idea in mind to place himself within reach of one of his antagonists but they were wary for they feared this strange creature to whom the superstitious fears of many of them attributed the miraculous powers of deity they managed to keep between tarzan and the gateway and all the time they bawled lustily for reinforcements should these come before he had made his escape the ape-man realized that the odds against him would be unsurmountable and so he redoubled his efforts to carry out his design 
following their usual tactics two or three of the warriors were always circling behind him collecting the thrown clubs when tarzan's attention was directed elsewhere he himself retrieved several of them which he hurled with such deadly effect as to dispose of two of his antagonists but now he heard the approach of hurrying warriors the patter of their bare feet upon the stone pavement and then the savage cries which were to bolster the courage of their fellows and fill the enemy with fear there was no time to lose tarzan held the club in either hand and swinging one he hurled it at a warrior before him and as the man dodged he rushed in and seized him at the same time casting his second club at another of his opponents the hodon with whom he grappled reached instantly for his knife but the ape-man grasped his wrist then the warrior was lifted bodily from his feet and held as a shield between his fellows and the fugitive as the latter backed through the gateway beside tarzan stood the single torch that lighted the entrance to the palace grounds the warriors were advancing to the succor of their fellow when the ape-man raised his captive high above his head and flung him full in the face of the foremost attacker the fellow went down and two directly behind him sprawled headlong over their companion as the ape-man seized the torch and cast it back into the palace grounds to be extinguished as it struck the bodies of those who led the charging reinforcements in the ensuing darkness tarzan disappeared in the streets of tulur beyond the palace gate for a time he was aware of sounds of pursuit but the fact that they trailed away and died in the direction of jadin lul informed him that they were searching in the wrong direction for he had turned south out of tulur purposely to throw them off his track beyond the outskirts of the city he turned directly toward the northwest in which direction lay alur in his path he knew lay jad bal lul the shore of which he was compelled to skirt and there would be a river to cross at the lower end of the great lake upon the shores of which lay Alur. What other obstacles lay in his way he did not know, but he believed that he could make better time on foot than by attempting to steal a canoe and force his way upstream with a single paddle. It was his intention to put as much distance as possible between himself and Talur before he slept, for he was sure that Mosar would not lightly accept his loss but that with the coming of day or possibly even before he would dispatch warriors in search of him a mile or two from the city he entered a forest and here at last he felt such a measure of safety as he never knew in open spaces or in cities the forest and the jungle were his birthright no creature that went upon the ground upon four feet or climbed among the trees or crawled upon its belly had any advantage over the ape-man in his native heath as myrrh and frankincense were the dank odors of rotting vegetation in the nostrils of the great tarmangani he squared his broad shoulders and lifting his head filled his lungs with the air that he loved best the heavy fragrance of tropical blooms the commingled odors of the myriad scented life of the jungle went to his head with a pleasurable intoxication far more potent than aught contained in the oldest vintages of civilization he took to the trees now not from necessity but from pure love of the wild freedom that had been denied him so long though it was dark and the forest strange yet he moved with a surety and ease that bespoke more a strange uncanny sense than wondrous skill he heard jaw moaning somewhere ahead and an owl hooted mournfully to the right of him long familiar sounds that imparted to him no sense of loneliness as they might to you or to me but on the contrary one of companionship for they betokened the presence of his fellows of the jungle and whether friend or foe it was all the same to the ape-man he came at last to a little stream at a spot where the trees did not meet above it so he was forced to descend to the ground and wade through the water and upon the opposite shore he stopped as though suddenly his godlike figure had been transmuted from flesh to marble only his dilating nostrils bespoke his pulsing vitality for a long moment he stood there thus and then swiftly but with a caution and silence that were inherent in him he moved forward again but now his whole attitude bespoke a new urge there was a definite and masterful purpose in every movement of those steel muscles rolling softly beneath the smooth brown hide he moved now toward a certain goal that quite evidently filled him with far greater enthusiasm than had the possible event of his return to allure and so he came at last to the foot of a great tree 
and there he stopped and looked up above him among the foliage where the dim outlines of a roughly rectangular bulk loomed darkly there was a choking sensation in tarzan's throat as he raised himself gently into the branches it was as though his heart were swelling either to a great happiness or a great fear before the rude shelter built among the branches he paused listening from within there came to his sensitive nostrils the same delicate aroma that had arrested his eager attention at the little stream a mile away he crouched upon the branch close to the little door jane he called heart of my heart it is i the only answer from within was the sudden indrawing of a breath that was half gasp and half sigh and the sound of a body falling to the floor hurriedly tarzan sought to release the thongs which held the door but they were fastened from the inside and at last impatient with further delay he seized the frail barrier in one giant hand and with a single effort tore it completely away and then he entered to find the seemingly lifeless body of his mate stretched upon the floor he gathered her in his arms her heart beat she still breathed and presently he realized that she had but swooned when jane clayton regained consciousness it was to find herself held tightly in two strong arms her head pillowed upon the broad shoulder where so often before her fears had been soothed and her sorrows comforted at first she was not sure but that it was all a dream timidly her hand stole to his cheek john she murmured tell me is it really you in reply he drew her more closely to him it is i he replied but there is something in my throat he said haltingly that makes it hard for me to speak she smiled and snuggled closer to him god has been good to us tarzan of the apes she said for some time neither spoke it was enough that they were reunited and that each knew that the other was alive and safe but at last they found their voices and when the sun rose they were still talking so much had each to tell the other so many questions there were to be asked and answered and jack she asked where is he i do not know replied tarzan the last i heard of him he was on the argonne front ah then our happiness is not quite complete she said a little note of sadness creeping into her voice no he replied but the same is true in countless other english homes to-day and pride is learning to take the place of happiness in these she shook her head i want my boy she said and i too replied tarzan and we may have him yet he was safe and unwounded the last word i had and now he said we must plan upon our return would you like to rebuild the bungalow and gather together the remnants of our waziri or would you rather return to london only to find jack she said i dream always of the bungalow and never of the city but john we can only dream for obergatz told me that he had circled this whole country and found no place where he might cross the morass i am not obergatz tarzan reminded her smiling we will rest to-day and to-morrow we will set out toward the north it is a savage country but we have crossed it once and we can cross it again and so upon the following morning the tarmangani and his mate went forth upon their journey across the valley of jad ben otho and ahead of them were fierce men and savage beasts and the lofty mountains of pal -yul -don and beyond the mountains the reptiles and the moras and beyond that the arid thorn-covered steppe and other savage beasts and men and weary hostile miles of untracked wilderness between them and the charred ruins of their home lieutenant eric obergatz crawled through the grass upon all fours leaving a trail of blood behind him after jane's spear had sent him crashing to the ground beneath her tree he made no sound after the one piercing scream that had acknowledged the severity of his wound he was quiet because of a great fear that had crept into his warped brain that the devil woman would pursue and slay him and so he crawled away like some filthy beast of prey seeking a thicket where he might lie down and hide he thought that he was going to die but he did not and with the coming of the new day he discovered that his wound was superficial the rough obsidian shod spear had entered the muscles of his side beneath his right arm inflicting a painful but not a fatal wound with the realization of this fact came a renewed desire to put as much distance as possible between himself and jane clayton and so he moved on still going upon all fours because of a persistent hallucination that in this way he might escape observation yet though he fled his mind still revolved muddily about a central desire 
while he fled from her he still planned to pursue her and to this lust of possession was added a desire for revenge she should pay for the suffering she had inflicted upon him she should pay for rebuffing him but for some reason which he did not try to explain to himself he would crawl away and hide he would come back though he would come back and when he had finished with her he would take that smooth throat in his two hands and crush the life from her he kept repeating this over and over to himself and then he fell to laughing out loud the cackling hideous laughter that had terrified jane presently he realized his knees were bleeding and that they hurt him he looked cautiously behind no one was in sight he listened he could hear no indications of pursuit and so he rose to his feet and continued upon his way a sorry sight covered with filth and blood his beard and hair tangled and matted and filled with burrs and dried mud and unspeakable filth he kept no track of time he ate fruits and berries and tubers that he dug from the earth with his fingers he followed the shore of the lake and the river that he might be near water and when jaw roared or moaned he climbed a tree and hid there shivering and so after a time he came up the southern shore of jad ben lul until a wide river stopped his progress across the blue water a white city glimmered in the sun he looked at it for a long time blinking his eyes like an owl slowly a recollection forced itself through his tangled brain this was allure the city of light the association of ideas recalled Bulur and the waz hodan they had called him jad ben otho he commenced to laugh aloud and stood up very straight and strode back and forth along the shore i am jad ben otho he cried i am the great god in allure is my temple and my high priests what is jad ben otho doing here alone in the jungle he stepped out into the water and raising his voice shrieked loudly across toward allure i am jad ben otho he screamed come hither slaves and take your god to his temple but the distance was great and they did not hear him and no one came and the feeble mind was distracted by other things a bird flying in the air a school of minnows swimming round his feet he lunged at them trying to catch them and falling upon his hands and knees he crawled through the water grasping futilely at the elusive fish presently it occurred to him that he was a sea lion and he forgot the fish and lay down and tried to swim by wriggling his feet in the water as though they were a tail the hardships the privations the terrors and for the past few weeks the lack of proper nourishment had reduced eric obergatz to little more than a gibbering idiot a water snake swam out upon the surface of the lake and the man pursued it crawling upon his hands and knees the snake swam toward the shore just within the mouth of the river where tall reeds grew thickly and obergatz followed making grunting noises like a pig he lost the snake within the reeds but he came upon something else a canoe hidden there close to the bank he examined it with cackling laughter there were two paddles within it which he took and threw out into the current of the river he watched them for a while and then he sat down beside the canoe and commenced to splash his hands up and down upon the water he liked to hear the noise and see the little splashes of spray he rubbed his left forearm with his right palm and the dirt came off and left a white spot that drew his attention he rubbed again upon the now thoroughly soaked blood and grime that covered his body he was not attempting to wash himself he was merely amused by the strange results i am turning white he cried his glance wandered from his body now that the grime and blood were all removed and caught again the white city shimmering beneath the hot sun allure city of light he shrieked and that reminded him again of tulur and by the same process of associated ideas that had before suggested it he recalled that the waz hodan had thought him jad ben otho i am jad ben otho he screamed and then his eyes fell again upon the canoe a new idea came and persisted he looked down at himself examining his body seeing the filthy loin-cloth now water-soaked and more bedraggled than before he tore it from him and flung it into the lake gods do not wear dirty rags he said aloud they do not wear anything but wreaths and garlands of flowers and i am a god i am jad ben otho and i go in state to my sacred city of allure he ran his fingers through his matted hair and beard the water had softened the burrs but had not removed them the man shook his head his hair and beard failed to harmonize with his other godly attributes he was commencing to think more clearly now for the great idea had taken hold of his scattered wits and concentrated them upon a single purpose 
but he was still a maniac the only difference being that he was now a maniac with a fixed intent he went out on the shore and gathered flowers and ferns and wove them in his beard and hair blazing blooms of different colors green ferns that trailed about his ears or rose bravely upward like the plumes in a lady's hat when he was satisfied that his appearance would impress the most casual observer with his evident deity he returned to the canoe pushed it from shore and jumped in the impetus carried it into the river's current and the current bore it out upon the lake the naked man stood erect in the centre of the little craft his arms folded upon his chest he screamed aloud his message to the city i am jad ben Otto. let the high priest and the under priests attend upon me as the current of the river was dissipated by the waters of the lake the wind caught him and his craft and carried them bravely forward sometimes he drifted with his back toward a lure and sometimes with his face toward it and at intervals he shrieked his message and his commands he was still in the middle of the lake when someone discovered him from the palace wall and as he drew nearer a crowd of warriors and women and children were congregated there watching him and along the temple walls were many priests and among them ludon the high priest when the boat had drifted close enough for them to distinguish the bizarre figure standing in it and for them to catch the meaning of his words ludon's cunning eyes narrowed the high priest had learned of the escape of tarzan and he feared that should he join jadon's forces as seemed likely he would attract many recruits who might still believe in him and the dorial otho even if a false one upon the side of the enemy might easily work havoc with ludon's plans the man was drifting close in his canoe would soon be caught in the current that ran close to the shore here and carried toward the river that emptied the waters of jad ben lul into jad bal lul the under priests were looking toward ludon for instructions fetch him hither he commanded if he is jad ben otho i shall know him the priests hurried to the palace grounds and summoned warriors go bring the stranger to ludon if he is jad ben otho we shall know him and so lieutenant eric obergatz was brought before the high priest at allure ludon looked closely at the naked man with the fantastic headdress where did you come from he asked i am jad ben otho cried the german i came from heaven where is my high priest i am the high priest replied ludon obergatz clapped his hands have my feet bathed and food brought to me he commanded ludon's eyes narrowed to mere slits of crafty cunning he bowed low until his forehead touched the feet of the stranger before the eyes of many priests and warriors from the palace he did it ho oh, slaves he cried rising fetch water and food for the great god and thus the high priest acknowledged before his people the godhood of lieutenant eric obergatz nor was it long before the story ran like wildfire through the palace and out into the city and beyond that to the lesser villages all the way from allure to tulur the real god had come jad ben otho himself and he had espoused the cause of ludon the high priest mosar lost no time in placing himself at the disposal of ludon nor did he mention aught about his claims to the throne it was mosar's opinion that he might consider himself fortunate were he allowed to remain in peaceful occupation of his chieftainship at tulur nor was mosar wrong in his deductions but ludon could still use him and so he let him live and sent word to him to come to allur with all his warriors for it was rumored that jadon was raising a great army in the north and might soon march upon the city of light obergatz thoroughly enjoyed being a god plenty of food and peace of mind and rest partially brought back to him the reason that had been so rapidly slipping from him but in one respect he was madder than ever since now no power on earth would ever be able to convince him that he was not a god slaves were put at his disposal and these he ordered about in godly fashion the same portion of his naturally cruel mind met upon common ground the mind of ludon so that the two seemed always in accord the high priest saw in the stranger a mighty force wherewith to hold forever his power over all palul don and thus the future of obergatz was assured so long as he cared to play god to ludon's high priest a throne was erected in the main temple court before the eastern altar where jad ben otho might sit in person and behold the sacrifices that were offered up to him there each day at sunset 
so much did the cruel half-crazed mind enjoy these spectacles that at times he even insisted upon wielding the sacrificial knife himself and upon such occasions the priests and the people fell upon their faces in awe of the dread deity if obergatz taught them not to love their god more he taught them to fear him as they never had before so that the name of jad ben otho was whispered in the city and little children were frightened into obedience by the mere mention of it lu don through his priests and slaves circulated the information that jad ben otho had commanded all his faithful followers to flock to the standard of the high priest at allure and that all others were cursed especially jadan and the base impostor who had posed as the dor yul otho the curse was to take the form of early death following terrible suffering and ludon caused it to be published abroad that the name of any warrior who complained of a pain should be brought to him for such might be deemed to be under suspicion since the first effects of the curse would result in slight pains attacking the unholy he counseled those who felt pains to look carefully to their loyalty the result was remarkable and immediate half a nation without a pain and recruits pouring into allure to offer their services to ludon while secretly hoping that the little pains they had felt in arm or leg or belly would not recur in aggravated form End of chapter 21 Read by Don W. Jenkins Rancho San Diego, California Shaggybark.blogspot.com Chapter 22 A Journey on a Griff Tarzan and Jane skirted the shore of Jadbal Lull and crossed the river at the head of the lake. They moved in leisurely fashion with an eye to comfort and safety, for the ape-man, now that he had found his mate, was determined to court no chance that might again separate them, or delay or prevent their escape from Pal Yul Don. How they were to recross the morass was a matter of little concern to him as yet. It would be time enough to consider that matter when it became of more immediate moment. Their hours were filled with the happiness and content of reunion after long separation. They had much to talk of, for each had passed through many trials and vicissitudes and strange adventures, and no important hour might go unaccounted for since they last met it was tarzan's intention to choose a way above allure and the scattered hodon villages below it passing about midway between them and the mountains thus avoiding in so far as possible both the hodon and the wazdan for in this area lay the neutral territory that was uninhabited by either thus he would travel northwest until opposite the koryul jaw where he planned to stop to pay his respects to omat and give the gund word of panat Lee, and a plan tarzan had for ensuring her safe return to her people it was upon the third day of their journey and they had almost reached the river that passes through a lure when jane suddenly clutched tarzan's arm and pointed ahead toward the edge of a forest that they were approaching beneath the shadows of the trees loomed a great bulk that the ape-man instantly recognized what is it whispered jane a griff replied the ape-man and we have met him in the worst place that we could possibly have found there is not a large tree within a quarter of a mile other than those among which he stands come we shall have to go back jane i cannot risk it with you along the best thing we can do is to pray that he does not discover us and if he does then i shall have to risk it risk what the chance that i can subdue him as i subdued one of his fellows replied tarzan i told you you recall yes but i did not picture so huge a creature why john he is as big as a battleship the ape-man laughed not quite though i'll admit he looks quite as formidable as one when he charges they were moving away slowly so as not to attract the attention of the beast i believe we're going to make it whispered the woman her voice tense with suppressed excitement a low rumble rolled like distant thunder from the wood tarzan shook his head the big show is about to commence in the main tent he quoted grinning he caught the woman suddenly to his breast and kissed her one can never tell jane he said we'll do our best that is all we can do give me your spear and don't run the only hope we have lies in that little brain more than in us if i can control it 
well let us see the beast had emerged from the forest and was looking about through his weak eyes evidently in search of them tarzan raised his voice in the weird notes of the toro don's cry Wee -oo! Wee -oo! Wee -oo! for a moment the great beast stood motionless his attention riveted by the call the ape-man advanced straight toward him jane clayton at his elbow Wee -oo! he cried again peremptorily a low rumble rolled from the griff's cavernous chest in answer to the call and the beast moved slowly toward them fine exclaimed tarzan the odds are in our favor now you can keep your nerve but i do not need to ask i know no fear when i am with tarzan of the apes she replied softly and he felt the pressure of her soft fingers on his arm and thus the two approached the giant monster of a forgotten epic until they stood close in the shadow of a mighty shoulder Whee -oo! shouted tarzan and struck the hideous snout with the shaft of the spear the vicious side snap that did not reach its mark that evidently was not intended to reach its mark was the hoped-for answer come said tarzan and taking jane by the hand he led her around behind the monster and up the broad tail to the great horned back now we will ride in the state that our forebears knew before which the pomp of modern kings pales into cheap and tawdry insignificance how would you like to canter through hyde park on a mount like this i am afraid the bobbies would be shocked by our riding habits john she cried laughingly tarzan guided the griff in the direction that they wished to go steep embankments and rivers proved no slightest obstacle to the ponderous creature a prehistoric tank this jane assured him and laughing and talking they continued on their way once they came unexpectedly upon a dozen hodon warriors as the griff emerged suddenly into a small clearing the fellows were lying about in the shade of a single tree that grew alone when they saw the beast they leaped to their feet in consternation and at their shouts the griff issued his hideous challenging bellow and charged them the warriors fled in all directions while tarzan belabored the beast across the snout with his spear in an effort to control him and at last he succeeded just as the griff was almost upon one poor devil that it seemed to have singled out for its special prey with an angry grunt the griff stopped and the man with a single backward glance that showed a face white with terror disappeared in the jungle he had been seeking to reach the ape-man was elated he had doubted that he could control the beast should it take it into its head to charge a victim and had intended abandoning it before they reached the koryul jaw now he altered his plans they would ride to the very village of omat upon the griff and the koryul jaw would have food for conversation for many generations to come nor was it the theatric instinct of the ape-man alone that gave favor to this plan the element of jane's safety entered into the matter for he knew that she would be safe from man and beast alike so long as she rode upon the back of pal yul don's most formidable creature as they proceeded slowly in the direction of the koryul jaw for the natural gait of the griff is far from rapid a handful of terrified warriors came panting into allure spreading a weird story of the doryul otho only none dared call him the doryul otho aloud instead they spoke of him as tarzan jad guru and they told of meeting him mounted upon a mighty griff beside the beautiful stranger woman whom Kotan would have made queen of pal yul don this story was brought to lu don who caused the warriors to be hailed to his presence when he questioned them closely until finally he was convinced that they spoke the truth and when they had told him the direction in which the two were traveling lu don guessed that they were on their way to jalur to join jadan a contingency that he felt must be prevented at any cost as was his wont in the stress of emergency he called pansat into consultation and for long the two sat in close conference when they arose a plan had been developed pansat went immediately to his own quarters where he removed the headdress and trappings of a priest to don in their stead the harness and weapons of a warrior then he returned to ludan good cried the latter when he saw him not even your fellow priests or the slaves that wait upon you daily would know you now lose no time pansat for all depends upon the speed with which you strike and remember kill the man if you can but in any event bring the woman to me here alive you understand 
yes master replied the priest and so it was that a lone warrior set out from allure and made his way northwest in the direction of jalor the gorge next above koryul ja is uninhabited and here the wily jadon had chosen to mobilize his army for its descent upon allure two considerations influenced him one being the fact that could he keep his plans a secret from the enemy he would have the advantage of delivering a surprise attack upon the forces of ludon from a direction that they would not expect attack and in the meantime he would be able to keep his men from the gossip of the cities where strange tales were already circulating relative to the coming of jad ben otho in person to aid the high priest in his war against jadon it took stout hearts and loyal ones to ignore the implied threats of divine vengeance that these tales suggested already there had been desertions and the cause of jadon seemed tottering to destruction such was the state of affairs when a sentry posted on the knoll in the mouth of the gorge sent word that he had observed in the valley below what appeared at a distance to be nothing less than two people mounted upon the back of a griff he said that he had caught glimpses of them as they passed open spaces and they seemed to be travelling up the river in the direction of the koryul jaw at first jadon was inclined to doubt the veracity of his informant but like all good generals he could not permit even palpably false information to go uninvestigated and so he determined to visit the knoll himself and learn precisely what it was that the sentry had observed through the distorting spectacles of fear he had scarce taken his place beside the man ere the fellow touched his arm and pointed they're closer now he whispered you can see them plainly and sure enough not a quarter of a mile away jadon saw that which in his long experience in pal yul -don he had never before seen two humans riding upon the broad back of a griff at first he could scarce credit even this testimony of his own eyes but soon he realized that the creatures below could be not else than they appeared and then he recognized the man and rose to his feet with a loud cry it is he he shouted to those about him it is the dor -yul otho himself the griff and his riders heard the shout though not the words the former bellowed terrifically and started in the direction of the knoll and jadon followed by a few of his more intrepid warriors ran to meet him tarzan loath to enter an unnecessary quarrel tried to turn the animal but as the beast was far from tractable it always took a few minutes to force the will of its master upon it and so the two parties were quite close before the ape-man succeeded in stopping the mad charge of his furious mount jadon and his warriors however had come to the realization that this bellowing creature was bearing down upon them with evil intent and they had assumed the better part of valor and taken to trees accordingly it was beneath these trees that tarzan finally stopped the griff jadon called down to him we are friends he called i am jadon chief of jalur i and my warriors lay our foreheads upon the feet of dor -yul -otho and pray that he will aid us in our righteous fight with ludon the high priest you have not defeated him yet asked tarzan why i thought you would be king of pal -yul -don long before this no replied jadon the people fear the high priest and now that he has in the temple one whom he claims to be jad ben otho many of my warriors are afraid if they but knew that the dor -yul otho had returned and that he had blessed the cause of jadon i am sure that victory would be ours tarzan thought for a long minute and then he spoke jadon he said was one of the few who believed in me and who wished to accord me fair treatment i have a debt to pay to jadon and an account to settle with ludon not alone on my own behalf but principally upon that of my mate i will go with you jadon to meet to ludon the punishment he deserves tell me chief how may the dor -yul -otho best serve his father's people by coming with me to jalur and the villages between replied jadon quickly that the people may see that it is indeed the dor -yul -otho, and that he smiles upon the cause of jadon you think that they will believe in me more now than before asked the ape-man who will dare doubt that he who rides upon the great griff is less than a god returned the old chief and if i go with you to the battle at allure asked tarzan can you assure the safety of my mate while i am gone from her she shall remain in jalur with the princess o lo a and my own women replied jadon there she will be safe for there i shall leave trusted warriors to protect them 
say that you will come o dor ul otho and my cup of happiness will be full for even now ta den my son marches toward a lur with a force from the northwest and if we can attack with the dor ul otho at our head from the northeast our arms should be victorious it shall be as you wish jadon replied the ape-man but first you must have meat fetched for my griff there are many carcasses in the camp above replied jadon for my men have little else to do than hunt good exclaimed tarzan have them brought at once and when the meat was brought and laid at a distance the ape-man slipped from the back of his fierce charger and fed him with his own hand see that there is always plenty of flesh for him he said to jadon for he guessed that his mastery might be short-lived should the vicious beast become over hungry it was morning before they could leave for jalor but tarzan found the griff lying where he had left him the night before beside the carcasses of two antelope and a lion but now there was nothing but the griff the paleontologists say that he was herbivorous said tarzan as he and jane approached the beast the journey to jalur was made through the scattered villages where jadon hoped to arouse a keener enthusiasm for his cause a party of warriors preceded tarzan that the people might properly be prepared not only for the sight of the griff but to receive the dor ul otho as became his high station the results were all that jadon could have hoped and in no village through which they passed was there one who doubted the deity of the ape-man as they approached jalur a strange warrior joined them one whom none of jadon's following knew he said he came from one of the villages to the south and that he had been treated unfairly by one of ludon's chiefs for this reason he had deserted the cause of the high priest and come north in the hope of finding a home in jalur as every addition to his forces was welcome to the old chief he permitted the stranger to accompany them and so he came into jalur with them there arose now the question as to what was to be done with the griff while they remained in the city it was with difficulty that tarzan had prevented the savage beast from attacking all who came near it when they had first entered the camp of jadon in the uninhabited gorge next to the kor ul ja but during the march to jalur the creature had seemed to become accustomed to the presence of the hodon the latter however gave him no cause for annoyance since they kept as far from him as possible and when he passed through the streets of the city he was viewed from the safety of lofty windows and roofs however tractable he appeared to have become there would have been no enthusiastic seconding of a suggestion to turn him loose within the city it was finally suggested that he be turned into a walled enclosure within the palace grounds and this was done tarzan driving him in after jane had dismounted more meat was thrown to him and he was left to his own devices the awe-struck inhabitants of the palace not even venturing to climb upon the walls to look at him jadon led tarzan and jane to the quarters of the princess oloa who the moment that she beheld the ape-man threw herself to the ground and touched her forehead to his feet panat lee was there with her and she too seemed happy to see tarzan jad guru again when they found that jane was his mate they looked with almost equal awe upon her since even the most sceptical of the warriors of jadon were now convinced that they were entertaining a god and a goddess within the city of jalur and that with the assistance of the power of these two the cause of jadon would soon be victorious and the old lion man set upon the throne of paluldon from oloa tarzan learned that ta den had returned and that they were to be united in marriage with the weird rites of their religion and in accordance with the custom of their people as soon as ta den came home from the battle that was to be fought at allur the recruits were now gathering at the city and it was decided that the next day jadon and tarzan would return to the main body in the hidden camp and immediately under cover of night the attack should be made in force upon ludon's forces at allur word of this was sent to ta den where he awaited with his warriors upon the north side of jad ben lul only a few miles from allur in the carrying out of these plans it was necessary to leave jane behind in jadon's palace at jalur but oloa and her women were with her and there were many warriors to guard them so tarzan bid his mate good-bye with no feelings of apprehension as to her safety and again seated upon the griff made his way out of the city with jadon and his warriors at the mouth of the gorge the ape-man abandoned his huge mount since it had served his purpose and could be of no further value to him in their attack upon allur which was to be made just before dawn the following day when 
as he could not have been seen by the enemy the effect of his entry to the city upon the griff would have been totally lost a couple of sharp blows with the spear sent the big animal rumbling and growling in the direction of the coriol griff nor was the ape-man sorry to see it depart since he had never known at what instant its short temper and insatiable appetite for flesh might turn it upon some of his companions immediately upon their arrival at the gorge the march on allur was commenced End of chapter 22 read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com chapter twenty three taken alive as night fell a warrior from the palace of jalur slipped into the temple grounds he made his way to where the lesser priests were quartered his presence aroused no suspicion as it was not unusual for warriors to have business within the temple he came at last to a chamber where several priests were congregated after the evening meal the rites and ceremonies of the sacrifice had been concluded and there was nothing more of a religious nature to make call upon their time until the rites at sunrise now the warrior knew as in fact nearly all paul yuldan knew that there was no strong bond between the temple and the palace at jalur and that jadon only suffered the presence of the priests and permitted their cruel and abhorrent acts because of the fact that these things had been the custom of the hodon of pal yul -don for countless ages and rash indeed must have been the man who would have attempted to interfere with the priests Chapter or their ceremonies 23 that jadon never alive. entered the temple was well as known night fell, and a that his high priest never entered the palace slipped into but the, the people came grounds. to the temple with their he votive offerings and the, the sacrifices were made supported. night and morning his as in every other no temple in as it was not unusual for the warriors, warriors knew to have these things within the knew them better perhaps than he a simple warrior should have known several priests and so it was here in the temple that he looked for the aid that he sought in the carrying out of whatever design concluded and there was as he entered the apartment where the priests were he greeted them the after the manner which was customary in paul yul now the warrior knew but at the same time he made a sign with his paul finger that might have attracted that there was no strong or scarcely been noticed at all the palace by one who knew not its and meaning and that only suffered but there the were those within the room who noticed it and interpreted it was because of the fact that these through the fact that the two of the priests of the rose and came Paul close Yudon to him as he stood ages. just within the doorway and, and each of them as he came must have turned the, the signal that have the warrior had made with the, priests the three talked for but a moment and then the warrior but turned and never left the apartment the temple was well a little later one of the priests that who had high talked priest with never him entered left the palace and shortly after but the that people the came other. to the temple with their votive in the corridor they found the warrior waiting and led him to a little chamber which opened upon a smaller corridor just beyond where it joined the larger knew them better here the three than remained in whispered conversation for some little so time was and here then the warrior the returned to the palace the and the two priests sought to their the carrying out of whatever design the apartments of the women of the palace of jalur are all upon the, the same side of a long straight them corridor the manner which was each has a single door leading into the corridor but at the and same at the time opposite end several windows overlooking a garden little attention it was in one of these rooms that jane slept alone not its at each end of the corridor was a sentinel within the, the main body of the guard being stationed in a room near the apparent. outer entrance to the Through women's the fact quarters. That two of the priests rose and the came palace close slept to him for they kept early hours the there where Jadon ruled. The Pale Danso the of the great chieftain of the north the knew no such wild moment, orgies as had resounded through the palace of the king at Allur. Jalur was a quiet city by comparison with the capital. Yet there was always a guard kept at every entrance to the chambers of Jadon and his immediate family as well as at the gate leading into the temple where and that which larger. opened upon the city here the three these guards however were small consisting usually time, of not more than five or six warriors and one of whom remained awake while the others slept the such were the conditions the women, then the when two warriors presented upon themselves the same side one at either end of the corridor, corridor to the sentries each has who watched over the safety of Jane the Clayton and, the and the princess Olo and each of the newcomers garden. repeated to the it sentinels was in one of these the stereotyped that words which announced alone. that they were relieved each and these the other sent to watch in their the main stead. body of the guard never is a warrior loath to be relieved of sentry duty where under different circumstances he might ask numerous questions he is now too 
well Dondo, satisfied to escape the, the monotonies of, of that great universally hated the North, beauty. knew no such and wild so these two men had resounded their relief through the palace of the king and had allured the way to their palace. Jalur was a quiet and then a third by warrior entered the corridor, the and all of the newcomers Yet came together before the door of the eight man slumbering mate. To the chambers and one was the strange warrior who had met Jadon and Tarzan outside the city of Jalur as they had approached it the previous day. These guards, however, were small. He was the same warrior who had entered the temple a short hour before. Six warriors. The faces of his fellows were unfamiliar even to one another. Such were the conditions then when two warriors hideous headdress in the presence at either end of the corridor to the sentries who silently they lifted the hangings that hid the interior of the room from the view of those who passed through the corridor and stealthily slunk within. Upon a pile of furs in a far corner lay the sleeping form of Lady Greystoke. The bare feet Never of the intruders gave forth no sound as they crossed the stone floor toward her. A ray of moonlight entering through a window near her couch well shone full upon her, revealing the beautiful contours of, of an arm and shoulder in cameo distinctness so against the dark furry pelt beneath which she slept, and, hastened and the perfect the profile that was turned and then a third toward the skulking the corridor, and all of the But neither the beauty nor the helplessness of the sleeper aroused such sentiments of passion or pity as might stir the breasts of Normal Jadon and Tarzan to the three priests the of the Lord, they had clay, approached it. Nor the could they conceive aught of that passion which had aroused men to intrigue and to before. murder for possession the faces of this beautiful of American girl, even and which even now another, was influencing the destiny of undiscovered Paul Yuldan. In the presence, even upon the floor of the chamber were numerous pelts. Silently, they lifted the leader of the trio came close to the sleeping woman. He stooped and gathered up one of the smaller of these, and standing close to her head, he held the rug out. Upon a pile of face. furs in a far corner now, lay the sleeping form he whispered, of Lady and simultaneously he the threw the rug over the woman's head, forth and no his two fellows leaped upon her, seizing her arms and pinioning her body, while their leaders stifled their cries with the furry pelt. Quickly and silently they bound her, her, and and silently, and silently, they bound her wrists and, and gagged and her, and during the brief time that their work required, there was no sound that might have been heard by occupants of the adjoining apartment. Jerking but her roughly to her feet, the they forced her toward a window, but she refused to walk, throwing herself instead upon the floor. They were very angry and would have resorted to cruelties to compel her obedience, but dared not, since the wrath of Ludon might fall heavily upon whoever mutilated his fair prize. And so they were forced to lift even carry her bodily. Nor was the task any sinecure, since the captive kicked and struggled as best she might, making their labor as arduous as possible. Came close but to the finally sleeping they woman, succeeded in getting her through the, the window into these. the garden beyond Standing where one of the head, two priests the from the Jalur temple directed face. their steps now, toward a small barred gate. Simultaneously, he threw the rug the over the woman's head. And his Immediately beyond this, a flight of her arms stairs led him down her body toward the river, while their leader of the stairs were moored several canoes. Ponsa had indeed been fortunate in enlisting aid her from those who knew the temple and the palace so well, or there otherwise no he might never might have escaped heard from Jalur with of his adjoining captive. Placing the woman in the bottom Jerking of a light canoe, Ponsa entered it and took up the paddle. But she refused his companions unfastened the moorings and shoved the, the little floor. craft out into they the were current very of the stream. Would have resorted to traitorous work to compel her They turned and retraced their steps toward the temple while Ponsa, paddling strongly with the current, moved rapidly down. Down the river that would carry and so him they were forced to, to lift and carry her bodily. Nor was the, the moon had set, and the eastern horizon the still gave no hint of approaching as day might, as a long file of warriors wound as as stealthily through the darkness but into the city of Alur. Their plans the were the all laid, and there seemed no one one of the two likelihood of their miscarriage. From the temple directed uh, their steps a messenger had been dispatched to Tarzan, whose forces lay northwest of the city. Tarzan, with a small contingent, was to enter the temple through the secret passageway, the location of which he alone knew, while Jadon, with the greater proportion of the Warriors was had to attack the palace gate and enlisting aid from the those who man leading his little band the moved so well. stealthily through the winding alleys of Alur, arriving undetected at the building captive. which hid the entrance Placing to the, the woman passageway. in the bottom of a light canoe, Ponsat this spot being best protected by the fact his that its existence was unknown to others and from the, the priests, craft out was unguarded. The of the stream. To facilitate the passage of his little company through the narrow, winding, uneven tunnel, Tarzan lighted a torch which had been brought for the purpose 
Sun, and the preceding his warriors, led the way to toward the temple. And that he could accomplish much once had set, he reached the, the inner chambers of the temple with his no little band of picked warriors, the ape man was confident, since an attack at this point would bring confusion and consternation to the easily their overpowered were priests, all laid and there permit Tarzan no to attack the palace forces in the rear at the same time that Jadon engaged them at the palace gates, while Tadan and his forces swarmed to the northern walls. To enter the temple Great the value had been placed by Jadon the location on the of which he alone effect, knew of the well, Dorya Otho's mysterious the appearance of the in the heart of the temple, the and he had urged gate. Tarzan to take every the advantage of the old chieftain's belief that many of Gudan's warriors of still wavered in their allegiance between the high priest and the Dorya Otho, being held to the former more by the fear which he engendered in the breasts of all his followers than by any love or loyalty that they might feel toward him, was unguarded. There is a Pauliodonian proverb of his setting forth a truth the similar to that contained in the old Scotch Tarzan adage that a torch the best laid schemes of mice and men guiding his warriors led the way toward the temple. translated, it might read that he could accomplish he who much follows once he the right the trail sometimes the reaches the, the wrong destination. The ape man and such apparently was the fate that lay in the footsteps of the great chieftain of the north and his godlike overpowered priests. Tarzan, more familiar with the windings of the corridors than his fellows, and having the advantage of the full light of the torch, the which at best was but a dim and his flickering affair, was some distance walls. ahead of the others, and Great in his keen anxiety to close with the enemy, he gave too little Dorya thought to those who were to support him. In the heart of the temple. Nor is this and he had urged Tarzan to take every advantage had been accustomed to fight the battles of life single-handed, so that it had become habitual for him to depend solely upon his own cunning Being held to the former more by the fear which he engendered in the breast of all his followers, from which opened the chambers of Lugan and, and the lesser priests far in advance of there his warriors. And as he turned into this corridor with its dim crescent flickering somberly, adage, he saw another entrance from, from a corridor before him, men, a warrior half-carrying, half-dragging the figure of a woman. He who follows Tarzan the right recognized the gagged and fettered captive whom he had thought and such safe in the was palace the of Jadon the at Jalur. The, great chieftain the warrior the with the woman had seen Tarzan ally. at the same instant that the latter had discovered him. The he heard the, the low beast-like growl that broke from the ape man's lips as he sprang forward to arrest his mate from her captor and wreak upon him the vengeance that was in the Tarmangani's savage heart. Across the corridor from Pansat was the entrance to a smaller chamber into this he leaps, carrying the woman with him. The Close behind had been came Tarzan of the, the Apes. Of life he had cast aside his torch so and drawn a long knife that had been his father's. With the impetuosity of a charging prowess. bull, he rushed into the and chamber so in pursuit of Pansat to find himself from which when the hangings the dropped behind Udon him and the lesser priests far in advance Almost immediately there was a crash of stone on stone before him, followed a moment later by a similar crash behind him. He saw no other evidence from was necessary to announce him. to the ape man a that he was again a prisoner in Ludon's the temple. Of a woman. He stood Instantly, perfectly still Tarzan where he had halted at the first sound of the descending stone door. Not again would he easily be precipitated to the griff pit or the some warrior similar the danger had as had occurred when Ludon had trapped him the ladder had discovered him. As he, he stood the there, his eyes slowly grew accustomed the to the dark lips, and he, he became aware that a dim light was entering her chamber through some and opening, upon him the though it was several was minutes before Tarmangani's he discovered its heart. source. Across in the, the roof of the chamber, he finally discerned a small aperture, a small possibly chamber, three feet in diameter, this he leaped, and it was through this that him. what was really Close only a lesser darkness rather than a light was he penetrating its stygian blackness of the chamber in which he was imprisoned. With the impetuosity Since of a charging bull, he rushed he had into the chamber no sound, in pursuit of though his keen to find ears were constantly strained in an effort to discover a clue to the direction taken by the Almost immediately, there was a crash of stone on stone before him, followed a moment later by a similar crash of his prison behind. cell. No it other was evidence small was necessary to over announce to the ape man that he was again across. a prisoner in Lugan's On hands temple. and knees with the utmost he caution, perfectly he examined where the he entire area of the floor. Of the descending in the exact door. center, directly Not again, beneath he the opening be in the roof was a trap. To the grift pit or but otherwise, the floor danger, was solid. As had occurred when Lugan With this had knowledge, it was only necessary to avoid as this spot As he stood there, his eyes slowly grew accustomed to the darkness, and he became aware that a dim light was entering the chamber through some opening. There were only two openings. 
several minutes One, before the doorway he through which he had source. entered and upon the in opposite the roof of the side chamber, that finally through which the warrior had aperture, borne possibly Jane Clayton. Three feet in diameter. These and it was through this that what by was the really only a lesser darkness rather than a light was penetrating its Stygian blackness of the Ludon, chamber the high priest, in which he was licked imprisoned. his thin lips and rubbed Since his bony white hands together in gratification as though his keen ear Jane Clayton into his presence in an effort to laid her on the floor of the chamber before him. Good, Ponsat. He exclaimed, Presently he you shall be well rewarded for this service. Cell. Now if it we but had the faults do you know though in our power, all Paul Yuldan would be at our feet. On hands and knees with the Master, I have him, he examined the entire area what? of the floor. Exclaimed Ludan. In the exact you have center Tarzan Jad Guru? The opening in the you have slain him perhaps. But otherwise, tell me, my wonderful Pansat, tell me quickly. With this knowledge, my breast it was only is bursting with a desire to, to know. This spot in so far as I have taken him alive, Ludan, my master. The walls next received his He is in the little chamber that the ancients built to trap those who were too powerful to take a life in which personal he had encounter. encounter. And upon the opposite side, you have done that well, through which the warrior I, had born a frightened Clayton. priest, burst into the apartment. These were both closed quick, by master, the slabs quick, of stone which the fleeing warrior had released. The corridors are filled with the warriors of Jadon. Ludon, no, the high priest, cried the high priest. His thin My warriors hold the palace and the temple. I speak the truth, master, replied the priest. There are warriors in the corridor approaching this very chamber, and they come him. from the direction of the secret Good passage Ponsat, which leads hither from the city. You shall be well maybe even as he says, service. exclaimed Ponsat. Now, it was from that direction that Tarzan Jadguru was coming when I discovered and trapped him. He was leading his warriors to the very holy of holies. Ludon ran quickly to the doorway and looked out into you the corridor. At a glance, he saw that you the fears of the frightened him, priest were well me, founded. Ponsat, a dozen warriors were my moving along the corridor toward him, to but know. they seemed confused and far from sure of alive, themselves. Ludan, my master, the high priest Ponsat. guessed that, deprived he of the leadership the of Tarzan, the they were little better those than who lost the unknown mazes of the subterranean precincts of the temple. Stepping back into the apartment, he sees the leathern thong that depended from the ceiling. Upon he it cried. sharply, the and through the temple boomed the, the deep tones of, of a metal gong. You are mad, Five times the, the clanging priest. notes rang warriors, through the corridors, the then he the turned temple. toward the two priests. I speak the truth, Master, Bring the woman and replied follow the priest. Me. He there are warriors in the corridor. Crossing the chamber, this very he passed chamber, through a small doorway, the, the others the lifting Jane Clayton from the floor and following him. Through and a narrow corridor says, and up a flight of steps they went, turning to right and left and doubling back Jack through a maze of winding passageways him. which terminated in a spiral staircase that gave forth at the surface of the Ludon ground ran within the largest the doorway of the inner altar into courts the corridor. close beside the at eastern glance, altar. At a glance he saw that the fears of the frightened From all directions now, well in the corridors below and the grounds above, came the sound of hurrying footsteps. But they seemed to confuse and far from the great Sharon had summoned the faithful to the defense of Ludon in his private chamber. Of Tarzan, the priests who knew the way led the less familiar the warriors to the spot, the and presently those who had accompanied Tarzan found themselves not only leaderless, the apartment, but facing a vastly superior force. From the they were brave men, but under the circumstances they the were helpless, and so they fell back the way they had come. And when they reached the, the narrow confines of the smaller the passageway, their safety was assured, since only one foeman the could attack them at a time. He directed. But their plans were frustrated, the chamber, and possibly also their entire doorway, cause the lost. Lifting Jane so heavily from had Jadon banged upon the success through a narrow of their corridor and up a flight of steps. They With went, the clanging of the temple right gong, Jadon assumed that Tarzan and his party had struck their initial blow, and so he launched his attack upon the palace gate. To the ears of Ludon in the inner temple court came the savage war cries that announced altar. the beginning of the battle. From all Leaving Pansat now, and the other the priests to guard the woman, the he hastened toward the palace the personally to direct his force. The five and as he passed the through the temple grounds, he dispatched a messenger to learn the outcome of the fight in the chambers. corridors below. The priests Another messenger the way, to the less spread the news among his followers the spot. that the false presently Dorio those who had accompanied Tarzan the found themselves not only leaders, as the din of battle rose above Allure, Lieutenant Eric Obergatz turned upon his bed of soft hides and sat up, and so they rubbed his eyes and they had. Come. 
And it when they reached the narrow without. confines of the smaller passage, I am Dad Benoto, he cried. Was assured, Who dares Since disturb only one my slumber? Could attack them at a, a slave time. squatting but upon the floor at the foot of his couch shuddered and touched her forehead to the floor. Cause lost. It must so be that the enemy had come, oh, Dad Benoto. She spoke soothingly, for she had reason to know the terrors of the mad frenzy into which trivial things sometimes threw the great god. A priest burst suddenly through the hangings of the doorway and falling upon his hands and knees rubbed his forehead. Against the against savage the war cries flagging. that announced the beginning uh, of the battle. Leaving Ponsa, the warriors of Jadon have attacked the, woman, the palace and the temple. The palace Even now they are fighting in the corridors near the quarters of Jadon, and the high priest begs that you come to the palace to and encourage your faithful warriors by your presence. And other messengers spread the news feet. among his followers. I am Jad Ben Otho, With lightning I will blast the blasphemers who dare the attack the holy city of Alur. Alur Lieutenant moment, Eric Obergatz turned and upon madly his bed about the room, hides, while the priest and, and the slave up. remained upon he hands and knees with their foreheads him. against the floor. It was still dark without. Come, cried I am Obergatz, Jad Ben Otho, a vicious he cried. kick in who the side of the slave girl. Who dares disturb my slumber? Come, would you wait here all day while the forces of darkness overwhelm the city of light? Thoroughly frightened, it must be that the as were all those who were forced to serve the great God, the two arose and followed Obergatz the terrors of the palace. The into which Above the shouting of the warriors rose constantly the, the cries of the temple priests. A priest burst God suddenly Benotho through the hangings of the, the doorway, the doorway and falling upon Otho his hands and knees rubbed the his forehead against the, the stone persistent slagging. cries reached even uh, to Jad the ears Benotho, of the enemy, as it was The warriors of Jadon have attacked the palace and the temple. Even now they are fighting in the corridors near the quarters of Ludan and the high priest. California, shaggybarts.blogspot.com your faithful warriors com. by your presence. Obergot sprang to his feet. I am Jad Ben Otho, he screamed. Chapter With lightning 24. I will blast the blasphemers the who dare attack the holy death. city of Allure. The sun the rose he to see the forces of Jadon about the room, still held the priest the and the slave gate. remained upon hands the and knees with their foreheads against the, the, the tall floor. structure that stood just Come, beyond the palace. Obergatz, and at the summit of this he kept a warrior station to look toward the Come, northern wall of the palace. Would you wait here all day while the forces was to of make darkness overwhelm the city of but light? But as the wore Thoroughly frightened, no sign as were all those who were forced to serve the great god. And now in the full light and the new sun upon the roof of one of the palace buildings above the shouting of the warriors rose. Constantly, Most the cries the of the temple priest and the strange God, naked is here, figure of the a man into whose long hair and beard were woven fresh ferns the and flowers. The persistent flowers. cries reached even Behind to Behind the them ears were banked a score of lesser priests who chanted in unison, This is John of Ben Otho, lay down your arms and surrender. This they repeated again and again, alternating it with the cry, The false Doriel Otho is a prisoner. And one of those lulls which are common in battles between forces armed with weapons that require great physical effort in their use, a voice suddenly arose from among the followers of Jadon. Show us the door, you Lotho. We do not believe you. Wait, cried Ludon. If I do not produce him before the sun has moved his own width, the gates of the palace shall be opened to you, and my warriors will lay down their arms. He turned to one of his priests and issued brief instructions. The ape-man paced the confines of his narrow cell. Bitterly he reproached himself for the stupidity which had led him into this trap, and yet was it stupidity? What else might he have done other than rush to the succor of his mate? He wondered how they had stolen her from Jalur, and then suddenly there flashed to his mind the features of the warrior whom he had just seen with her they were strangely familiar he racked his brain to recall where he had seen the man before and then it came to him he was the strange warrior who had joined jadon's forces outside of jalur the day that tarzan had ridden upon the great griff from the uninhabited gorge next to the koryul jaw down to the capital city of the chieftain of the north but who could the man be tarzan knew that never before that other day had he seen him Presently he heard the clanging of a gong from the corridor without, and very faintly the rush of feet and shouts. He guessed that his warriors had been discovered, and a fight was in progress. He fretted and chafed at the chance that had denied him participation in it. Again and again he tried the doors of his prison and the trap in the center of the floor, but none would give to his utmost endeavors. He strained his eyes toward the aperture above, but he could see nothing 
and then he continued his futile pacing to and fro like a caged lion behind its bars the minutes dragged slowly into hours faintly sounds came to him as of shouting men at a great distance the battle was in progress he wondered if ja don would be victorious and should he be would his friends ever discover him in this hidden chamber in the bowels of the hill he doubted it and now as he looked again toward the aperture in the roof there appeared to be something depending through its centre he came closer and strained his eyes to see yes there was something there it appeared to be a rope tarzan wondered if it had been there all the time it must have he reasoned since he had heard no sound from above and it was so dark within the chamber that he might easily have overlooked it he raised his hand toward it the end of it was just within his reach he bore his weight upon it to see if it would hold him then he released it and backed away still watching it as you have seen an animal do after investigating some unfamiliar object one of the little traits that differentiated tarzan from other men accentuating his similarity to the savage beasts of his native jungle again and again he touched and tested the braided leather rope and always he listened for any warning sound from above he was very careful not to step upon the trap at any time and when finally he bore all his weight upon the rope and took his feet from the floor he spread them wide apart so that if he fell he would fall astride the trap the rope held him there was no sound from above nor any from the trap below slowly and cautiously he drew himself upward hand over hand nearer and nearer the roof he came in a moment his eyes would be above the level of the floor above already his extended arms projected into the upper chamber and then something closed suddenly upon both his forearms pinioning them tightly and leaving him hanging in mid-air unable to advance or retreat immediately a light appeared in the room above him and presently he saw the hideous mask of a priest peering down upon him in the priest's hands were leathern thongs and these he tied about tarzan's wrists and forearms until they were completely bound together from his elbows almost to his fingers behind this priest tarzan presently saw others and soon several lay hold of him and pulled him up through the hole almost instantly his eyes were above the level of the floor he understood how they had trapped him two nooses had lain encircling the aperture into the cell below a priest had waited at the end of each of these ropes and at opposite sides of the chamber when he had climbed to a sufficient height upon the rope that had dangled into his prison below and his arms were well within the encircling snares the two priests had pulled quickly upon their ropes and he had been made an easy captive without any opportunity of defending himself or inflicting injury upon his captors and now they bound his legs from his ankles to his knees and picking him up carried him from the chamber no word did they speak to him as they bore him upward to the temple yard the din of battle had risen again as ja don had urged his forces to renewed efforts ta den had not arrived and the forces of the old chieftain were revealing in their lessened efforts their increasing demoralization and then it was that the priests carried tarzan jad guru to the roof of the palace and exhibited him in the sight of the warriors of both factions here is the false dor yul otho screamed ludon obergatz his shattered mentality having never grasped fully the meaning of much that was going on about him cast a casual glance at the bound and helpless prisoner and as his eyes fell upon the noble features of the ape-man they went wide in astonishment and fright and his pasty countenance turned a sickly blue once before had he seen tarzan of the apes but many times had he dreamed that he had seen him and always was the giant ape-man avenging the wrongs that had been committed upon him and his by the ruthless hands of the three german officers who had led their native troops in the ravishing of tarzan's peaceful home hauptmann fritz schneider had paid the penalty of his needless cruelties unter lieutenant von goss too had paid and now obergatz the last of the three stood face to face with the nemesis that had trailed him through his dreams for long weary months that he was bound and helpless lessened not the german's terror he seemed not to realize that the man could not harm him he but stood cringing and gibbering and ludon saw and was filled with apprehension that others might see and seeing realize that this bewhiskered idiot was no god that of the two tarzan jad guru was the more godly figure 
already the high priest noted that some of the palace warriors standing near were whispering together and pointing he stepped closer to obergatz you are jad ben otho he whispered denounce him the german shook himself his mind cleared of all but his great terror and the words of the high priest gave him the clue to safety i am jad ben otho he screamed tarzan looked him straight in the eye you are lieutenant obergatz of the german army he said in excellent german you are the last of the three i have sought so long and in your putrid heart you know that god has not brought us together at last for nothing the mind of lieutenant obergatz was functioning clearly and rapidly at last he too saw the questioning looks upon the faces of some of those around them he saw the opposing warriors of both cities standing by the gate inactive every eye turned upon him and the trussed figure of the ape-man he realized that indecision now meant ruin and ruin death he raised his voice in the sharp barking tones of a prussian officer so unlike his former maniacal screaming as to quickly arouse the attention of every ear and to cause an expression of puzzlement to cross the crafty face of ludon i am jad ben otho snapped obergatz this creature is no son of mine as a lesson to all blasphemers he shall die upon the altar at the hand of the god he has profaned take him from my sight and when the sun stands at zenith let the faithful congregate in the temple court and witness the wrath of this divine hand and he held aloft his right palm those who had brought tarzan took him away then as obergatz had directed and the german turned once more to the warriors by the gate throw down your arms warriors of jadon he cried lest i call down my lightnings to blast you where you stand those who do as i bid shall be forgiven come throw down your arms the warriors of jadon moved uneasily casting looks of appeal at their leader and of apprehension toward the figures upon the palace roof jadon sprang forward among his men let the cowards and the knaves throw down their arms and enter the palace he cried but never will jadon and the warriors of jalur touch their foreheads to the feet of ludon and his false god make your decision now he cried to his followers a few threw down their arms and with sheepish looks passed through the gateway into the palace and with the example of these to bolster their courage others joined in the desertion from the old chieftain of the north but staunch and true around him stood the majority of his warriors and when the last weakling had left their ranks ja don voiced the savage cry with which he led his followers to the attack and once again the battle raged about the palace gate at times ja don's forces pushed the defenders far into the palace ground and then the wave of combat would recede and pass out into the city again and still ta den and the reinforcements did not come it was drawing close to noon ludon had mustered every available man that was not actually needed for the defence of the gate within the temple and these he sent under the leadership of pansat out into the city through the secret passageway and there they fell upon jadon's forces from the rear while those at the gate hammered them in the front attacked on two sides by a vastly superior force the result was inevitable and finally the last remnant of jadon's little army capitulated and the old chief was taken a prisoner before ludon take him to the temple court cried the high priest he shall witness the death of his accomplice and perhaps jad ben otho shall pass a similar sentence upon him as well the inner temple court was packed with humanity at either end of the western altar stood tarzan and his mate bound and helpless the sounds of battle had ceased and presently the ape-man saw jadon being led into the inner court his wrists bound tightly together before him tarzan turned his eyes toward jane and nodded in the direction of jadon this looks like the end he said quietly he was our last and only hope we have at least found each other john she replied and our last days have been spent together my only prayer now is that if they take you they do not leave me tarzan made no reply for in his heart was the same bitter thought that her own contained not the fear that they would kill him but the fear that they would not kill her the ape-man strained at his bonds but they were too many and too strong a priest near him saw and with a jeering laugh struck the defenceless ape-man in the face the brute cried jane clayton tarzan smiled i have been struck thus before jane he said and always has the striker died you still have hope she asked i am still alive he said as though that were sufficient answer 
she was a woman and she did not have the courage of this man who knew no fear in her heart of hearts she knew that he would die upon the altar at high noon for he had told her after he had been brought to the inner court of the sentence of death that obergatz had pronounced upon him and she knew too that tarzan knew that he would die but that he was too courageous to admit it even to himself as she looked upon him standing there so straight and wonderful and brave among his savage captors her heart cried out against the cruelty of the fate that had overtaken him it seemed a gross and hideous wrong that that wonderful creature now so quick with exuberant life and strength and purpose should be presently not but a bleeding lump of clay and all so uselessly and wantonly gladly would she have offered her life for his but she knew that it was a waste of words since their captors would work upon them whatever it was their will to do for him death for her she shuddered at the thought and now came Lu Don and the naked Obergatz, and the high priest led the German to his place behind the altar, himself standing upon the other's left. Lu Don whispered a word to Obergatz, at the same time nodding in the direction of Ja Don. The Hun cast a scowling look upon the old warrior. "'And after the false god,' he cried, "'the false prophet!' and he pointed an accusing finger at Ja Don. Then his eyes wandered to the form of Jane Clayton. "'And the woman, too?' asked Lu Don the case of the woman i will attend to later replied obergatz i will talk with her to-night after she has had a chance to meditate upon the consequences of arousing the wrath of jad ben otho he cast his eyes upward at the sun the time approaches he said to ludon prepare the sacrifice ludon nodded to the priests who were gathered about tarzan they seized the ape-man and lifted him bodily to the altar where they laid him upon his back with his head at the south end of the monolith but a few feet from where jane clayton stood impulsively and before they could restrain her the woman rushed forward and bending quickly kissed her mate upon the forehead good-bye john she whispered good-bye he answered smiling the priests seized her and dragged her away ludon handed the sacrificial knife to obergatz i am the great god cried the german thus falleth the divine wrath upon all my enemies he looked up at the sun and then raised the knife high above his head thus die the blasphemers of god he screamed and at the same instant a sharp staccato note rang out above the silent spellbound multitude there was a screaming whistle in the air and jad ben otho crumpled forward across the body of his intended victim again the same alarming noise and lu don fell a third and mosar crumpled to the ground and now the warriors and the people locating the direction of this new and unknown sound turned toward the western end of the court upon the summit of the temple wall they saw two figures a ho don warrior and beside him an almost naked creature of the race of tarzan jad guru across his shoulders and about his hips were strange broad belts studded with beautiful cylinders that glinted in the midday sun and in his hands a shining thing of wood and metal from the end of which rose a thin wreath of blue-gray smoke and then the voice of the hodon warrior rang clear upon the ears of the silent throng thus speaks the true jad ben otho he cried through this his messenger of death cut the bonds of the prisoners cut the bonds of the doryal otho and of jadon king of pal yul -don, and of the woman who is the mate of the son of god Pansat, filled with the frenzy of fanaticism, saw the power and the glory of the regime he had served crumpled and gone. To one and only one did he attribute the blame for the disaster that had but just overwhelmed him. It was the creature who lay upon the sacrificial altar who had brought Lu Don to his death and toppled the dreams of power that day by day had been growing in the brain of the underpriest. The sacrificial knife lay upon the altar where it had fallen from the dead fingers of Obergatz pansat crept closer and then with a sudden lunge he reached forth to seize the handle of the blade and even as his clutching fingers were poised above it the strange thing in the hands of the strange creature upon the temple wall cried out its crashing word of doom and pansat the underpriest screaming fell back upon the dead body of his master seize all the priests cried ta den to the warriors and let none hesitate lest jad ben otho's messenger send forth still other bolts of lightning the warriors and the people had now witnessed such an exhibition of divine power as might have convinced an even less superstitious and more enlightened people 
and since many of them had but lately wavered between the jad ben otho of ludan and the dor ul otho of jadon it was not difficult for them to swing quickly back to the latter especially in view of the unanswerable argument in the hands of him whom tadan had described as the messenger of the great god and so the warriors sprang forward now with alacrity and surrounded the priests and when they looked again at the western wall of the temple court they saw pouring over it a great force of warriors and the thing that startled and appalled them was the fact that many of these were black and hairy wazdan at their head came the stranger with the shiny weapon and on his right was taden the hodan and on his left omat the black gund of kor ul -ja. a warrior near the altar had seized the sacrificial knife and cut tarzan's bonds and also those of jadon and jane clayton and now the three stood together beside the altar and as the newcomers from the western end of the temple court pushed their way toward them the eyes of the woman went wide in mingled astonishment incredulity and hope and the stranger slinging his weapon across his back by a leather strap rushed forward and took her in his arms jack she cried sobbing on his shoulder jack my son and tarzan of the apes came then and put his arms around them both and the king of pal ul -don and the warriors and the people kneeled in the temple court and placed their foreheads to the ground before the altar where the three stood end of chapter twenty four read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark dot blogspot dot com chapter twenty five home within an hour of the fall of ludan and mosar the chiefs and principal warriors of pal ul -don gathered in the great throne room of the palace at alur upon the steps of the lofty pyramid and placing jadon at the apex proclaimed him king upon one side of the old chieftain stood tarzan of the apes and upon the other korak the killer worthy son of the mighty ape-man and when the brief ceremony was over and the warriors with upraised clubs had sworn fealty to their new leader ja don dispatched a trusted company to fetch olo a and panat lee and the women of his own household from jalur and when the warriors discussed the future of pal ul don and the question arose as to the administration of the temples and the fate of the priests who practically without exception had been disloyal to the government of the king seeking always only their own power and comfort and aggrandizement and then it was that jadon turned to tarzan let the dor ul otho transmit to his people the wishes of his father he said your problem is a simple one said the ape-man if you but wish to do that which shall be pleasing in the eyes of god your priests to increase their power have taught you that jad ben otho is a cruel god that his eyes love to dwell upon blood and upon suffering but the falsity of their teachings has been demonstrated to you to-day in the utter defeat of the priesthood take then the temples from the men and give them instead to the women that they may be administered in kindness and charity and love wash the blood from your eastern altar and drain for ever the water from the western once i gave ludon the opportunity to do these things but he ignored my commands and again is the corridor of sacrifice filled with its victims liberate these from every temple in pal ul -don. bring offerings of such gifts as your people like and place them upon the altars of your god and there he will bless them and the priestesses of jad ben otho can distribute them among those who need them most as he ceased speaking a murmur of evident approval ran through the throng long had they been weary of the avarice and cruelty of the priests and now that authority had come from a high source with a feasible plan for ridding themselves of the old religious order without necessitating any change in the faith of the people they welcomed it and the priests cried one we shall put them to death upon their own altars if it pleases the dor ul otho to give the word no cried tarzan let no more blood be spilled give them their freedom and the right to take up such occupations as they choose that night a great feast was spread in the pali danso and for the first time in the history of ancient pal ul -don, black warriors sat in peace and friendship with white and a pact was sealed between ja don and oma that would ever make his tribe and the hodon allies and friends it was here that tarzan learned the cause of ta den's failure to attack at the stipulated time 
a messenger had come from jadon carrying instructions to delay the attack until noon nor had they discovered until almost too late that the messenger was a disguised priest of ludon and they had put him to death and scaled the walls and come to the inner temple court with not a moment to spare the following day Oloa and panatli and the women of jadon's family arrived at the palace of alur and in the great throne room ta den and Oloa were wed and omat and panatli for a week tarzan and jane and korak remained the guests of jadon as did omat and his black warriors and then the ape-man announced that he would depart from pal -yul -don. hazy in the minds of their hosts was the location of heaven and equally so the means by which the gods travelled between their celestial homes and the haunts of men and so no questionings arose when it was found that the doriel otho with his mate and son would travel overland across the mountains and out of pal -yul -don toward the north they went by way of the koryul ja accompanied by the warriors of that tribe and a great contingent of hodon warriors under ta den the king and many warriors and a multitude of people accompanied them beyond the limits of allure and after they had bid them good-bye and tarzan had invoked the blessings of god upon them the three europeans saw their simple loyal friends prostrate in the dust behind them until the cavalcade had wound out of the city and disappeared among the trees of the nearby forest they rested for a day among the koryul ja while jane investigated the ancient caves of these strange people and then they moved on avoiding the rugged shoulder of pastur al ved and winding down the opposite slope toward the great morass they moved in comfort and in safety surrounded by their escort of hodon and wazdan in the minds of many there was doubtless a question as to how the three would cross the great morass but least of all was tarzan worried by the problem in the course of his life he had been confronted by many obstacles only to learn that he who will may always pass in his mind lurked an easy solution of the passage but it was one which depended wholly upon chance it was the morning of the last day that as they were breaking camp to take up the march a deep bellow thundered from a nearby grove the ape-man smiled the chance had come fittingly then would the doriel otho and his mate and their son depart from the unmapped pal -yul -don he still carried the spear that jane had made which he had prized so highly because it was her handiwork that he had caused a search to be made for it through the temple in allure after his release and it had been found and brought to him he had told her laughingly that it should have the place of honour above their hearth as the ancient flintlock of her puritan grandsire had held a similar place of honour above the fireplace of professor porter her father at the sound of the bellowing the hodon warriors some of whom had accompanied tarzan from jadon's camp to jalur looked questioningly at the ape-man while omat's wazdan looked for trees since the griff was the one creature of pal -yul -don which might not be safely encountered even by a great multitude of warriors its tough armoured hide was impregnable to their knife thrusts while their thrown clubs rattled from it as futilely as if hurled at the rocky shoulder of pastor el ved wait said the ape-man and with his spear in hand he advanced toward the griff voicing the weird cry of the torodon the bellowing ceased and turned to low rumblings and presently the huge beast appeared what followed was but a repetition of the ape-man's previous experience with these huge and ferocious creatures and so it was that jane and korak and tarzan rode through the morass that hems pal -yul -don upon the back of a prehistoric triceratops while the lesser reptiles of the swamp fled hissing in terror upon the opposite shore they turned and called back their farewells to ta -don and omat and the brave warriors they had learned to admire and respect and then tarzan urged their titanic mount onward toward the north abandoning him only when he was assured that the wazdan and the hodon had had time to reach a point of comparative safety among the craggy ravines of the foothills turning the beast's head again toward pal -yul -don, the three dismounted and a sharp blow upon the thick hide sent the creature lumbering majestically back in the direction of its native haunts for a time they stood looking back upon the land they had just quit the land of torodon and griff of ja and jato of wazdan and hodon a primitive land of terror and sudden death and peace and beauty a land that they all had learned to love and then they turned once more toward the north and with light hearts and brave hearts took up their long journey toward the land that is best of all home end of chapter twenty five
End of Tarzan the Terrible by Edgar Rice Burroughs Read by Don W. Jenkins Rancho San Diego, California Shaggybark.blogspot.com